this machine learning course starts at the beginning and goes all the way to an advanced level, teaching you both the theory and applications of machine learning concepts. Ayush, who teaches this course, is a data scientist and machine learning engineer. Hi everyone and welcome to this course of machine learning. This course will teach you machine learning from very basics to an advanced level in machine learning. In this course, this co in this course, we'll be having both theoretical plus practical understanding of machine learning algorithms and building real-world AI projects. After this course, you will be build, you will be able to build your own machine learning applications and real-world applications in many domains. Okay, but wait, first, who am I? My name is Ayush, and I'm a data scientist at Artifact. I'm in Standard Nine from India. I have worked on various applications of artificial intelligence like machine learning, deep learning. I have worked on various domains of deep learning which is known as computer vision, generative adversarial networks and natural language processing. I have also contributed to the large AI projects in a team by Omdana. Okay, so this is this is my basic uh, skills, and also I run a small YouTube channel, which is not as you now not a small a big YouTube channel, which is around we have a 500 members where we where I where I make a content on machine learning, deep learning, and various AI things, and I put end to end courses there. Currently, deep learning course is being launched, so you can start watching after this completing this that this course that deep learning course. Okay, so that's that's that, that is from my side, and you can connect me on LinkedIn if you want to know about more about me. And I've also cleared some Microsoft exams, so you can get to know more about there about me. Okay, I'm also a founder of Android, an AI a tech platform, and also a product based platform. Okay, so that's it from my side, and I hope that you will get a lot more from this course. Now, let's discuss the syllabus of this course. We will start with a very basic machine learning covering the fundamentals of machine learning in the section number one. And then we will go further into un understanding some algorithms like linear regression, logistic regression, support vector machine, principal common analysis, learning theory, and some ensemble learning methods like bagging, boosting, stacking, cascading, and then we'll talk about unsupervised learning. And you may think, hey, you sure taught you what you wanted to teach this much? No, absolutely no. It, this this is a 10 plus hours of course. So absolutely there is a lot more content. So this this course is divided into sections and each sections have different subsections. So you, uh, you I have made a full syllabus docs what topics I'm going to cover in each and every topic or subsect a section divided into subsection and you can assess the syllabus by visiting the course website, the course website that we made with um, uh, are made with my friends, friends of Android. So you can definitely go there and assess all the syllabus, all the problem sets of this of, of this course, and each and every section you will be you will, you will be having one problem set, and all of these is in the description down box below. Okay, all of where the timestamps as well as the course well, notes. Okay, so are all available on the course website. So you can go there, see what assignment are there, complete that, and join our Discord server to dis to discuss your assignments. And you can also submit it through forum. Okay, so this is the basic syllabus that that we are going to follow. And I really hope that I work a lot in preparing the materials for this course, teaching you all in the blackboard, and understanding you, helping you understand each and every topics of machine learning in a very 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 easy way and this course have extensive syllabus a very good syllabus uh, to um, which i have which i ha i haven't seen on full youtube okay so please be sure to see the syllabus what we are going to cover just have told you in in just short the reason is i i want to just start with this uh, video so I give it a shot you can see the syllabus by visiting our course website for absolutely free everything for absolutely free you can go to the course website which is the link in the description and box below so let's start with the section number one fundamentals of machine learning okay so now we'll start with machine learning in this section you will get an introduction to machine learning and we'll talk about introduction to machine learning types of machine learning and their types and we'll see some cool applications and then we will see some problem of overfitting and underfitting and then we'll wrap up this section. 
Okay, so let's try. Okay, so now we will answer a question. What is machine learning? And you may ask, hey Ayusha, it's, it's very, uh, can you uh, tell what actually machine learning is? Yeah, you will get to know more and more about what actually the big picture of machine learning means you, in, in depth when, when we will go through this course. But in simple terms, machine learning is like this. Computer programs that uses algorithms to analyze the data and make intelligent predictions based on the data without being explicitly programmed. And you might think, hey Ayush, uh, what is kind of this? Um, it, I'm getting a little bit confused. No worries. So let's um, let's get into this and let let me explain you what I'm saying over here in this blackboard. So you are given a data. You are given a data, okay? And then you give to the algorithm. The algorithm, the algorithm analyzes the data, analyzes the data, analyzes the data, and whatever he has analyzed or learned from the data, it makes predictions based onto that. It makes predictions onto that. Okay. So specifically, what we were, what what we are doing, we want to make a function x that maps out input variable x to the output variable y and you may think here yeah, you sure confusing me what is x what is y no worries x is the input feature x is the input feature means uh, let's take in a problem statement of predicting the house prices predicting the house prices okay so you want to do this so uh, here on the basis of the size of the house so uh, on the basis of size of the house you want to predict the price of the house okay so you give input, input variable x and you get output variable y okay so on the basis of the size of the house you want uh, the price of the house okay so you wanted to make a function so you wanted to make a function f that takes input x and maps that to y and that's the definition of machine learning that's the beauty of machine learning so what we were doing we are we want to our, we want to map our input variable x maybe it, it can be maybe the size of the house maybe the uh, the num number of fans in the house maybe the number of a bedrooms in the house so i'm denoting with a subscript one subscript two subscript three and we want to make a function that maps these input variables to the output variable which which we did denote with y which is the price of the house and that's and that we are doing and we will, and we will learn how to make these functions okay so that's the beauty of machine learning which you can see over here so let's see some of the more formal definitions which you, which you will see you more over the internet that the machine learning is the field of study that gives computer the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed said by Arthur Samuel but one definition that I say to you is totally means if you if you if you if someone asks you hey hey whatever your name uh, what is machine learning you just ask hey I, I know a better way to define a machine learning you just make a function you just to make a function that maps your input variables to the output variable okay and that's the beauty or that that's called the machine learning and I hope that you that you that you got it what I'm what I'm trying to say you here and X's are the input features that you that you wanted to on the basis of that these are the input input features and on the basis of that you want to predict the price Okay, the, another definition of machine learning is the computer program is said to learn from the experience E with respect to the, some class of a task T and some performance measured by P. If its performance on T as measured by P improves with the experience E. And this may seem a little bit intimidating, but let me clear this definition. It's very, uh, my, my, my favorite definition, although this, this is my favorite definition that I've shown to you, but uh, let me tell you what the definition tells you the definition is so before that let me take one example which is uh, let's take an example of uh, checkers okay playing checkers playing checkers I hope that you no 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 uh, let's let's take another because many other people do not play checkers over here okay so let's take a spammed email spam detection system email spam detection detection system which you will make in this course uh, yeah 
you will make this course you will make this into the course okay so this is a problem statement and what's the, what's the let's fit that definition onto this problem here t is the detecting the emails means detecting whether the email is a spam or a not so let's let's denote zero as uh, detecting a spam or one as a, a ham okay so let's say let's say ham and e is the experience of his prediction is the experience here e is the experience of detection and p is the performance how much performance increases upon to the experience so in this way higher the experience is best the uh, system is but i think this is more formally fit to something called a reinforcement learning which will not see the advanced learning but uh, Again, the definition which you have to take is you wanted to make a function a function f that maps your input variables to the output variable and that's machine learning and or you can say that's the beauty of machine learning. Okay, so some of the applications of machine learning, there is, um, I just listed on few, but there are a lot more. Self-driving cars, real estate, stock price prediction, in medical we have a ch COVID-19 detection, uh, maybe the, uh, using chest radiographs, and then uh, disease prediction, cancer detection, etc. And then it's just a boom. And I highly encourage people to get into this field and try to contribute to the world in a unique way. Okay, so you can see over here some, some of the applications of machine learning. So how it works. So what you do, uh, let, let me get to get back to my board and how it actually works, all this, how it works. It's, it's kind of a very easy. Uh, how it works, uh, first you study a problem. So again, let's, let's take a problem. Let's take a problem of, again, a spam detection. A spam detection, detection system, okay? I, I think it's C. Okay, so you have to make a spam detection system. So first you study the problem, you have a look at the data, how actually the data is. Okay, so first you do this. The second thing, this is a basic workflow. The second thing, you train the algorithm. And algorithm is just a function. It's just a function, okay, f of x which you will uh, how it is defined which you'll see later on but you just uh, have, have a function which is algorithm this is this is the algorithm algorithm and you tra train with this algorithm and then you go further into evaluation evaluation you evaluate it into uh, you give a new train new uh, emails and check with is correcting per correct or not and then if it is good then you launch the system then you launch the system launch the system otherwise otherwise you analyze some error you do error analysis you do error analysis and then you go further into tuning your improving your algorithm or evaluating your uh, and then you evaluate then again do that do like this so that's why machine learning is called ml is very very iterative process iterative process which you will see in more in ml oops why it is termed that but but if beginner don't worry about it okay but if you want to get it after this course you can get to uh, my gans course or maybe the deep learning course or um, maybe another course which is dsa which, which i'll talk about why it is very important and then you can head over to the ml oops videos okay so this is the basic you can you can head over to that and learn something new from there okay so uh what are the types of machine learning systems since there are uh i think the three types of the main main machine learning systems are three types supervised unsupervised reinforcement learning and although there is few more which is batch learning transfer learning active learning passive learning and satra which you which you can learn obviously when you go further no when you go further means into um, more into machine learning then you will see that uh, how you are learning these all and you learn a grasp each and every concept in a few um, minutes okay so uh, what is supervised learning supervised learning uh, let's 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 go get back to my boat again and let's take an example of another example which is my favorite uh, no I'm not I'm not my favorite but yeah it's a uh, house price prediction so I'm just writing about house price prediction prediction I'm just a system okay so this is a house price prediction so you have a feature uh, let's uh, let's let's denote that uh, on the basis of the size of the house size of the house 
I'm just taking example because in the real world, the size of the house, the, the fan number of fans in the house, number of bedrooms in the house on the basis of, but just for now, uh, for predicting this from the size of the house, you want to predict the price of the house. You want to predict the price of the house, which is which we denote as a Y. And whatever we give, whatever we take as a feature, we denote this as a X. Okay, so there is a, we denote there is only one one feature, which is X one, and only we are getting a one output, which is Y. Okay, so uh, we are we provide X one means the size of the house, and we are getting the price of the house as an output. Okay, so. Uh, you can see over here that we have a uh, size and we have a labeled means we have given the price and the model can learn from this how the trend is how the trend is on a, uh, it, it can recognize patterns okay so you can see over here that our data is labeled as a y means we know what our output so it learned from their label and input that's called a supervised learning how you can identify the problem is supervised because you see the target variable which is called the target this, this is called the target variable and this is called the uh, features features or variables okay and the one we want to predict is called the target variable so we this is the features or variable so you see that there is a relationship between your input value x and the output value y input value x and output value y why i'm saying it has some relationship because you can see over that we are given the size of the house and we want to predict the price of house so you can see over the entities that they have some kind of relationship and we know what our output should look like in this case we know what our our output should look like in regression it's kind of a continuous output our output will be in continuous value so we know what our output should look like and that's called supervised learning okay so i think you will I, I, I think it's going good it means you're under understanding what i'm saying so in simple terms you can see the definition of a hill we feed the data in this the data are labeled means that the output variable which we denote as a y are labeled and which we give which has some relationship between our input value x and the output value y okay so in then the unsupervised learning uh, which which i'm not going to go dig dive just now and further i will i will be digging dive into this so we the data are not labeled and we can say that we don't know what our output should look like and there is not kind of any relationship between what are what will be our input variable and what will be our output variable and we have to recognize our patterns based on the data for doing so we have different algorithm which we'll study later okay so i'm just um, not digging digging dive but in simple terms uh, but in simple terms what i what i'm saying that um, let me let me tell you what I'm what I'm saying okay so uh, let's say you this these are the t-shirt sizing you want to you have a different different t-shirts and we're denoting this as t-shirt so we have a different different t-shirt and what on super and this is our data this is our data and you have to then uh, you have to simply classify or cluster it out so what are what your model will do it simply make this as a L it simply makes this as a XL and it simply makes as a M okay so it's just uh, make clusters it makes cluster XL and L and for now I don't recommend to uh, brainstorming these things because we will uh, first we have to understand fully supervised learning then it will most much clear uh, unsupervised learning so I don't want to dig dive into unsupervised learning for now but you can see over the definitions are cut to cut okay so let's start, let's keep dive, deep diving into supervised learning so what are supervised learning so in supervised learning um, we know our output variable and input variable etc that, that I was just explain you over house price prediction so in supervised learning we have two types of problems the problems of supervised learning can be classified into two types so let me write it a supervised learning problem supervised learning problem can be classified into regression problem regression problem and it can be classified into classification problem classification problem okay so let's keep talking about what is regression what is classification so i'm going to take take an example which is a house price prediction which is a house price prediction means house price prediction and we can see over here that our output will be in continuous value because super, super supervised learning and we know what our output is so you can see over that output will be in continuous value continuous value 
okay so your output is, is in continuous value and in classification and in classification uh, let, let's say given a picture x means the often uh, you want to class classify an image of a picture as a cat or a non-cat or a non-cat okay so um, you give given a picture x um, you wanted to uh, identify that as a cat or non-cat okay so, so you can see over that is a binary it is only two it is it is a, it is called a decreed value it is called the decreed value means we can now classify that in regression if our output of that problem is in continuous value that's called a, that's 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 that is a regression problem if our output of the particular problem is in decreed value we can classify that as a classification problem and you can see over here the definition is the same okay okay so why we need to divide our data so let's let let me talk about because i'm talking too much about data but what is data it's this, this question arises a very good question that i want to ask by myself is data are the they how does data looks like um in data let's take, let's take an example of an application uh, system that is a price of the house uh, pre, pre, house price predictor okay so the data, data will look like this so I'm just just making a data frame. So you have a size of the house, then you have a number of a fans, then you have a number of a bedrooms, then then is the target variable which is the price. So these are your x, these are your x, and this is your y. Okay. And what you do? Uh, let's let's take nine square feet to to twenty two. I'm just taking as a thousand etc just a thousand dollar i'm just taking as an example don't think that is a nine a nine square feet size of the house don't don't think like that okay so uh this this is kind of thing and uh, so this this is kind of thing and we have a size and we have a number of fans we have a number of uh, bedrooms okay so uh what you do uh here you can see over here that we have a data we have your data and what you do you divide your data into training into training and testing set into test training and testing set so let's say you have a hundred percent of data you, you take 80 percent of your data for training or model and 20 percent of your data for testing the reason why you take this to evaluate your model because you from where you will get all those uh, for testing so you just keep 20 20 percent for evaluating to check how how best your model is okay so this is the division of a data which you'll see more later on okay so there are two problems that i want to highlight is uh overfitting and underfitting okay so what is overfitting so let's take an example again i just i just i just believe in examples okay so here is your x and y plane i hope that everyone remembers in in, in their school days oops what is happens i hope that i draw incorrectly okay so you have this uh, these features let me draw it very quickly this is your data points and what you do uh, you simply draw a straight line you simply draw a straight line to make predictions okay so uh, let's do this, this is your input which is x so let's say 2200 square feet so it will go over here and check what is the price so it will give here okay so like that it will make prediction which we'll see later on so you can see over here that in underfitting in underfitting in underfitting what happens if your model if your model has not performed well onto the training data as well as the testing data means in underfitting your model does not perform well onto the training and the testing data means uh, your model is performs bad under training and the testing data it means because you don't have a large number of in a large number for data you can you can simply add more data okay but in what happens in underfitting? Can anyone will tell me what happens in underfitting? So let me highlight this little bit. Let me. Um, so in underfitting, if your model has learned too much, this is because when you have too much of features. So let's say your uh, it, 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 uh, it will try to touch each and every point. It will try to touch each and every point, and this is. Called, and you can see if you if you have a if your model learned too much and it it is generalizing very very well very very well onto the training data on the training data but it fails to generalize well fails to generalize well on testing data testing data then you can say that your model is overfitting
Okay, so you can see over here that that diagram is over here, and you can see over here that un, un, underfitting, which you, does does not fit a straight line, a very good way, and good fit is good 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 model. You can just fit a straight line, and it's a bad fit, overfit it. Okay, so the solutions of this, which we'll see later on, but before that, we'll touch some algorithms, and again, some notations which I've already taught you. X means the input features, x1, x2, all the way down to the xn. Y means the output features. M means the number for training examples, and here let's say 600 training example which you will get to know more further which when when we will go more further into this course okay so now we are uh, done with this uh, introduction of machine learning and i really hope that you enjoyed this tutorial and in the next section we'll be talking about one of the algorithm which is linear regression and i hope that you will really enjoy that so let's meet at the next section okay so now we will briefly talk about supervised and unsupervised learning with adaptation and some case studies and data sets so to fully understand what happens in supervised and unsupervised learning okay so let's start so uh, what happens in supervised learning In supervised learning as the name suggests someone is supervising over here i will take an example of a data set to help you understand better okay so in supervised learning uh, what I have told you in, um, in, the, in the previous section is about in machine learning that you uh, in, in supervised learning we make a function f of x that maps your input variable to the output variable okay so here in supervised learning we have the input data input data as well as the output data okay means as, a, as an example that we have this data set we have this data set just assume that we have this data set and here we have this outlook feature temperature feature means x1 x2 then we have a humidity as x3 windy as x4 okay and here this the red one play tennis so here is our problem statement is given on these features outlook temperature and humidity and windy we have to predict whether the whether that boy will play tennis or not okay so this is your target variable this is your target variable or or the variable that we want to predict okay this is the target variable or the variable that we wanted to predict that we want to predict so it is given in this case so it is given in this case so here uh, we have our x variable as well as y variable as well as the y okay as well as the y variable okay so we're going to make a function f of x using this data that maps our input value all these features x1 all the way on the x4 uh, to a y variable okay so we'll give input whether it is sunny or whether it is hot or high or false and given on this feature the function will give you output whether it will play no or yes okay so here and this is a supervised learning problem because we have our so we have our labels which you can see over here okay so and you can also see that we have a, some kind of relationship between our input value and our output value why as you can see that and these uh, there is there is some kind of relationship like a may list let's take an example of house price prediction so given an input feature size you want to predict the price of the house of the house of the house so it is on a shame name so there is a some kind of relationship between our input feature x and the output feature y okay another another property of supervised learning is that these features which are input features are co are independent features are independent features are independent independent features what do i mean by independent features they do not have to depend on any 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 feature they don't have to depend on any feature but this target variable y is a dependent feature because the, the target variable y is depending on these features is depending on these features to be mapped and the, is depending on these features so that's why x1 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 all the way around to the x i i equals to one all the way around to the k means x1 x2 x3 x4 is a independent feature which you call usually as an independent variable or feature and y is your dependent variable or feature 
okay so that's the that's that's called the features um, the, the supervised learning so let's um, so let's let me write a basic definition or a good definition of supervised learning what what is supervised learning a good definition okay so the good definition of uh, supervised learning is here in supervised learning we have we have our input features x we have our input we have our input features x we have our input feature x large x and just assume that x large x is contains all features in a vector all that under the x i okay okay so we have input we have our input feature x and also we have our output feature y we have our output feature y output feature y y and there is some kind of there is some kind of relationship some kind of relationship between the input value x and the output value y and and x is called independent feature x x features are called independent feature and y is the dependent feature because it is dependent on to the input features okay so we have seen you so shown you an example that there is a y there is a y that is used to train uh, using x okay it is that is using x and y okay so we'll be able to uh, predict our model so we will see in the next section how we make a predictive model okay as a part of linear regression so let's see some of the so um, but before that i want to i, I wanted to uh, just to show you that there are two parts of supervised learning first one is a regression second one is classification classification so what do i mean by regression you know what your output will look like because here we know that what our output because we have already seen our data so you can see the output is in decreed value what do you mean by decreed value your output is in finite means either it will be yes or no so here if it is in decreed value if you know that your output is in decreed value then you then you then you consider that as a classification problem how you had identify that is a classification problem when your output is in decreed value and when your output is in continuous value means um, uh, it's not finite maybe the age of the person maybe the stock prices that is a, that is continuous okay so that's why you, if your output is in continuous then it's a regression if your output is degree then it's a classification okay so let's see some of the applications of supervised learning to help you understand more better to get the feel of supervised learning so in supervised learning we have our favorite uh, in supervised learning we have uh, maybe the stock price prediction stock price prediction we are you are given closing price high closing high then etc maybe some volume and you to predict what is the uh, stock price and on the maybe the you want to predict this you can consider c close as a target variable you want to predict what what will the closing price basis on high and volume okay so high and volume are your independent feature and c equals c will be your dependent feature which will be the y next is maybe the house price prediction maybe you want to basis on the size like that you want to predict what will be the output y and maybe uh, let's take example of a classification problem give uh, you want to identify whether the person has a diabetes or not basis on maybe the age gender bmi etc okay so we have this output wave y okay so these are some of the applications of unsuper sorry supervised learning okay so now let's see so unsupervised learning as i'm not going to go deep dive into this uh, unsupervised learning there is a next section that there is a particular section after supervised learning we will cover the in depth about the unsupervised learning but the core idea behind the unsupervised learning that in this case in supervised learning we are given xi as well as yi for uh, for each uh, for every i equals to 1 all divided down to the m and m here is the number of a training examples means uh, okay so that's the m here is means we are for uh, we are given i okay so here uh, in super supervised learning in supervised learning we have this in unsupervised learning the unsupervised learning we have only x i's we have only x i's we don't have y i's we have only x i we have x1 x2 x3 all the way down to the xm okay we don't have the label yi there is no supervisor that will guide you okay and what you have to do let's take an example uh, you have 
you have this uh, so uh, here is your data set so here you have a channel reason fresh milk grocery frozen detergent and, and delicacin so let's take an example that uh, answers learning is used in markets market segmentation segmenting your customers so you have these features and you don't have the whether the person with you what you do you just cluster the person which has similar nature you have you just cluster the person let's take an example that these person use uh, used to eat milk this person used to that so you cluster this out you cluster this out okay then you can hand code it okay this person used to eat milk and then you can send promotion to these people or big deal another thing to these people so you can identify your business needs and etc from these clusters either i'm not going to give deep dive into the application etc but i will go deep dive into the application everything but as of now i hope that you understood supervised learning in depth okay so that's it for this uh, uh, just a small uh, video on supervised learning and unsupervised learning in the next section we'll be starting with actually the math and then we'll deep dive into the machine learning the beauty of you will see the beauty of machine learning okay so let's meet at the next section till then do the problem sets so now we have seen an introduction to machine learning and i hope that you have really enjoyed that section now it's time for getting to hands your dirty into the maths now we will see some learning algorithms which is linear regression and then we will do one project which is boston hot spots prediction so i uh, so i'm very excited to uh, have your first learning algorithm in your toolkit so head over to the next section okay so now we will see one algorithm which is a linear regression which is a learning algorithm um, as in the in our previous section we have seen a machine learning and, and introduction to machine learning now we will see how to make that function f of x that maps that maps your input variable x to the output variable y okay so before that i want to recall something which is in supervised learning in supervised learning we are we were having two types of problems first one is a regression problem the second one is classification problem as you might think okay so linear regression as you know as you can see from the term regression it's a regression algorithm so it's a regression algorithm that we'll study today okay in this section okay so let's recall what is regression it's a it's a type it's a, it's a type of supervised learning and super, supervised learning algorithm and here we know our output will be in continuous value our output will be in continuous value means let's say let's let's take an example that you want to predict the price of the house let's say you want to predict the price of the house okay so you can see over here the output of this particular problem will be in continuous value we don't have any kind of decreed value so we can identify that this problem is based on to the uh, linear regression problem okay so let's 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 start see let's see let's see how this algorithm works in much more detail so that you could get more intuition about and you can ace an interview on linear regression and also i'll be putting some interview questions over here of what someone can ask you and what someone not okay so let's assume that we have a scattered data so let me make one x and y plane i hope that this is good pretty good and let me make that one okay so i'm just wanting to make the scattered data that looks like this okay so this is your data and let's take as a problem statement as like this let's take a problem statement which is predicting the price of the house based on the size of the house so let me write that predicting the price of the house predicting the price of the house and this is the end in rupees so the price of the house based on the size of the house okay so you will give x which will which will be the size of the house and you will get the y which will be the price of the house okay okay so we have the scattered data and in x axis we have our size which is our input variable and in y axis we have our price okay so what we do we fit a straight line we fit a straight in linear regression we fit a straight line like this we fit a straight line which is called the hypothesis 
which is called a hypothesis in a regression term. This is called a hypothesis, which will see how we can compute the straight line. So we make the straight line, and you can see over here that after making the straight line, we can make predictions. So let's say that this is this is the size, and based on this, we are making the prediction like this onto the y-axis. Okay, so and again, let's say the price. Let, let, let's say the size of the house is 2,200 square feet. Then the price will be like this, uh, 22,000, etc. So like 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 this, we are making predictions. Okay, and you can see over here this line is a little bit far away from the actual data point. So that's the issue that that we'll see later on. But you just construct a straight line that touches each that that closely touches each each point or that that is closely. Um, uh, passes through the stray, uh, scatter uh, data points okay so let's see how we can compute the straight line because linear regression as you know linear means it constructs a linear line that separates the data okay okay so let's see how it works so in for making the straight line as, as I've already told you this is called the hypothesis so how we construct hypothesis so this is called the hypothesis function we compute hypothesis function like this we have weight of every features so let's say theta 0 times x 0 plus theta 1 theta 0 time times x 0 plus theta 1 times x 1 plus theta 2 times x 2 all the way down to the theta n times x n okay so uh, you, you're summing it all up so what what I what what you can see over here that what you can see over here that we have this theta and we have these features this is the this is the size let's say the size of the house let's say this is the maybe the f number of fans in the house I'm just taking the uh, problem statement predicting the price of the house so so that's fine number of uh, fans in the house and and etc okay so these are the features x1 x2 and x0 is the bias term is the bias term or the y intercept or the y intercept maybe if you know about inter intercept of y means if x0 equals to 0 then your line will be crossing from the origin if x0 equals to 1 then it will be from 1 if x0 equals to 2 then it will be from 2 okay so it determines the y intercept from where he, he wants to make a straight line okay so we have this uh, theta 0 times x0 theta 1 times x1 theta 2 times x2 all the way down to the theta x times x xn and let's take a particular problem statement and let's understand that but before that you may think here yeah, use what is theta here what is theta here we only have to learn machine only have to learn this theta machine only have to get the best theta now we are able to make prediction now let's say we we take theta zero let's take we take theta zero to be uh, uh, two okay and theta one to be let's say three theta two to be four okay so just just now i'm taking only uh, two features and one bias term which is the this, this is the bias term and these are the two features and uh, x0 is obvious is always equals to one x0 is always equals to one so that's why we never write x0 okay so that's why we never write we just write uh, theta 0 plus uh, theta 1 times x1 we did not write but i uh, just just, just i've showed you so for a clear reason of those things okay so you can see over here that uh, let's let's take an example that the, this uh, we have two features like the size of the house and the number of fans on the basis of that you have to predict the price so for each feature we learn the weight these these are called the feature weights these are called the feature weights so we learn this and if we get the best feature weight we will getting the best prediction if we get the bad feature weight we will be getting bad prediction okay so let's say uh, let's let's construct the problem so let's say your theta 0 to be 2 times x0 which is x where x0 equals to 1 so it's obviously 2 plus theta 1 which is let, let's say theta 1 is 3 as of and times the size of the house plus the theta to be 4 times the number of fans in the house okay so now this now using this you can make the prediction you can just plug in the size and you can plug in the number of fans and you will be getting your desired output y 
okay so just now you may think hey machine learning is not we are not it we are only using it as a computational power and uh, you can see over here that how it how it learns theta will which we'll see because machine learning is totally based upon learning parameters okay so you will see how the theta is learned so let me tell you uh, thetas uh, we have to only learn theta we have to only learn which will see the techniques where we have to only learn theta we have to only learn theta and if the theta is bad then then you then your hypothesis when the function is bad so this this is your function this this constructs your function like this theta 1 times x1 plus theta 2 times x2 all the way around the theta n times xn and n here they denotes the number of features and features are the columns okay in the data okay so uh, this, this is a function and you can use this function to map your input variable to your output variable y okay so that's 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 kind of our we have our kind of a uh, function that maps our input variable to our output variable okay okay so now i think that you that's that that's we've got how we construct that straight line and using this function we can construct that straight line and we have to only learn these these this this is called the these are called the feature weights these are called the feature weights and these are called the feature weights and this is the bias term or the y intercept uh, from where the 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 line should originate as i've showed you earlier okay so uh, now I hope that you got uh, intuition about hypothesis function. Okay, so now let's keep talking about uh, the vectorized form of this. I Means um, the vectorized form is uh, may, maybe vec 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 vectorization means how here we are separately computing for each values. We are computing theta zero, then times x zero, theta one times x one means separately for each value. So in vectorization we do at once. We do at once. So what we do? We put our all the thetas. So we put our, so I'm just writing vectorized forum, vectorized forum. So we put our all theta, we put our all theta to be in joint vector theta. And uh, let me do this, theta zero, theta one, theta two, all the way around the theta n. And theta, these theta, the, this is the feature vector. This is the feature vector, which can, which is all uh, the weights. You will further see that, yeah, we have to only learn weights. Then you will believe me that, yeah, we have only have to learn weights, whether it's a neural network, whether it's a machine learning, okay? So you have this weights theta in the joint vector theta, and you take a joint vector x, and you store all your x's over there. x0, x1, x2, x3, all the way down to the xn, okay? So you take this, and then you take out the dot product okay so then you take out the dot product and theta times dot product okay so now your hypothesis f of x will be like this okay so you just give this function and thetas what what it will do it will uh, theta 0 times x1 theta 1 times x1 it will sum sum it all up theta 1 theta 2 like like this broadcast it okay and it is computing at once okay so you, so you can try and then sum sum it all up okay so you so you, so you can write in summation format i equals to one all the way down to the n or i equals zero all the way down to the n theta theta i times x uh, let's say i okay so so you are doing it's a vectorized form of that and you can see over here uh, in python is very easy just one line of code uh, like like this you just do like this np dot dot theta and x done okay so it's very easy in python so don't worry how how we can code this all it's it's quite easy okay so now we have seen the hypothesis and have, and, and we have seen the vectorized form of this linear regression okay so you may think hey ayush how i can get this theta but before that how we can evaluate your theta is best means your thetas are good your the theta are good so for evaluating your model we have something called cost function we have something called cost function okay so why we evaluate a model to check 
how are the if our theta is good or not okay so we check because using that theta we are making prediction we are multiplying with the features and we will get feature these the size we will get from the user we will this game if fan number of fans get the user we mul multiply with the weights and then sum it all up and then we give the result okay so this is the cost function and here uh, what why why we use cost function to evaluate your model okay so uh, you you will get to know how what what we do so let's say uh, we have a scatter plot so let me plot one a scatter plot like this again the same i'll be doing the same but this time little bit more crunchy yeah i think so okay so this is this this is my plot and what we do we simply draw a straight line uh, this this is your hypothesis this this is your hypothesis which is f of x and what this cost function will do this is your act this is your actual data point these are your actual data point and these these are your actual data point it will what it will simply do it will simply take out the distance between predicted this this is the predicted that i'm high highlighting and this is the actual okay so this is the predicted this is the sorry this is the predicted and this is the actual this is the predicted this is the actual okay so it takes out the difference between or uh, the the it takes out distance between like that like, like this predicted minus the actual value predicted minus the actual value like this uh, yeah like this and uh, and then sum it all up means higher the this uh, law cost function will be bad your model is higher the cost function will be bad your model will be and uh, less the cost function will be uh, good your model will be the reason why if your if your points are on this line and your cost function will be zero because the predicted will be zero sorry let's say predicted will be the all the same and actual will be also the same so it will be res resulting in zero so just what what we do we this, this, these are called the residuals in terms of uh, cost function so we just take out the distance between predicted and the actual value for all data points okay so this is the cost function okay so uh, let's try let's for, formulate this in a formula let's formulate this is the for a formula like this uh, let me show you how we can formulate that yeah so you just take out of j of theta and just denoting j of theta will be like the uh, short form of cost function because we are checking how our theta is good or bad or not okay because it only determines whether your model is good or bad 1 over m 1 over m and m here is the number of our data points plus i equals to 1 all the way down to the m and you just uh, model predicted value let's let's denote the model predicted value by y hat and how how we have we have we got y hat yeah we have got y hat like this y hat equals to uh, f of x equals to theta times x mean the dot product of theta and x which is equivalently equals to the hypothesis okay so we let's let's note as a y hat minus y okay and in other words we can write this out like this in other words we can write write this out like this theta transpose x i minus y i and this is this is just a hypothesis h of x okay and transpose like this uh, you you your uh, x will, will be like this so you make this uh, theta will to be like this okay so it will be easier like this okay so this so that's what this transpose is doing but if, if you can do or not just just we are doing the this uh, let me write that theta times x okay the dot product between theta and x minus y i okay minus y i for each and every day data point we are taking out the difference between predicted and actual value and then we're squaring we are squaring here because it helps us to and further call something called the gradient descent okay for easily derivation of this cost function you will see why, why i'm taking derivation term over here okay so in other words this 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 is called the loss function which is known as mean square error m s e okay which is called the mean square error if you square root this if you make this uh, let let me show you what i'm telling if you square root to a one over m plus i equals to one all the way down to the m uh, theta dot xi minus yi squared if you square root this like this 
okay this this is called the root mean square error root mean root mean squared error okay and higher this and better model this okay okay that's just just we are taking the square root okay but we'll stick with this um mmc but in real world emily and kaggle competition they have given what they're going to use mainly i have seen rms to be used very much okay so uh after we got our cost function and it tells okay your model is that good or that bad now if your model is bad how you can optimize or how how you can get the optimal theta means best theta how you can get the optimal theta this is the great question to ask okay so how, how you how you're going gonna to get this optimal theta for getting that we have something called gradient descent something called gradient descent algorithm gradient descent algorithm which is known as the optimization algorithm which is known as the optimization algorithm which will help us to get the best theta okay optimization algorithm okay so uh, let's let's stick dive into this uh, algorithm and let's understand how we go get this kind of thing so let's say our the visualization of the cost function will, will be like this okay just just for a sake of an example i'm visualizing like this okay so this, this is your cost function i'm just writing as a z of theta this, this is your cost function and now your cost uh, cost here use is your theta where the cost function is very high okay so here is your theta okay so what gradient descent does it tweaks the theta means let, let's say your theta is zero then simply let's say it makes theta a little bit to 0 0.2 okay it tweaks the theta it changes theta a little bit and if the cost function decreases then updates the theta to be not like this to be like this if the theta go down means the cost function little bit decreases then it change again 0.3 if the cost function decreases then it's do not make this then it's uh, update this theta okay then again it's, it simply tweaks checks if the j of theta go, going down if yes update the theta okay until and unless your uh, cost function is until and unless your cost function is approximately equals to zero okay so that is simply the gradient descent and it's very very simple that i just shown to you so let's let's for, formulate this mathematically because it's very very simple when we formulate this as a mathematics so how we simply what what we do for tweaking these things for tweak, tweaking the theta we take out the partial derivative we take out the partial derivative of your cost function j of theta now you will think hey i use you have um, why why you have taken the calculus name i'm not a calculus student i'm not kind of that don't worry at, at all at all it's kind of it's i just want to give you one definition of a partial derivative partial what it what it does it simply tweaks your theta it simply tweaks your theta and checks if the cost function decreasing okay and it's just like the slope it's just like the slope but you don't need calculus you don't even need calculus yeah if you want to go on a research level then you obviously need but for now for a machine learning you don't need calculus for deep learning even you don't need ca calculus just um, just uh, you can uh, just what it, what this equation is doing it is just it is just um, uh, tweaking your theta tweaking your theta a little bit so it gives us like this 2 over m so it gives us 2 over m plus i equals to 1 all the way down to the m and it's a y hat minus y squared okay so this the after after deriving this partial we, we we get like this okay so now after this we do uh, we do we take out the partial derivative for every theta means theta 0 theta 1 theta 2 theta 2 all the way down to theta n we do for all theta we take out a partial derivative of all theta and then we up and then we update our theta so here is a full gradient descent algorithm so what 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 we do we simply write theta z this is the update kind of assignments theta z minus the learning rate alpha and the kind of a partial derivative of your okay partial derivative of your cost function okay so what we are doing this is how this this is how this 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 will be our new theta that i've just shown to you we update the theta 
so this this is your old theta means the bad theta this is your learning rate in what rate your uh, uh, this is the hyperparameter which I will talk about in just a second in de de detail but what we are doing over here we are this 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 uh, alpha de determines the rate means if the alpha is too large if the alpha is too large it will go like this it will never converge it will be like diverging like like this if your theta is very small then I think that it will be never converge at local minimum it will be like this it will never converge at local minimum so the optimal theta that I've used till now it's a 0.1 for larger data set 0.01 for okay for a little bit smaller medium data set 0.001 a little bit more smaller and 0 0.0001 okay so there's these these are the optimal uh, for me I have seen so far is these uh, alpha but you can tune it you can tune it using um, grid search CV or ran randomized search CV which we will see later on okay okay so I, I just say to you why by this theta it just determines the rate of your uh, tweaking the parameter okay just going down and this 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 gives this is the simply the partial therapy of your cost function and we are updating this 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 will be our new theta and this is whole learn uh, algorithm of gradient descent okay okay this is just 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 equations tells us the whole algorithm for gradient descent okay so now again I'm going to talk about uh, vectorized forum how we can vectorize this okay because I, I totally believe in vectorization so let's tell what 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 we can do uh, here we are in Pre previously we are taking out the partial derivative of theta 0 and then we are taking out the partial derivative of theta 1 separately what we can do what we can do and we can simply put that into a like like this partial derivative into a joint vector theta into a j of theta with respect to zero kind of this and like this all the way down to the end okay so you just put into the joint vector and you just take out it partial derivative whatever you want to take out and then and then you just uh, write the vectorized forum theta z theta z minus the learning rate alpha and that gives us uh, like like this 2 over m times the x transpose x theta x theta minus y and this is your new um, derived equation which is a vectorized form okay and yeah 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 you can definitely use any any kind of this this is totally okay but for vectorization you can follow or not it's your opponent but for computational power just just have told to you okay so we have seen so far and now we are done with this we have developed our linear regression model we first have de developed the model from making predictions and then then we have moved further to check if how our theta is good then we have seen how to how to get optimal theta okay but you may think ask here yeah, you see i have to do these kind of things yeah you have to do these these kind of things for getting your and uh, and if I, take, if I say truth, uh, the truth is in scikit-learn you can implement this in three lines of code. You can implement this whole algorithm in the three lines of code in some library. But in programming assignment, you have to implement from scratch this algorithm so that you can ace any kind of interview. Okay? Okay. So, um, you may ask, there is something called a normal equation. There is something called normal equation. That, that I'm going to highlight a little bit. Normal equation gives you a better theta in just one way. Means normal equation gives you a theta, optimal theta in just one equation like this. So equation is x transpose x inverse of that x transpose y. And for by, by using this and x here is the data points, it means the features. So you can simply use this uh, formula for getting the for, for, for getting your optimal theta okay this is just the same as doing this but not in every algorithm it will work it will only for linear regression the normal equation is only for linear regression and I hope but uh, having a good intuition of all those because in interview they usually ask this they don't they usually talk about normal equation 
okay they don't talk, talk about normal equation they usually talk about this gradient descent etc although there are too many optimization algorithm some as like gradient descent in gradient descent we have this and then we have a stochastic gradient descent we have a stochastic which is called SGD we have a RM optimization algorithm we have a RMS prop RMS prop and then gradient with momentum which we which we will see advanced level in uh, I will talk about SGD but uh, Adam RM, RMS prop and some more optimization algorithm or convex optimization advanced as which you will see, ever see in deep learning okay okay or you can head over the new era with the deep learning courses currently learning and you can learn from there okay okay so now we are done with this and let's little bit let's little bit spend some time on to some assumptions of a linear regression okay because in an interview they usually ask why you wanted to choose this algorithm instead of this algorithm or what is the assumptions of these algorithm etc so the summer assumptions um, of a linear regression it the it should it should have a lean linear re relationship linear relationship the data should be linear the data should be linear and no or little multicollinearity. The co the correlation between uh, variables would be uh, no, nothing. Okay, no or little multicollinearity, multicollinearity. Okay, you can see a C O um, internet for more okay so now we have seen some assumptions but I want to just I want to give you the things what is independent and dependent feature independent means the size of the house the, the number of fans and number of uh, let's say the bedroom so these are the independent feature because they are not independent to any feature for the kind of any value but the target variable y is dependent on all these features so that's why the target variable is called independent sorry dependent and these are called independent okay so this, this is just a casual information to know because everyone talks about this okay so now I think that we have talked very very much in small amount of time and I hope that you really really enjoy this tutorial and I'm putting all my effort then you can go on to my youtube channel new era new era and you can sub subscribe that youtube channel if you want okay okay so um, now we have talked that and in the next section I'm going to go over uh, in theory pad I'm going to go over polynomial regression but let's spend some more amount of if, if I have time let's spend two more minutes on to polynomial regression okay so there is something called a polynomial regression as we have seen the assumption that data should be linear but let's say our data is not linear then what we do okay then what we do so let's say your data will be like Let's see your data is like this. Your data is like this. Your data is like this. So you, you, if you fit, fit like this, then it is obviously overfitting. So what you do, you just simply transform your data. You simply transform your data to be like this uh, into the quadratic form. You enter the quadratic form to be, uh, you just simply transform this one, um, one degree to the two degrees so it will conform like this okay so you two will be transformed as let's say four and six uh, three maybe transform as a nine and whatever whatever so just just i'm taking an example okay so you transform your data to be fitting over the linear so you transform your data to be fitting over linear now your uh, algorithm will be fitting like this okay so now i hope that you have gone everything about polynomial etc now we will talk about it we'll do some uh, boston house class prediction and then we'll move on to the regularized linear models okay so let's head over to the uh, boston house class prediction and then we'll move on to the regularized linear models okay so now we have seen linear regression and we have done one project now it's time for getting your hands dirty in the programming assignment you will be able to find the programming assignment description that marks below in the assignment page okay so and now we'll start with logistic regression after doing assignment come at the come come again and follow up with this uh, course so now we'll talk about logistic regression and i hope that you will really enjoy this okay so now we have seen linear regression which is one of the regression algorithm now we will see one classification algorithm which is logistic regression don't worry uh, don't think that this logistic regression is a regression algorithm no it's a classification algorithm so because the name is logistic regression because the underlying working of this algorithm is same as uh, is is something similar to linear regression okay so 
and you will get to know about this how it differs from linear regression okay so before that let's uh, let's uh, be clear about we are on the same page about classification what is classification okay so this is a great question to ask to yourself what is classification so let's take an example that given an image x you want to classify this image as a cat if it is cat, then we will name it as zero. If it is non-cat, then we will name it as a one. Okay? So this is a decreed value. Our output is a decreed value. And the classification is a supervised learning approach. So this algorithm is a supervised learning algorithm. So here we know what our output should look like. So here our output is a decreed value. So we can classify this as a classification task. Okay, so, so that's the classification and something called the binary classification and we have a multi-class classification also called a multi-class classification means uh, maybe the person has a cancer, person has a pneumonia, etc. This uh, means integrated value, your output is in finite value. value. Okay, so we have this cl classification and uh, this tool. So now it's time to study about legislative regression in detail. And uh, so what we do in legislative regression? We classify the data. We classify the data. So uh, let's start with hypothesis. In linear regression, we have our hypothesis, which is uh, uh, hfx. Uh, let's denote you know, as hfx equals to the in legislative regression we also do the same theta 0 times x0 plus theta 1 times x1 plus theta 2 times x2 all the way around to the theta n times xn okay so in linear regression we are doing the same for a drawing a straight line and here we are also doing the same for a function and this is and this 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 will be uh, for linear regression and the same for a legislative regression and this is the step this is the first step for hypothesis and the second step of hypothesis means the model predicted value equals to the sigmoid of h of x so let's denote this as a short form of z okay so this h of x is g and g here is simply h of x and h of x is here theta 0 all the way up to theta n so we're going to name it as a theta transverse x okay so you just here you just do the sigmoid of your uh, h of x which is which is your um, prediction function so you just uh, do do the six sigmoid of this z and you get your output and you get your output so let's say what this sigmoid does you get your output from logistic regression and this output makes the out uh, this uh, the this uh, whatever the output came let's say 22 22 to between 0 to 1 the, the sigmoid the if if you apply sigmoid to this you apply sigmoid to this then it uh, then it makes your output between the range of zero and one, and you and you set the threshold if and you set the threshold if your the model predicted y hat is greater than uh, y hat is greater than zero point five, then uh, this picture is a cat. Okay. Otherwise, if it is more than zero point five, then it is a non cat. Okay. And this is what it. Uh, this is what we are doing in linear regression. We are just. This is this. This was our hypothesis. But in addition, we add a sigmoid to our edge effects. And the reason why we add sigmoid, uh, it's it's totally because uh, that we want our output between zero and one in the range of zero and one, so that we can make prediction like this. So uh, you just you apply sigmoid and. Uh, formula for sigma is 1 over 1 plus e to the power minus z and z here is h, h, h of x okay so this 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 will be your whole hypothesis this is your prediction function okay now you just put the z and uh, theta you have to one learn theta you have to learn these thetas which is called the parameter okay? it's again the same as a linear regression okay so what we are doing we are just uh, uh, doing the same as a uh, first the first step we are doing the same as a linear regression and then we are applying a sigma at that edge of x and then um, we are getting the output which is the which is in the range of zero and one and uh, we set a threshold zero point five is a threshold and if the particular uh, the model predicted y hat from this output between the range is greater than zero point five then it is a cat otherwise if it's smaller than uh, of zero point five then it is a non cat. If you want to be more uh, 
uh, strict, then you can make 0 0.7. The probability is greater than uh, 0 0.70%. Okay. So let's say your more output like this 0 0.80. Okay, so it is equal to the 80%. Your model is saying that a particular, uh, this image is 80% uh, accurate that this is a cat. Okay, so you just make it as a 1. Round of 2, 1. Means it is a cat. Otherwise, if it is a 0 0.40, then it's 40% that is, uh, so you make it as a non cat. Okay, so this is the basic thing that you should understand. This is a prediction function that we have made. And again, we have to only learn these thetas. Um, it means we have to get these tt. Three, these thetas to get our to get our good output. Okay, so this this was a logic regression I, and I and the hypothesis for logic regression. Okay, okay. So now in linear regression we have seen something called a cost function, something called a cost function. And cost function simply what it does it simply uh, gives you the uh, accuracy of your model. Means if the cost function is very very high, then then your model is very bad. If your cost function is uh, low then your uh, then 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 your model is good okay so it help you see, it help us to evaluate your model okay means the the loss function it should be all the cost function for a good uh, for a good model your j of theta means the cost function should be approximately equals to zero okay okay so uh, in logic question we have defined a little bit different this cost function like this uh, let's do for one training example like this, j of theta, j of theta equals to minus one times y i, the log of h of x i, h of x i plus one minus y i, min one minus y i, log of one minus h of x i. Okay, so this this is your cost function for for one training example. And you can see over here that uh, we have a cost one minus one times the y i times the log of h of x i and one minus y i uh, times the log of one minus h of x i. So what we are actually doing? So let's break down this equation and let's understand it step by step. Okay. So what we are doing here? We are doing y i is the ground truth is the ground truth ground truth and h of x i h of x i is your model predicted value, which is the model predicted value, and it's just taking the log of that uh, your model and multiplying with the y i. Okay, so let's say uh, your y is equals to zero, your y is equals to zero, and your model predicted y hat is also equals to zero. Then your cost function will be uh, approximately equals to zero because uh, they both are same, so your cost function will be zero. Okay, will be low. If let's say your um, ground truth is one and your model predicted is equals to the zero, then this this is a mismatch. The, your your model done very bad, so your cost function will be very very high. Okay, so this this is what the basic intuition behind this cost function, and this is your basic formula. And again, uh, you can see over here that we do this uh, kind of for oops, what is. Okay, so uh, let, let me write the equation for M training example. We have done for one training example. So let's do for M training example. So let, let me write the equation for that. So you have a J of theta, you have a J of theta and one over M, one over M, I equals to one all the way under the M, Y I log of H of X I plus one minus Y I, the log of one minus h of x i. Okay, so this is a log loss. This is this is some sometimes called as log loss in terms of machine learning. So you just uh, this this is your cost function that is used to uh, use as a loss function that we have seen so far. And I've given an example when the both the output is correct, your ground truth and uh, your mod predicted is equals, then your cost function will be zero. Otherwise, it is, if it is different, then your cost function will be very very high. Okay, so this is the cause function for your legit regression model. So uh, let's re recapitulate the two things, the hypothesis and your uh, for cause function. So the hypothesis is that uh, h of x equals to the uh, sigmoid of z, and z here is theta transpose times x. Okay, the dot product between transpose times x, 
and you just uh, take the it's the equation which is uh, similarly equals to one over one plus e to the power minus c. And z here is just a theta, theta transpose x, theta transpose x. Okay, so uh, the theta contains the parameter weights. Uh, theta contains the parameter weights, and x contains the x one, x x zero, x one, all the way to multiply. Okay, and in by convention we are using x zero equals to one. You can re rewatch that uh, lin linear regression section once more if you are getting a little bit confused because I've explained I've gone a little bit slow there. Okay, okay. So and the gradient is for for getting the good. For reducing this uh, j of theta, or for getting the good optimal parameter, we use gradient descent algorithm. And gradient descent, where it does the same. Here is your theta. We have the cost function very, very high. This is your cost function diagram. So your cost function will be very, very high when your theta is here. When you change theta, your cost function a little bit decreases over here. Again, you change. Again, you change. Means you're taking out the gradient of your cost function and checking if it is going down. If it is, then you just update your parameter. Let's say theta zero was here to be uh, theta one to be here too. Then you update theta one to be little bit two point one. Then your cost one dec decreases. Then you do the same for getting into the uh, global optimum over here. Okay, uh, like this. Okay, so here is an equation for the same. So how's the equation? Uh, you just uh, I'm I'm doing it here. Theta z for t is just means of taking out a partial derivative. J of theta equals to the one over m. This this is your equation after deriving from cos function. This is your equation forms i equals to one all the way down to the m. X i minus y i. Okay, and then and you just add up some some kind of a x j times x j. Okay, so this this is your cos function. That's it. This this is the taking of the partial derivative. Although it it might change a little bit because everyone has a different kind of a uh, but it's but it's similar uh, to many, many of them. Okay, and then you just take out the partial derivative of your cos function j of theta, and then you uh, update the theta by the by taking out the gradient. Then you update the theta like this: uh, theta z uh, theta z minus the learning rate alpha. And this is your uh, this is your pre previous theta, and this is a new theta means updated theta, and you are taking out the partial derivative of cos function, and it's just the same. You just tweaks your parameter. And checks if your cost function is decreasing or not. Okay, okay. So we are done with the lecture progression, and I really hope that you enjoyed. So let's recap, recap, and then we will a little bit go further into vectorization of this code. Okay. So what what we have seen? We have seen hypothesis, and hypothesis is given by the uh, this the sigma of z, and is a simple one over one plus e to the power minus z, and z here is theta transpose to x. Okay. And then what you do, you have a cost function for getting the um, accuracy of your model, uh, this j of theta, which is equal to the minus one times y i, and the log of this is this is the and uh, and for m training example you have that, and the gradient descent you just update the this, where you just update the theta, and theta z minus the learning rate alpha, and you just take out a partial derivative of your cost function j of theta. Okay, and the alpha here is simple. The determines is the rate of learning that that we have seen in linear regression. Okay, okay. So we have seen so far, and now it's time for getting into more detail about vectorization. Uh, what's the vectorization means? So vectorization means is uh, uh, you just do, you here you are taking some amount of time, but if you want to do at once, if you want to do all the calculation at once, so here is a vect vectorized code for. Uh, a cost function, okay? So I'm right writing for cost function, which is a vectorized code. So here it is. Minus 1 over m times y transpose times the, the taking of the dot product between y transpose dot h plus 1 minus y t and transpose dot log of 1 minus h, okay? And h here is your model predicted and y here is your ground truth. Okay, and this, we had just vectorized the code a little bit to get your job job done. Okay, and a good way. Okay, so the gradient descent also a little bit vectorized. So here is the gradient descent theta. This theta minus the learning, uh, this is a partial derivative of learning rate alpha m times x transpose dot h minus y. Okay, so th this is then th this is what you get after deriving your partial derivative. 
Okay, so this is the basic uh, thing that you should uh, keep in mind about uh, when performing logic regression. And I really hope that you have enjoyed till now. And uh, now, if you if you can see, but well, let's summarize it a little bit so, so that you can get a more better feel what what we have seen so far. Okay, so logic regression is a classification algorithm that will classify our example um, that will give the probability after you just apply the sigmoid to the z then you get the probability means it between 0 and 1 you just get between 0 and 1 and then what you do you simply uh, take a threshold means if it is 0 if it is the if your output is greater than 0 0.5 then you make it as a 1 otherwise you make it as a 0 okay as a convention we take 1 as a positive indication means that the the image as a as a cat is a positive indication and 0 at the images are not cat uh, then it's a negative indication okay you can take anything but for convention you do this kind of thing Okay, pretty much easy what I'm trying to say over here. Okay, so uh, we have the hypothesis and we have a cost function for uh, checking the accuracy of our model and we have a gradient descent for getting your best optimal theta. And again, we are only learning theta over here using the gradient descent algorithm. Okay, so now uh, I think we are done with the logic regression and uh, in the next section we will go over to uh, project which is the cancer detection system and then we'll go a little bit further into understanding the support vector machine okay and um, i really hope that you will enjoy that section also so let's meet at the next section okay so here i am on my jupyter notebook and you can download a jupyter notebook by searching online how to download a jupyter notebook and you can follow the tutorials to download a, a jupyter notebook okay so uh, what we will do we will first start with uh, importing the libraries then we will load the data we will understand what data we are working on and then we will follow the feature engineering then we will see how to select features we will do exploratory data analysis like data visualization and data analysis and we'll perform feature engineering and then we'll and then we'll see how to select the features on from the correlation of the features and you know you don't need to have any kind of experience with pandas or although uh, you can have a look if you want to in detail but uh, you don't have to be expert in all of these if we are just uh, this is a, just a beginner project you can also modify it and put it on your resume and make make some changes and what you can do you can save this model and simply deploy it over a website okay okay so i will talk about deployment later on but before that uh, let's let's walk through let let me make you walk through this uh, project so first of all we are importing the libraries first we are importing the numpy as np and we are importing np as allies uh, pandas as pd pd is also allies to short form a name uh, plotly is another uh, great visualization library uh, but uh, i really use it i don't want to use it for now but in future you can use it plotly but just just want to show you i uh, seaborn which i'm going to use it here and matplotlib lab is, is also a visualization library that I'm going to use over here and this matplotlib in line tells you to use uh, matplotlib in the back end okay uh, it's kind of a tells matplotlib to choose the to plot the images in the back end use use the Jupyter notebook as a back end okay so uh, first of all uh, this is the learning uh, thing so we will load the data from the scikit-learn library scikit-learn library is a famous library for machine learning so we'll load the data sets from load boston which is a boston house price prediction we'll make boston house price prediction so you so we want a data set of that okay then we instantiate our lo uh, load boston and then we take out x which is the data I will tell you what is X and Y over here and Y which is a load Boston dot target in our previous tutorials in the introduction to machine learning we have a talk about X and Y variables X variables is the independent features means we which which we use to predict the model and this is the Y which is the target variable because it's unsupervised so we know what our uh, output is we know what our output label Y is okay so um, we will be given this and X and uh, Y is the target variable which will be in case in this case is the sales price and this is the features okay and then i call pd dot data frame and it can, can uh, constructs a data frame and we give x which is the features and we give the name of the columns dot feature names there is a dot attribute dot feature names to get the names of the columns automatically okay and then we make one column here we are making one column which is a sale price we are making a sale price and then we are making it y over here okay Ma y y means load boston dot target either you can make this also like this 
either you can make this also it's just the same okay y is just a target variable and if you just run this now you can see this is the data frame um, here you have a crime rate per capita that let's see uh, the column distribution so uh, just for see uh, let, let me show you what we have done these are the x variable till s l s stat these are the x variable and this this is the y variable that you use to predict and you may think yeah i use 24.0 means 24.0 is the uh, dollars is just the price of the house no the price of the house is given 24.0 thousand dollars okay so you can so just 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 we will see the whole thing just in a second okay so this is the data frame that we constructed okay so now let's take a look at the what data we are working on so there are 506 rows and there are 30 numeric and categorical columns and with the median value attribute 14 which is our target variable here i'm giving given is a sale price name but you can give us a median value it's usually the target variable okay so here is the column name is the crime is the per capita rate then proportion of a uh, residential land, proportion of a non-retail business, Knox, age, uh, what's the proportion, uh, average number of rooms per dwelling, etc. You can read over here. And the last, which is the favorite, uh, the target variable, which is the median value of the, which is the sales price in this case, in at thousand dollars. So twenty-four thousand dollars. Now you, now your dream has gone out. I think so. Okay, so you can read it over here. Just, just you can use dot d c e d e s e r because it is available in the cycle learn. So you have this kind of thing to see the information about the data set. But in real world, we will work on real world data set. So you will see how you we download, how we process, etc. Okay, so let's understand a little bit more about the data. We look at the shape of the data, which is 506 rows and 14 columns. Means rows and then columns. Then you dot info tells us the information of your of your data, which is non-null values. Means what are the data types and is there any null values into that null means missing values into that column okay and the, all the data sites are float what is the memory usage and etc okay and let's uh, dot describe will tell you the mean of that particular column the standard deviation the minimum 20 25 percent of that 70 percent max count etc okay so we had seen how what data we are working on these are the features which is the x variable and this is the target variable which is y which is a supervised learning problem as we can see over here okay okay so let's just take a look at the null you can use data dot is null dot sum and you can see over here that we have the zero 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 all the way and then we can plot a pair plot sns dot pair plot which will plot all the things which with respect to every feature so you can see over here that we are just plotting the pair plot uh, you can see but if you we, we do not get a lot of information from this pair plot because it's very kind of small and we cannot see what data is it is it pointing on etc okay so we have to definitely take care of that to 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 check more uh, visual visualization that i made okay just wait for a few seconds then it will uh, show up okay so it plots and then we are unable to see this kind of thing and we are unable to see so it's very hard to see this so what what we do let's let's take out and let's let's take out the inferences from the sales price which is, which is the target variable let's do some analysis so we plot a distribution plot and you can see over here this is a little bit skewed we want it is we are we are seeing over here this positive skew but here we can uh, add some transformation so what's the uh, skewness and what's some kurtotis so here we have 1.108098 and 1.495197 which are which we, this this will help us to find outliers and outliers are those who are far away let's say that you are working on uh, 
age okay so uh, age is 20 uh, 20 years old 50 years old but let's say 150 years this is the outliers okay this, these are the outliers okay those who are exception those who are exceptions of the data frame okay so we have to take care of this but before that let's see some relationship with each and every column only i've taken two columns so you can try different different columns so where there is a little bit crime there is the sale price is very high when there is a lot more crime there is sale price is very very low okay and what's the age you can also see and you can see over here um, 100 years old has been sold uh, in a smaller rate and uh, 20 years old has a little, little bit higher way and you can see see the data visualization over here okay and you can see over here that I've imported scipy which is again that like numpy I'm just taking out the norm and the skewness so you just plot a distribution plot for seeing this kind of thing means uh, for a normal distribution if, if you know about normal distribution you are just plotting the normal distribution and we and this is your uh, actual this black line and you have this blue line so you have to transform it a little bit so your uh, mu which is uh, 220 uh, mean is 22.53 and sigma is 9.19 okay so these are some if you know about python you should know about these kind of time for formatting etc okay and this is the qq plot which will help us to see the current quantiles which is uh, order values you can search more on the internet or uh, go on wikipedia to learn more about this but to our main main focus will be this uh, sales price means distribution plot okay so let's run this let's try let's add uh, let's add uh, a log let's let's uh, transform our sale price to a little bit more uh, accurate so now you can see over here that is this uh, skewness is over now we have just applied a transformation over here log 1p and it's now good okay to avoid outliers okay and uh, this quantile is also uh, removed okay so data correlation what a correlation first of all correlation is the is a relation between features okay so if the if it is one then it is um, positive correlated then it's minus one very negatively uh, correlated you can search more on internet about it because it's not a statistics class so you see if the diagonal is one all the features are perfectly correlated okay so how do we select the features which are highly correlated okay the features how we select if the, we have taken the absolute value of the sale price and we are taking the highly correlated feature from this uh, uh statement and there is 12 feature that we get that is highly highly correlated you can choose this but i'm not going to choose you can either um, delete the rest of the columns except these 12 okay and let's just start with model building so you just employ import train test split and train test split simply term uh, divide your data into training and testing means uh, as, let's say you have you have 80 percent of the data so sorry 100 percent so it will uh, take 80 percent for training and 20 percent for testing and you just draw because you don't want x to be sales price and y to be the sales price okay and then you test size then the van, van, random state will tell you the uh, means every time you run uh, the data should not be changed okay so if you run this now let's take a look at a shape 404 and 13 columns for a training and 402 for testing and 401 for labels and 102 labels okay so let's let's start with uh let me make one more, little little bit more uh, so that it should be clearly visible okay so you just uh, import as uh, from a scikit learn which is a linear regression and you just instantiate it and then you fit the model x train and y train which we have used for training and y train and x train are the these are the input and this is the y target variable and then if you run this now it's instantiated now we can now we can make prediction okay so you can see over the actual label because we know we we know what y test zero because this is actual label and this is the prediction which is 3.36 is a predicted value from the model and 3.21887582926 is etc is the is the actual value which is little bit uh, different from this but it's um, good performed very very good in terms of linear regression as we have seen so far okay now if you want to check the accuracy for checking the accuracy we have seen a cost function you can run this and mse mean square error and let's say if you want to see mse there is 0 0.035 which is good and if you want to take the rmse the square root you just np dot square root and you we are getting the rmse so you can just print it out rmse okay and you have seen that it's pretty much good okay you will uh, learn more about how we can improve this by using xgboost bagging boosting etc later on 
okay now we have done our full prediction project the code will be in uh, uh, my github which is in the description down box below there is a lot more projects which, which which is available in computer vision natural language processing which you can take a look if you want to my projects okay so now i think i have not coded just now because it will take a lot of time so i just written up and just annotated each and every line of statement okay so if you have any kind of problem then search on internet because you have to master google to uh, if you if you have encountered any kind of problem and in the next tutorial we'll be talking about a regularized linear models which we'll talk about lasso and which which we'll also use in this uh, uh, to check uh, as a lasso and regression uh, and a ridge regression okay so let's let's get into the um, next uh, section okay so now we have talked to talk talked about a linear regression and we have made one project now it's time for getting into the regularized linear models linear models okay so uh, if, if you remember that we have uh, pointed out some problem which is uh, overfitting which is overfitting which we have pointed out earlier okay so how does overfitting happen let's say if your model has learned too much so let me draw one uh, x and y plane and let me draw some data points okay so this, these, these are the data points. And let's see or you have a complex model, which is a complex function, which maps your input variable to output variable. So you just uh, make the complex function like this, which is, uh, which is touching uh, each and every line. So let's say a new uh, example comes in and it's making a bad prediction. So you can see over here, it learned too much onto the training data, which are in a trained, and it's, it, is, it is very going bad. It is, it is uh, not generalizing well on to the new examples okay so that's that's called overfitting if your model working bad best 100% accuracy on the training and working worse on the validation accuracy then your model is likely to fit overfitting okay so how it is cost let's you have a lot of features and you um, let's say a thousand features and so it will learn obviously the complex functions and then it will perform very very bad okay so uh, for that we have some solution and the solution are uh, either uh, you redu reduce some features reduce some features uh, reduce some features this is you can do this another thing is what you can do you can uh, this is the same as like this regularization in simple terms regularization is just um, uh, eliminating the features that are not useful okay so it is just equals to this so we give another name which is called the regularization so let's see some of the regularization techniques so the first one is lasso regression so let's see a lasso regression so what is lasso regression lasso regression is a regularized linear models what we do we just add a simple term with a, a simple a regularization term at the end uh, at the end of the cost function let's say uh, this this term lambda 1 over 2 i equals to 1 all the way down to the n uh, theta squared i okay so you this is um, this is for a ridge regression this is for a ridge regression okay so this is for raised regression i will talk about lasso just just after this okay so just you add this at the end of the cost function so your now new cost function will become like this one over m plus i equals to one all the way down to the m uh, theta transpose xi and this, this is the model predicted minus yi squared plus your regularization term uh, this one i equals to one all the way down to the end theta squared i okay so you can do like this now uh, let's let's understand what it's doing it is just uh, let's say you have some piece features which is the let's say the size of the house let's say the price uh, let's say the number of fans number of bedrooms and a number of a, a, a grass okay number of grass so you can see well, this 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 seems to be a less important feature so it will it will simply make the theta means the parameter feature means the feature weight of this um, uh, column to be zero okay so it simply penalizes or closer and closer to zero in rate regression it makes the feature weights closer and closer to zero okay so what is doing it is a, whatever the less important features are is just penalizing the theta of that and the theta is the is used to make prediction and let's say theta times the number of a grass equals to prediction so let's say it's a very 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 small okay so it is just penalizes your theta okay so that's what ridge regression is doing just penalizing or eliminating the or by how how it eliminating just making theta to be equals to zero 
okay but if a but in rigid regression it is it is making closer and closer to zero but in case of last regression it is simply it is same in case of last regression in case of lasso regression i'm talking about lasso regression it's it's whatever the less important feature are it simply makes it simply eliminate it simply make the theta zero so whatever let's say theta times the number of a grass uh, so theta equals zero zero times the let's say seven which is equals to zero so these features is eliminated so that's a lasso is very strict okay so these two and you just just you use l2 norm um in in that case in rich regression you are using l1 norm but in lasso you are using l2 norm okay just adding the regularization term which is like this uh, at the end of the cost function i goes to one all the way down to the end the absolute value i and one yeah this this one okay okay so uh, but one one more thing that you, that you can see over here that we we do not penalize our theta zero which is the bias term which is only the bias term so we don't want to penalize this so we start with i equals to one so we start with i equals to one rather than starting with i equals zero so we do uh, separately all the things okay so what um, what what we do uh, we just um, take um, we just start with uh, the uh, i equals to one all the way down to the j which is the theta we, we, we separately do zero okay um, and it's and I, I think it's very clear let let me make you clear what i'm saying i'm saying that you do uh, let's say for theta zero j of theta zero you do separately this you do separately this without the regular regularization term without okay but uh, for other, other thetas one all the way down to the j you do you do add the regularization term at the end of the equation and then you separately update this also uh, this theta zero and you separately update this theta one and you just uh, take this as a uh, gradient of this theta for uh, theta one all the way down to j and this gradient this uh, the gradient of this uh, cost function theta zero for updating or theta zero or getting the best theta zero okay so you do not want to penalize because only the bias term you don't want to penalize this okay so i think that is very clear to you and uh, again for recap regularization is just penalizing or eliminating the less important features by making the parameter weights equals to zero okay now i hope that's pretty much clear now i hope that is very clear and in the next tutorial we'll be working on to uh, uh, last regression with uh, sorry uh largest regression which is the now we'll start with classification uh which is which will cover logistic regression as the same as a linear regression but it's a classification not regression okay so let's uh, uh, i will be happy to see you in the next section okay so now we'll talk about a regularization one of, one of the favorite topic that i like to talk on i will take around 10 to 15 minutes to complete something called as a regularization topic and i think this is one of the most important topic in machine learning or may, maybe you go to deep learning okay so we'll learn about uh, l1 norm l1 and l2 regularization which is often called a rich and lasso regularization and i hope that you will understand that and why what is a regularization so first of all this is the problem that should come into mind that what is and why regularization I think uh, these two questions must be your first question over here. So, but before that, I'm, I'm going to highlight one uh, something called as overfitting. And I think overfitting, um, you all know. But just as a, just to those who for, forgotten about it, let's uh, revisit that. So, uh, let's assume that you have an x and y plane, x and x here and y here. Okay, and here is here you have a data point okay so you have a data point like this okay and you fit it and your model learns a lot your model learns a lot means your model is performing very very best on the training set let's take an example that it performs it, it is it is the the error the cost function over to here means that the residual error or the cause function over here will be approximately or very very low to zero and the accuracy or on the training set will be very very high because it tries to touch each and every point over here okay and here your cost function means the difference between your predicted and the actual value um, summation of i equals to one all around to the m will be uh, approximately equals to zero and 
if it is if it is if you if, if it is touching each and every point so it's obvious that is it is very very best onto the training set on which it is trained so it, it has it has learned a lot but let's for the sake of example some example come over here some example come over here so what will happen the, your model will fail to generalize well under the testing set okay so that's why i'm telling that your model will fail to generalize well on testing set so you can assume that the, that this 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 you can you can say that this this model is on overfitting because you find out that your model is performing a very very best on a training set and then if you evaluate it then you will see that your model is performing very very bad okay so that's the sign of overfitting so we, we always wanted to reduce the overfitting so how we how can we reduce our overfitting we have something called as a regularization and how it happens it can happen if you have a lot of features lot of features lot of features or your polynomial degree is very high if, if you're using polynomial regression okay so the, 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 the major cause of problem is lots of features okay okay so now let's see uh, how we can uh, remove this or uh, how, how we can prevent or how we can make our our model less prone to overfitting so so we have something called as regularization regularization will help you to eliminate to eliminate the features to eliminate the features which are less important so again i'm saying it will help you it will help you it will help you to eliminate to eliminate the features to eliminate the features which are which are which are less which are less helpful or contains a less uh, less information okay so it will eliminate that so that's how we that's how that's what the regularization is doing it is saying that if the feature is less important remove that okay or make the make their respective man uh, make the respective hyperparameter to be equals to zero okay make the respective hyperparameter to be equals to zero means i make make the respective not a hyperparameter make the respective theta to be zero so we will see we will see how what what it will do just just for as as an example let's assume that it will help you to eliminate the features which are less helpful now let's see how 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 it will do okay so let's assume let's assume that you're working on uh, some problem which is house price prediction okay so so you're working on house price prediction and there you have some features so here you have x1 so maybe and the size of the house my favorite size of the house okay then x2 is maybe your uh, favorite the number of a fans in a house number of a fans in a house okay number of x3 maybe the num number of a bedrooms number of bedrooms maybe another feature maybe another feature number of uh maybe some fan no no fans is over maybe acs okay air conditioners so here we have four features okay and let's uh, now what we'll do so we so for each for each feature for each feature for each feature x1 x2 x3 x4 we'll be having some parameter weights we'll be having some parameter weights like theta theta 1 times x1 plus theta 2 times x2 plus theta 3 times x3 plus theta 4 times x4 and you can see over here that we have this this is the this this is called the hypothesis function so here these the only we the, the, these are the weights these these are the weights of these features and we only have to learn these weights by just tweaking it okay by just tweaking it tweaking means let's take an example i hope that you already seen a linear regression just as an overview that your theta was this equals to 0 2.1 2 theta 0 equals to 2.1 previously and you just take out the partial derivative of your cost function with respect to this theta and then you update the theta okay why and just see the linear regression part you all all will be very clear okay so here if 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 you are if you are if you are being confused please go to linear regression part um you will be not able to further continue so please please go back in linear regression if if you are not able to understand why what is theta and why it is 
okay so this theta is a weight for the feature and we can simply give let's take an example that our theta 1 is equals to 2 theta 2 equals to 4 theta 3 equals to 2 okay and theta 4 equals to 2 okay so we can simply multiply so these feet if these thetas to be learned okay so um, our user will give input let's say the size of the house so two times size of the house maybe 24 square feet plus uh, then num number of fans though so four times number of fans maybe four plus number of bedrooms two times because here we have theta three equals to two let's assume that the user given two plus uh, two times two times uh, maybe number of ACs is equals to one okay and this the, the this this is the y hat of your model so here you learn some weights you learn some weights and usually you do the same you have some parameter weights you have some parameter weights which you learn by by tweaking or by changing and taking a look if it is if you, if your model is performing best and we just take out a partial derivative of, of our cost function with respect to this theta and then see if our if our cost function decreasing if it is then we update the new theta then we update our old theta with the new theta okay so that's 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 what we are doing over here and i hope that you are understanding what i'm trying to say you over here so just for an uh, just for this intuitive examples i hope that you understood what i'm trying to convey over here can convey you over here okay so let's assume that you have this now uh, let's assume that this number of uh, like uh, your model is overfilling okay so what you do in regularization you apply something called as a rigid so let's see the ridge regression what it does ridge regression ridge regression okay so the the equation for age regression is just add is just add a regularization term at the end of the cost function okay at the end of the cost function so again here we have theta zero also here we have oops what happens here we have theta zero also here we have theta zero times x zero just a biased term because an x zero is always equals to one okay so in the rigid regression in rigid regression we add a uh, 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 regularization term so here here's what i'm here's what i mean so j of theta j of theta equals to 1 over m 1 over m plus 1 over m plus i equals to 1 all the way down to the m theta transpose theta transpose xi theta transpose xi minus yi squared plus i'm saying plus and here we have something called as learning rate and this is just alpha okay so don't assume that this is a learning rate. this is just alpha uh, or, or you can say that someone can write it as a lambda okay so it is just a greek letter uh, just we didn't note okay so don't don't compare with that uh, learning rate alpha do not compare here I, I i will tell you i will tell you what is this what what this alpha does one over one over two i equals to 1 all the way down to the m theta square i okay so here we have added a new uh, a new regularization term a regularization term over here a regularization term over here so what is this so this is simply what it does it simply it simply make it simply take the features which are which are less important and make that parameter weights closer and closer to zero okay so what do i mean with this so for an example let's let's assume let's assume that uh, that you that the number of a, your model this you using the this using this equation this is the l1 norm the, the it is the l1 norm okay so let's assume sorry l2 norm this is l2 norm okay in, in ridge regression we have l2 norm and here it's simply penalizing your theta who is very less important so let's assume that the num number of ac or model norm model find out that the number of ac is less important so what it will do so uh, theta 4 our indicating the number of ac the theta 4 is the weight of our number of ac then it will make theta 4 to be to be closer and closer to zero 0, 0.000001 okay so it penalizes your theta it penalizes your theta as it found as you as it found that your number of ac is less important so it penalizes your theta and whenever you are multiply with penalize penalize 
finance the number of ac then it will be also very uh, means low okay so that that just helps you to less prone to overfitting okay so it is not doing anything with your with your input value it is doing because if, if you multiply 0.00001 with whatever the number, number of feature it will be approximately 0.00001 okay so like like that okay so what is the simply it simply eliminates or penalizes your theta value by just making closer and closer to zero okay so this is the l2 norm okay and here we have something called as alpha and alpha contains alpha contains how harsh or how strict to be onto the solid feature so let's assume that we have set some alpha obviously we don't touch alpha in scilearn, learn but here let's assume that your alpha controls the strictness okay so if your alpha is large I think so if your alpha is large or lambda is large um, some people may write this as a lambda also okay so don't uh, don't be confused so if your hand uh, lambda is large then it will make it it is making close and closer to zero now it, it will make theta 4 equals to zero fully zero okay so it simply eliminates it if you add it's it is very strict if you keep this if it is very strict okay so it it controls it controls the strictness I have what, what, what I what I think okay what I think to what I like to remember is controls the strictness okay so uh, and here you can see that you are taking the l1 norm and you are not taking of theta zero you are explicitly doing for theta zero because theta zero is your bias term and you do not want to penalize your theta zero theta zero okay so we are not penalizing we are going from theta i equals to one all the way around to the m we are not going to i equals to zero we are going to each and every theta okay so we are not so we are not uh, going to uh, theta zero so we explicitly do for theta zero and we explicitly tween, tuke, um, tweak our theta or do we take out the derivative of our theta explicitly okay because we don't want to penalize our uh, bias of sorry oops, it's a th our bias term okay so this is a rigid regression okay so we have something called as a lasso regression lasso regression lasso regression means lasso regression is very very is, is it uses l1 norm instead of l2 norm it's just the same it's just the same it's also penalizes the theta value but what it will do i will tell you okay so theta zero theta zero equals to whatever your cost function will be i'm just putting one two three plus now i'm right regularized now i'm writing the regularization term i equals to one all the way around to the m you're not penalizing again theta zero the norm of the norm of theta i okay so this this is what you and here you are taking the l1 norm okay so taking the norm uh, or you're taking the norm of your theta okay so here what if here you are applying the l1 norm so what it does if he if if the last regression is very strict just assume it is very strict whatever feature he finds whatever I'm, I'm i'm taking the gender as a he okay or whatever this this last regression finds whatever feature that less important he finds he will directly make that theta 4 to 0 so here we assume here we taken theta 4 equals to closer and closer to now then in lasso it will take a directly to 0 okay so it is very harsh so the both have specific use cases okay so these are the, the this is called the l2 l1 norm and this is called the l2 norm okay so here we have studied about a regularization in detail and i hope that you understood very very clearly and uh, we have talked a lot and there is one more which is elastic net which you don't need to worry about now it's very kind of a uh, just combination of both of them but it's not used in the industry as we use this l1 and l2 norm okay so thank you for seeing this video about regularization and and you can head over to the next section to learn more about more about machinery and completing this course okay so thank you for seeing this uh, video head over to the next section okay so now we will talk about support vector machine in detail so that you could be more powerful in machine learning or you or you will be having a powerful algorithm in your toolkit of machine learning so support vector machine is a supervised learning al learning algorithm which is a both for classification and regression we have seen logistic regression and logistic regression is for classification and linear regression is for regression so support vector machine is for both which is classification which is classification and one more which is uh, regression task 
okay so regression task so support vector machine can be used in classification either your output and degree value or it can be used in continuous value okay okay so uh, let's I will dig dive into the support vector like machine but before that uh, let's uh, let me tell you what we are going to study in this section so we'll, we start with the introduction of support vector like machine then we'll go further into what SVM do and then we'll talk about linear hard margin then we will typically go further into non-linear classification and then we'll talk about empirical risk minimization and then a semi-supervised transductive um, SVM and then we will talk about SVR which is um, support vector regression okay and in the next section we will do one project which is stock price prediction project okay okay so uh, what is SVM what actually SVM does it's 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 it simply is just what is like this so let me draw one X and Y plane so here is my X and Y plane I hope that's that's beautiful so here is my x and y plane and let let me uh, make a linear data okay so here we have the one data data point and another data data point is over here okay so we have like this and uh, then we have this data okay so let's assume that that you are working on cat and a non cat big uh, recognition system okay so you are working on cat and non cat recognition system so what actually svm does is um, here you can see over let's assume that white color is for cat images means the labels are cat and blue color let's take as a non cat okay so these are data and what svm does it makes it's it's construct a hyper plane it's construct a hyper plane like this it's construct a hyperplane like this okay and now whatever new point come on or beyond any here then then this example will be cat otherwise if something come here then it will be non cat okay so this is what SVM does um, but it's I will, I, this is not the full procedure I will, I will tell you but here what it does it simply construct a hyperplane and two parallel hyperplane and uh, one, uh, two parallel hyperplane, two parallel hyperplane with this margin. Okay, these are called the margin. So it always tries to maximize that margin. So it may sound a little bit uh, kind of confusing. So let's draw it again. To uh, let 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 me show you one more time what actually it does. Okay. So here is a white examples, and here is your blue examples. Is it non cat and non cat? So, what it does is construct a hyperplane and a two, uh, two parallel hyperplane over here, two parallel hyperplane like this. Okay, so and this is called the margin. This is called the margin. And SVM always tries to maximize this margin, keeping away the nearest data point far away from the hyperplane. What I've said is very uh, crucial to listen what I'm saying. I'm saying that what SVM does, it simply constructs a hyperplane and a two parallel hyperplane that separates the data point and at a maximum margin. Okay, so it always wants to SVM always wants to maximize that margin in such a way, in such a way, in such a way, so that the nearest data point, so that the nearest data point, let's say xi, is far away from the hyperplane. This hyperplane okay it's far away from the hyperplane so that uh, so that it would be easily so that whatever comes here then it will classify as an uh, as a non as a non cat whatever comes here or here it will be classified as a cat okay and then and and the what i'm saying that the nearest data point and the nearest data point is far it should should be the far away from the hyperplane here okay so it would be here so these are called the support vectors who are the uh, nearest data point from the uh, hyperplane okay and that is supported by uh, these are the uh, support vectors which supports this parallel hyperplane to separate this okay again it may sound a little bit unconfusing so let's revisit this again in a more detailed way so let's say uh, 
uh, let, let's take an, an, another example that we are building a person has a cancer or a non-cancer, I think what is it, uh, let's say a non-cancer, okay? So you build uh, X and Y plane, so let's build one X and Y plane, and then you put uh, this blue examples, which is which indicates as a cancer, and this white example, which indicates as a non-cancer, okay? So what SVM does, simply construct a hyperplane like this, oops, it simply constructs a hyperplane and a two hyperplane like this and a two hyperplane and this is this is called the margin and it always tries to maximize this margin so that in such a way in such a way that the nearest data point is far away from the from the main hyperplane okay so you can see over here that this this is the nearest data point is far away so these are called the support vectors these are called the support vectors okay Pretty much easy. Now I think that mm, is much clear. Uh, we, have, we have taken three examples. Now I think this is much clear. Okay. So it's, it may sound to you like it's, it's like a linear regression. You have a linear data and you're just filling a straight line with two hyperplane. What does it mean? Yeah, it obviously means like linear regression. But if you come to the more in detail, the data are not, lean, not linear. Okay. The data are never linear. So uh, there are two kinds of SVM there. The first kind of is hard margin classification and soft margin classification. Okay, so let's revisit uh, hard margin first, and then we'll re revisit uh, soft margin. Okay, okay. So uh, you here you can see over here that uh, this is just like linear regression. But wait for a few seconds, few few minutes, then you will understand why it is not like linear regression. Although it seems like that you have simply construct a straight line, but equation and it's used for classification. It's quite quite different. Okay. Okay. So in it's called the linear SVM. The what we have seen is called the linear SVM. We are here constructing a simple hyperplane and separating two um, data points. Okay, so what are hard margin? Hard margin means that we are not allowing any data point to come into that margin. Okay, that's called the violating the hard margin so sorry violating the margin so we are not allowing any data point to violate that margin so in that way we end up being an overfitting or in that way we, we very much um, um, go we our our model is being started overfitted so let's see what, what I'm trying to say over here over, over here so let's construct a hyper let's let's construct one x and y plane again so let me construct one x and y plane oops here is my x and y plane, and let's uh, let's just draw two data point. Again, let me draw two data point like this. Okay, and let's draw a white data point like this. Okay, okay. So and uh, now what as we have done, simply construct a straight line with two hyperplanes. Okay, with this hyperplane. Okay, so in hard margin. We are not allowing any data point that you can see it comes under in. So we simply uh, kind of do like this. We simply kind of do means we simply um, minimize this margin like this. So we are doing like this. All it it is very strict. Hard margin is very strict. Hard margin is very strict. The reason I'm saying is very strict because it just does not allow any data point to come into that margin but in soft margin we allow some data points to violate that margin to avoid overfitting okay so that's what the soft margin and hard margin means hard margin which means we are not allowing any data point to come into that margin and soft margin means we are allowing a little bit of data point to come in that between and the width is uh, and the width of the margin this is the width of the margin is 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 is, uh, is adjusted by c okay so if c is very very large then uh, your width will be very very small like this okay it's like, let's say c equals to zero this is the margin my margin so this is my margin so let's say your c 100 c equals to 100 so your uh, margin will be very very uh, the, the width of the margin is is kind of a, a low means it's very slow Kind of it's very small, but if if 
if c equals to 1 then your the width of the margin will be very very large okay like like this so it's just it's kind of any it's kind of a very awkward thing that you can see over here but that's what the convention site okay so we have seen uh, this, this this kind of thing and maybe you will see sometimes c to be named as a lambda okay it's just it's just the same lambda and c are the same just as convention we give it a c as a name okay so let's just to get uh, now is you now you got the overview of this hard margin and svm so we have seen a lot more things now it's time for getting into the little, little bit of yeah. mathematics which is how do we construct that whole hyperplane in linear regression we are just uh, making the straight line and this is theta transpose x but this was our favorite equations like this theta zero times x zero and in uh, logistic regression we are just doing the sigmoid of z so these are our hypothesis so this from this equation we are we were making our um, straight line or maybe the sigmoid so uh, what happens in case of a supported machine we have our hyperplane is de is def our hyperplane should def is defined by w transpose x minus b equals to zero. This is the condition that our hyperplane should satisfy. Okay, okay. So what is this? Uh, this w is our parameter weight. Is our parameter weight in this guy in linear regression we have seen is theta, and b is our uh, bias term, which is in case of linear and logistic, which is theta zero. Okay, so we have just just given a new new name, which is W and B. Okay, and it's okay. So we have made a W transpose X minus B, and this is our hyperplane that we have made uh, as uh, W and B are the parameter ways. Okay, so we have just just given a new name and transpose your all known linear algebra, and this is W is a parameter vector. Okay, so. Let's define some constraints in for hard margin. So let's define some constraints for hard margin. How hard margin make predictions? Okay. So whatever whatever the output of your model minus W transpose x minus b is greater than or equals to one, then anything on or above this margin will be regarded as one. In this case, it will be capped. Okay. Why I'm saying like this is let's say you have this straight line and you have this and you have the data point and a one uh, these two parallel lines and again here you have. So whatever on this margin or above this margin is regarded as one means the positive attention. So it is regarded as a cap as you as you know. Okay. And whatever below this is regarded as a zero. Okay. As a non cap okay so let's 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 write the equation for that and it's quite easy it's quite um, um remember rememberable like w transpose x minus b whatever on or beyond this margin this margin will be regarded as one whatever below this margin will be regarded as a zero okay as a negative attention so that is the hard margin constraints and that's that that's how we make predictions onto uh, support vector machine okay Pretty, pretty much clear what I'm trying to say over here. Okay, so now let's dig dive into some a um, little bit more further into math is how it truly really is it it is being constructed like this. So let's say you had made a straight line, and this um, this margin you can see over here this these margin is is written by this hyperplane. This the main hyperplane is written by W transpose x minus b, and this margin is equals. This margin is equals to the two over the norm of W. So to maximize this margin, we wanted to minimize this margin. Dub, minimize to W. Okay. If we want to maximize this margin, because as we always have to maximize this margin. To maximize this margin, we have to minimize this norm of W and this margin is written by 2 over the norm of w okay and so so as we have said that as we have always search to maximize so uh, that's that is written by the uh, 2 over uh, norm of w and to maximize that we want to minimize the norm of w so we can write an objective function we can write a uh, objective problem object like uh, like like this the distance between two hyperplane the distance distance between Two hyperplane, two hyperplane is written by two over the norm of W. So to maximize that margin, we want to minimize the norm of W with sub subject to subject to uh, 
y i double transpose x i minus b greater than or equals to one. So what I have said. So let's under understand this equation a little, little bit more further. What I have written over here. So you, for maxim, you, this is the minimizing means we want to minimize to maximize that margin with respect to y i, which is your ground truth means actual label, and this is your moral predicted value. Moral predicted value and you can see over here if, if it is on or beyond this it will be 1 otherwise it, it will be 0 so if yi is equals to your moral predicted value then your cost function will be 0 then your loss function will be 0 otherwise if it is not equals to y then then your loss function will be very very high so you want to minimize this normal w to get the good predictions okay so we have started this and I really hope that you had understood the concept that I explained to you and we can write our cost function in a hinge loss for I'm talking about some soft margin so we can write our uh, soft margin like this so we can write uh, the, the, the loss function the cost function the loss function we can write our loss function like this uh, 1 over n plus I'm going to each and every training examples max of max of 0 comma 1 minus y double transpose xi minus b plus regularization plus lambda over uh, times the norm of w squared okay so this is quite confusing a little bit but let, let me try to explain you in more detail way so you are can see we are we are going to each and every training example the technical of max and this is the hinge loss. If you can see, that this is this is called a hinge loss. If you want to get into more detail about a hinge loss, you can have some Wikipedia pages for knowing about hinge loss. Okay, and this is your moral moral predicted value y uh, y i, and uh, ground. This is your ground truth y i, and this is your moral predicted value, and this is the lambda times. You can write c also. You can write c also because it 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 help you to adjust the width of that margin so that's why it is a very very important hyperparameter okay and times the norm of w squared okay okay so we are done with a kind of a mar uh, linear uh, classifier we are linear svm is linear classification so we have made our good uh, loss function so we have made a prediction function and now it's okay we want to minimize the this norm of w to get the good predictions Okay, okay. So we have seen, we have seen only the linear SVM. So let's let me form form formulate one example, which is like this. Uh, let me make one uh, again x and y plane. And well, I'm I'm making too much x and y plane. It's best to have a uh, this kind of things. Okay. So let me make one non-linear classification like this. Okay. So you have this kind of data and this kind of data. And let me make the, the these white example are cat images and these white examples are non cat images. So now, if you can, if you want to make the straight line, you will be not able to do that. Means you are not able to um, kind of uh, classify it. So it's very bad. So what you have to do, you have to make a non linear. You have to do the non linear classification like this. Now it will be okay. Now it will be okay. So SVM also is also is very kind of powerful in all layer classification with something called as kernel trick. It's something called as kernel trick. So we will elaborate kernel trick in detail. So let's start with kernel trick. So what what we do in kernel trick? So let me write an algorithm. So what you do? You write an algorithm in terms of x. You write the inner product. Let's say let, let me write you write an algorithm you write an algorithm in terms of the inner product of x and z and the these x and z are two data points are two data points so what you do uh, let let me tell you what 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 we do in normal in a classification we take our data we take our data x and we transform our data to a some more dim let's say we have a um, one dimension data to a two dimensional data in non linear classification okay so we transform our data to be from one dimensional to two dimensional like like this so it's 
Okay, so we write an algorithm in the form of X and Z, and X and Z are the data points. So in simply in kernel trick, we transform our data to from one dimensional to higher dimensional space. So you will get to know what what we are doing. So let's uh, let let me write the steps. So after uh, we have written our algorithm in terms of the inner product of X and Z, now what what we do? We map our input input in this X. We write, write we map our input x to the phi of x okay to the phi of x so we are just i will tell you what this function is the curse okay so we write our function we that we map out uh, x to the phi of x i will tell you what what we do in this case so we we find a way to map our this we find we find a function uh, so we map our x to the phi of x so we write a function or we find a way we find a way so we find the x to the some uh, phi of x and it will transform your one dimensional data to the uh, maybe and in any kind of your data to be the high dimensional okay so you write a per you write a function at k which transform a data the phi of x transpose the times the uh, phi of z Okay, so let's see what it does with the help of an example, and then what we do, we re replace our x and z with our transform data, which is a phi of x and z to be the be the phi of z. Okay, so this is what we do. So uh, let's see uh, some how what is does and and what way is does. So we write uh, the kernel functions are one of the famous kernel is RB of kernel that will transform your data x and z to the high dimensional space so this the kernel function is written by uh, the rb of kernel function written by k of x comma z exponent of minus norm of x minus z squared over 2 over the sigma squared okay and the x and z are the data points okay great and some more kernels are which is polynomial homogeneous polynomial inhomogeneous which you can search on internet but the most famous one is rb of kernel which is widely used in the industry okay okay so we have seen uh, various kind of uh, things and about kernel trick how we do the nonlinear the transform data you are able to do the nonlinear classification so here are some we will discuss one two kind of one Grammar problem which will help us to state our op optimization objective and then we will see the sub gradient okay so uh, why am I why I'm talking about primal problem it will help you to form formalize your objective function so it will help you to formalize your objective function so it's just the same just as as written we write that so for each I for each I be the member of one to all the way around to the end we introduce a new variable zeta we introduce a new variable zeta where zeta i where is equals to the max of 0 comma 1 minus y i so we introduce a new variable zeta i 0 comma 1 minus y i okay and then in that we write w transpose x minus b Okay, so this is just a hinge loss where we introduce a new variable that hinge loss is a story. Okay, try to see what I'm trying to see you here. Okay, so then we write our function like this. You want to minimize, you want to minimize 1 over n, i equals to 1, all the way down to the n, zeta i plus the, uh, the regular, regularization term c, the norm of w squared okay with respect to or subject to subject to y i w transpose x minus b greater than or equal to one minus the zeta i time um, is just a where zeta i is greater than or equal to b for all i okay so we have just formulated one problem it is just equal to the hinge loss that we have seen. We want to minimize the objective function that we have seen so far. It's just equal to that. So we have formulated in such a way that you can use this. Okay. So we have an ob objective function which is our cost function. Now we can now some something called as sub gradient. Something called as 
sub gradient descent and which what what we do we we make a convex function f of w and b we take out the sub gradient of our of, of our function we sub take out the sub gradient of our cos function and then we update our parameter w and b okay and that's the sub as a gradient descent what what we are doing okay so it's a little, little bit different than gradient descent here we are taking the sub gradient of our cos function okay so this is what we are doing this is called the primal problem and then we uh, with this uh, we, we take out the sub gradient of that primal problem okay pretty much easy what I'm trying to say you here okay so one more thing that the that is very popular among beginners are learning theory something known as empirical risk minimization what do you mean by empirical risk minimization given your given the input x1 x2 all the way down to the xn you want to and you and given y1 all the way down to the yn you, you want your output you want your output you want your output yn plus one given xn plus one so it's just the same you give a function x and you want your output y okay and your uh, and the loss and the getting the getting the error should be minimized means the risk should be minimized so that's the, the empirical risk minimization which we have already seen so we just have to know the definition for it what is s okay okay so uh, as, as we have talked about non-linear and linear now it's time for getting into this uh, support vector regression uh, I'm just going to give you the equations. Okay, it, it will, it will all, it will, it is kind of a quite easy. You want to minimize your one over two, the norm of W squared. You want to minimize this to get your output with respect to or subject to the y i, the absolute value of y i minus the inner product of W and x i times p times b, and it should be greater than or equals to the sum epsilon. And epsilon be the smallest positive integer. Okay, so just to uh, be comfortable into that. So I hope that is quite clear. And this is this is for a regression task. Okay, and then we will see the implementation in our next section. So I hope that you really enjoy this tutorial, this section, and uh, we will be carrying out this uh, more more into detail. Now, if you have gone too much into math. But if you haven't understood any any one, please feel free to put your comment uh, put your comment uh, in the comment box. I'll be very very happy to take your comment and uh, and uh, provide you answers over there. I'll be, I will be uh, taking taking a look at your questions and we'll will be answering soon at that point. So just put the timestamp where you're commenting, okay, so that I could know where where you have a problem. Okay, so I think that uh, we have gone in too much detail. If you haven't understood grammar problems or gradient. Don't worry. It is not required for a beginner machine learning. So if you have, if you, if you learn too much in machine learning and gone into deep learning, now you can come back to this primal problem to understand what I've said. But it's quite easy to understand and the kernel trick, what I've said, etc. Okay. So thank you for seeing this video. Sorry. Thank you for seeing this section. I'll be catching up you in the next section. Uh, till then, you can do the program assignment. Okay, I will be catching up your next section. We'll be making one project, which is stock price predictor. Okay, thank you. So now we will make a stock price predictor, which is our end-to-end -end machine learning project. And here's a demo. And you can see over here that I have to just, you can just remove the, I will show you where I have taken all those things. Just so I do, I'm not a web developer, but I had made a good front end of this. And also I made a back end using Flask. Okay, so we will code. As I made a stock price predictor and I will show you how you can uh, build the same website like me and you can also uh, make a uh, beautify if you are a web developer okay so here is my um, here's my Jupyter notebook and here first of all I'm going to download the data from Yahoo Finance and you can simply uh, pip install by finance I've already installed that you can install that so you just want to import first of all the basic libraries let me do that so first of all you want to import the basic libraries like this um, first of all I will import numpy as NP then I will import pandas as PD and then I will import matplotlib and I'll import, import matplotlib dot pyplot as plt then uh, with that I'm going to import the C bar because I'm going to use C bar now in this case as a visualization library so numpy is a scientific library pandas is a working with the data 
the Seaborn is a uh, visualization library and Matplotlib is also a visualization library. Okay. Oh, and one more thing that I want to import is um, for my data, for my data, which is import Y finance as YF. Okay, as YF, and YF is just allies given to that. Okay. So let me run this out. And yeah, I can too add. Uh, this is optional, but I can too add over here like this Matplotlib in line. Matplotlib in line. Okay, now it should work fine. Okay, so we had done with importation of our uh, all the libraries, and now it's time for getting into a little bit more uh, detail about the data, how we can load our data. So first of all, I'm I, I just going to use um, I ju I just want to I'm in this uh, project I will make a stock price predictor of natural gas okay and you can do any of like gold silver just go head over to the yahoo finance just head over to the yahoo finance and just head over to that and just to search whatever the, let's say i want to go for gold so if you go over gold then you will see over here that you have a gc equals to f which is the code of that okay so you just take take copy the code and here's just uh, i will just show you how what you can do first of all i will take input i will take input which is enter the code of this stock enter the code of this stock to download enter the code of the stock to download okay now it will take an input now i will just uh, make a variable now i'll just make a variable yf dot download and it will take off uh, the code from the stocks okay and it will download from uh, it will download from let's say 2008 it will download from 2008 uh, in January to 1 till uh, it will down it, it download till 222021 till uh, 0 let's say let's say 2 let's say 1 and till 18 okay so this is the favorite thing and now what you can do we can simply do this kind of thing and let me run this and let's ask the code of this stock okay so you just give the code of the stock so let me give the natural gas equals to f this is the code so it will download a stock like this and then it will simply tell you the data how it looks okay now if you can see see over here that you have open high low close adjacent close and volume okay so one more and one more thing that you just that you can do you can write auto adjust auto adjust equals to true what is just is to adjust your uh, all of the kind of a data frame and then you can see over here like this okay so that's what it's doing till now okay so we are done with this now it's time for getting into a little bit more detail about uh, now we have loaded the data now let's take a look at a shape of the data and like that so data dot shape and it will tell us that we have a to total of 3256 uh, training examples and five columns including date one two three four uh, three two four five we have five columns and uh, information about the data you can take a look we have a non-null values we have this we have that was the data type you can also take a look at the uh, mean standard deviation maximum minimum of all those stuff so let me do that okay so you just uh, see this and now you can see that you have uh, all of the count uh, the minimum mean standard deviation minimum 25 percent and etc okay now if you wanted to take a look at the now we are done with data exploration now let's a little bit go further into how it uh, because stock price prediction is very very non-linear okay but uh, one thing that i want to mention over here they do not use it for personal purposes it's only for educational purposes okay only for uh, educational purposes the reason why it's very non-linear and you can't uh, and then you and you can't depend on your algorithm to to simply predict the output okay our other good is it, it may give you uh, the wrong output I don't know about this very very non-linear so be sure to do not use it just for educational purposes you're not working company you're just making a simple project so that you could get a concept of how you implement how the process hole looks like okay so don't implement by yourself um, kind of uh, use in, in yourself and do not uh, kind of uh, make a website like that do not it is only for educational purposes
Okay, now if you're done with this, now we can analyze our data. Now if you want to an an analyze our data, you can write this close dot plot. You can just plot it out. And now it will look like the, this, oops. You can fix size. Let's say I just want to make it 107. And we have this. And here our target variable is close okay our target variable is close and uh, uh, means we it will just tell you the direction of the stock let's say the, if the close is very high then your direction of a stock is very high means the, it will the close will be very high so here's very nonlinear so it just starts in 2008 in very low way and gets up up in 2009 then gone drastically down in 2010 and then uh, kind of that so you can see the non-linearity like this. So it's very, very non-linear and it's not, uh, you, can, you can depend on this algorithm or this uh, predictor to predict your output in a good way. Okay, so now, now I think that we are done with everything. Now let me see uh, what I have to do. Okay, now let's take a look at the, this, how we can plot the distribution plot. What's the distribution plot of our open? Then what's the distribution plot of our close? Okay, so it, it will give us a more feel how, how we are uh, proceeding with our data or we, it will help us to choose the algorithm. Okay, so here's the thing that I want to mention. So first of all, um, just to, I'm going to use the, as Seabor and uh, just I'm going to use Seabor and then here I'm going to name as uh, data. I just want to name as data and I'm going to put over here uh, this open let's say close okay so we will see if this is non if this is non-linear etc to take a little bit more feel okay so you can see over this is a little bit non non uh, it's just, it's a non normally distributed okay so you can apply a log transformation that's called feature engineering but that does not work well in this case so we should leave like this and then we will take a look at this plot and then if you wanted to take a look at the open then you will again see it's again nor, uh, normally disputed. Now we can do the same for other other things to get the feel of what we are doing. Let's say we are we have done for high. Let's say we are done for high. And if you take a look at the high, it's also like this, a squeak. Okay, so we are done. Uh, we are done with you can you can play with the data visualization and it hey, take out the inferences about the data and about the data inferences okay now we have understood the data what we have understood okay let's uh, write the conclusion what we have un understood till now so we have understood the first and first foremost is the shape of the data shape of the data and then we have understood the uh, how our data is distributed how our data is distributed our data is distributed then we have understood that then we have understood how our uh, it's it's very very non-linear it's very very non-linear okay so you can cannot use for your own purpose uh, maybe you can use deep learning architectures like lstm to get the direction of your stocks and let's say if you um, maybe with the 99 95 percent that works correct or maybe the 80 percent works correct or maybe 725 works correct uh, so you can have just some now do not use linear regression or and any kind of things to make your own use but definitely in future let's see what the research comes with uh, for stock price predictor because stock price prediction is also a competitive uh, project to work on because it's very very non-linear okay so we are done with this and now it's time for we have studied how much algorithm we have studied linear we have studied linear then we have studied logistic then we have studied some regularized linear models regularized linear models then we have started support vector machine then we have studied principal common analysis which will study uh, which we have not studied so we will study principal common analysis and then furthermore okay so we will use support vector machine we will use support vector machine uh, but uh, we will see that linear regression and regularized linear models works best in this case and we will go with or saving the model of regularized linear model okay so let's start with linear regression but before that let's split our data into x and y and then the training and testing set so here i am uh, this time to x uh, i like by convention so i'm just going to make it like this and 
our x variable will be all the except close so i'm just going to remove this and then in x is number one and then y equals to data then y equals to data dot drop um, no, no, it says we will not drop it. We will just keep, simply keep it close. Okay. Now, if you, uh, we, 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 we are done with this, now x and y data to drop, close, x and y. Now, we are done. Now, what, what we can do, we can simply uh, import more uh, kind of a moral selection, uh, which is train to split. We will import one thing, which is train to split. Which split. Let's say you want to split your data. Let's say you have 100% of the data. So you will uh, split your data 80% for training and 20% for testing to validate your model. Okay, so here I'm doing what I'm see. You can see over here. We have a X train, X test and Y train, Y test. Okay, so this is the you can make the variable and all the training and means the labels of X train will be in Y train and label of X test will be in Y test like this. Okay, now if you now you have just give X and Y and just give the size of the uh, test set, which is let's say give the 20% means you just want to use 20% of your whole data for testing. Then you want to do just random state and you may think here you should what's run random state does. It's simply uh, let's say uh, if you if you run it one more time, then your data will not be changed your shuffle because shuffles also so your data will be not changed okay so we will take a look at the shapes of that so that we can get a more feel what we are doing so you could understand what to whom we are working with uh, let me just copy and paste it over here and just going to make it like this and then i'm just going to um, make it y screen and this one by test okay and just meant to make it a little bit more detail okay when you run this you can you can see over here that you have a 2604 and four columns and the fifth column is two two thousand uh, this the labels of y okay so that's the thing and now what we can do we can go further and we have taken the close as our target variable which will tell us the direction of our stock stocks okay okay so now we are done with splitting now it's time for getting into a little bit more depth is uh, modeling part means we are going to first of all i'm going to import the linear regression because every everyone thinks linear regression is very bad but let let me tell you it's very powerful algorithm when it comes to linearity but here we don't have a linearity but still it works best when you apply a polynomial etc regression okay but let's uh, keep let's use a logistic uh, sorry linear regression and you can see over here that this is a regression problem and so supervised learning problem so we cannot use logistic it will be very very bad for us okay so just i'm going to instantiate just i'm going to instantiate instantiate and i'm just going to call lr dot fit and i'm just going to give x train and the labels y train which is the labels of x train okay the predict one means i'm going to use that lr which is train model to predict my uh, x test okay now if i run this now if you see the predicted output you can see over here that the uh, let's uh, see the first training example so you can see over here oops this y test now so you can see over 2.918 and the uh, predicted is 2.90 and the uh, uh, actual value is 2.918 okay see the things that that is over here so this quite, quite um, it's quite very very good because you can see over that's quite working very very good and yeah linear regression works out best but it may happen that may overfit your data uh, but let's see uh, let's uh, calculate some matrix so we are going to use some matrix which is MAE we are going to use MAE which is uh, uh, sorry MSC which is a mean square error which is a mean square error which we have talked about the cost function for a linear regression then we are going to use uh, then we are going to use uh, rmse and simply it's just, it's, it does simply the square root of a square root of mean square error and then what you do yeah, and then we will calculate the r2 square okay and you can see if you want to get into mathematically we'll, we'll talk about some matrices matrix later on but uh, the best output of r2 if your model giving output 
at two equals to one point two, then you have a very bad, uh, sorry, good model, and it's a good model if it's if it's giving good. Okay, so we'll see how much our at two etc. So I will write one helper function like this. We'll write one helper function calculate matrices. I'll just write a matrix and then it simply takes the actual value which is a grand truth and it simply takes the predicted value of your model to calculate and then first of all I'm going to calculate the MSE and it's just uh, first of all I have to import because you can also make your own function but it's better to use vectorize or scikit-learn because it's already provided to you but you know it's very kind of easy if you wanted to define MSE so you just write a define MSE and just uh, take the sum of every day data point and the residuals and then just uh, square them up and then like like that you can do that we have already I think you, are, you have implemented programming assignments okay so uh, you can just make it import uh, let's say oops I don't want to I just want to import the matrix and I'm going to import uh, MSC and mean square error obviously we, we do have mean absolute error which you can also use but for now I'm going to use this to, uh, but by the way we don't have RMSC we have to code RMSC by your, by ourself okay we only have r2 squared so first of all let's uh, do this kind of thing means mean square error giving the our parameters y test and y and y pred and then rms and you may think here yeah, you how how you can calculate the uh, root mean square error just write np dot square root is just taking the square root of msc okay that's easy so r2 score which is r2 scores i'm just not going to write is doing a spelling uh, wrong because maybe it, it will cause some error if you have a reserve uh, keyword or like that's function okay so you have r2 square and then uh, score now you just give y test now you just give y test sorry yeah y test and y pred okay and these are y test and y pred are just so let me write that what is this so y test is your ground truth is your ground truth is your ground truth and y pred y pred is your moral predicted value okay moral predicted predicted value oops i'm i think that i'm doing it wrong uh, you can see the spelling okay okay so we are uh, now what i'm what i will do i'll just print it out msc then i will print rmsc then i will print rmsc then i will print r2 okay r2 scores okay in this i'm just gonna to msc uh just going to make it msc like this and here also i'm going to make it rmsc okay and here also i'm going to make r2 square r2 score sorry score it's score okay now i think that it should work now we are done now if you wanted to now we are done with helper function now if you want to calculate the matrix so you are we will just calculate the for a linear regression so we will just give a y test which is our ground truth which i have made a, is by while spitting out data now we'll make a y prediction y prediction and sorry it's a prediction one uh, that that we have made in linear regression predicted okay so you can see the um, MSE is equal equals to zero means approximately equals to zero is quite good because in cost function your cost function should be very very e approximately equals to zero your root mean square is also and your r2 is 0 0.999 means is m means is approximately equals to 1.0 okay so it's quite good Lin linear regression performs quite good okay now let's a little bit let me go go further into uh, some regularized linear models like rich and lasso so uh, let's use that from sklearn learn sk learn dot model sorry linear models linear model i'm just going to import uh, lasso and you if you know if you name may know about this lasso and rich lasso what is just simply eliminates the less important features simply el eliminates the less important features and rich is just um, penalizes your less important features okay so now let's uh, make the two of them so let's say la as a lasso so i'm just going to fit it over like this is a short form giving the x train and y train is a short form for doing that and then i will do for the same for a ridge I'm just going to go for the ridge 
and it's just fits the same thing and oops I should give it R A I think R I L A P I'll just go L A P is the lasso projected value and then I'm L A X test okay and here also I'm just going to make R R I P equals to R I dot predict and I'm just going to give X test let's run this now we are done now if you want to take a look let's first take a look at the lasso what lasso performs L A uh, first of all we are going to give the ground truth which is Y test and then we will gonna to give the L A P now it's quite uh, not good it's zero point it's quite not good because simply it's very strict it simply eliminates so but it's your your with lasso your moral and your moral is less prone to overfitting but here you can see if I take a look at the rich it's quite uh, for now it's quite good because uh, it, it is also a regularization now it's quite similar to linear regression but this is less prone to overfitting okay it's less prone to overfitting so we are going to use a uh, rich regression to save our model and build a website under this okay so one one more thing that i want to mention over here that we can use support vector machine i um, mean support vector regression uh, for this task so let's see how we can make this kind of thing so let's let me um, svm so you can just and um, i think that support vector machine will not work well but it should work well if you have a lot of features like index volatility and then we have a different different features which contain different different um, importance okay so I'm just going to import and here you can obviously will not use it but here you will learn how to how to do the fine tuning of any other model using grid search CV okay so dot model selection and just going to import the grid search CV okay first of all I'm going to instantiate SVR and then just going to uh, I'm just going to make it params and then and then I'm going to make it params and then here I'm going to make it C to be uh, maybe and C is just a lambda which will tell us the width of your margin so I'm just going to copy it out as I'm just I'm going to write it from my there I've already written over there it's just I'm going to write it to minimize the length of the video okay so it's just like this and I'm taking C as uh, to use these values and check it, how is model performing diff with diff different different values and kernel will be obviously the RV of kernel because it's very kind of non-linear okay now if you now what we will do we will just uh, uh, we will just make this and then I will call my grid search CV and then will give my params I just gonna to give my params and SVR first of all SVR obviously SVR and then I'm going to give it param grid param grid and then I'm just going to ref it equals to true and just ref it will tell you means the warning so you can see the documentation verbose equals to three okay messages done now if you want to run it let's uh, fit now now we'll fit grid onto our training to check different different values Y train okay now let's run this it will take a little bit of our time but yeah I'm just gonna to uh, code it further it will take a little, little bit amount of time it is checking for each and every uh, this 0 0.1 0 0.2 etc and checking the score and whatever works best it just will give out okay just want to make it small okay now let's wait for a few seconds and I think this will uh, end up being in a few seconds uh, in the meanwhile, I'm just going to just copy it out these things because the parameter which we're going to get is like this The C equals to 10 and gamma equals to 0.1 and kernel equals to RBF And if you run this if you are you will be left with a very good matrices, but it may it is very bad I think so this says we are performing is very very bad because of that We have a don't have a lot of features over here and SVR is not able to uh, find learn the model actually but reg regularized linear models are more powerful in here okay pretty much is what I'm trying to say you here okay now I'm going to just to see this how much it runs still running it's just checking for each and every uh, this is will take 1.8 seconds more to I think it's 1.9 seconds it's just taking a little, little bit of one time but I, I'm just going to wait for a few seconds and you can see over here that it's trying for each and every value gamma then C then this then that okay so we will just wait and then I will uh, come back
I think we are uh, we will just code it further because um, we will just code it further import joblib and here we will import joblib to save our model to save our model because we are going to use a regularized linear models okay so model joblib dot dump joblib dot dump I was just dumps and just going to save its model dot pkl okay and then I will simply uh, if I if want to load my model equals to joblib dot load I'm just going to if you want to load your model you can just write it down and you can just make it model dot pkl okay that's what we are going to do over here and now I think that's done now if you want to like this and now if you want to make it like this now we are done with this kind of thing now if you run this uh, this support victim uh, regression and now if you run this now if the dumps is not there uh, particularly very good okay so we are done with this now let's see the in folder we, we have the pkl file and we can use this model to make predictions okay so we can use this model to make predictions so let's keep making predictions with this so let's me let me go to my let let me go to my uh, one of the mlo1 and then stock price predictor and here i'm going to open with code okay i do have made which i will just copy if i want to save my time i'll just copy and paste over there to save my time so that it would be more perfect if i just copy the prediction or html because it's just a uh, simple html blocks okay just going to uh, cut it down because i don't think that this should require further it's just active let me cut it down okay so now i think that we are onto this now what we, what i can do i can just make a app.py app.py and here first of all i'm going to i think that all i able to see yeah so from flask i'm just going to import import flask and then i'm going to import the render template render template and if you don't know what plan don't worry it's quite uh, easy to understand i will walk through each and every process but i don't know why it's not working but it's okay if it's not working it's uh, uh, it's my vs code bucks a lot i don't know why but yeah i will just keep trying it out let me again open with code let's again open with code and then let's see what i can do over here that we are just imported the flask till now and uh, render template now we just instantiate my model like this flask uh, name oops it's just i think name i think it's correct yeah so now i'm just to make a route app dot route and it's just uh, this simple home page to validate our server is working return render template uh, i just want to take a render template from the index.html index.html and you may think yeah you should haven't made index.html so let's make that uh, this i'm not made just i'm going to make it over here so flask looks for html files into the templates folder so just uh, make one templates folder over here okay just make it and then one more folder you have to make for your images which is static folder okay static and all your images will be here now you can also make from here just to templates like this now just make a new file which is index.html okay now after making index.html you can just type this down like this and now uh, if you go with stock price predictor and just i will just copy it down i will tell you where i have taken all those stops so let let me show you where i've taken from these all so but let's see before that how is it working or not I like writing a hello world okay just save this down and now if now it's time for uh, like this instantiating for setting up your server name equal equals to main and then i will just uh, app dot run debug equals to true anything gone wrong i think yeah uh, no it's true okay now if i save this if i run this down it will take a little bit of time and it will run and so it's starting over here and this is my url address 
if I see over here, now you can see over here that we have a, a beautiful uh, website. But now you can see why it is running. The reason why it's I have to stop that server to get running. So let me stop that server because another server is running um, into the ML01 projects folder over here, which I have to stop it. I will debug it, I will have to reinstall my Visual Studio code, but I will show you where I have taken this all. So the first thing first you have to keep in mind from where you have to take this is from a C uh, tail block. So I will just an annotate the code in my MLO1 projects folder. This I will annotate from where I have taken. Which is from, first of all I have imported the CDN. First of all I have imported the CDN of Bootstrap and Talvin CSS. And then I have gone to tailblocks.cc. I will go to tailblocks.cc and grabbed my header grab my header then this nav navigation menu then i have to grab my header and then i have this predictor and you can see uh, all the code is in my github okay now if i show you what the prediction.html does is simply uh, first of all what i've done i, I have written a form into that uh, you can uh, the code will be in the descri description um, in the github you can head over to that okay so i'm just using the request to get the form the open the high which is the input variables and then i'm pre-processing -pro pre it so how it's how i'm pre-processing it i'm putting into the 2d array to make prediction then i'm loading the model then i am predicting on the test data and then returning the prediction and then i'm just rendering the template from prediction.html and prediction equals to prediction which is gone through here so if i go to the prediction.html you can see that i have just extend i have made one layer i use flask uh, flask inheritance to inherit the template from uh, layout.html and you can see the layout.html is just a chunk of code so prediction is just a prediction and the prediction is derived from here okay and it's just prediction is this prediction is that is just given okay pretty, pretty much easy let's see if it's working still now or not it's still working so let me put some value so it's just and it will tell the closing price and it will tell when it tells the closing price it tells the direction of the stocks okay so the clo closing price is 4.86588054 okay so that's the pretty much easy that we need uh, to understand about uh, uh, making a flask or flask website and end-to-end -end machine learning project and i really really hope that you enjoyed this tutorial this section and this project in the next section we will be talking about principal common analysis then we'll do one of our project and then we have done st till now two projects which is an end-to-end -end machine learning project to get on a resume and you can also modify it let let me tell you how you can modify it you can see over that that we have an open high low close volume there is a research paper something called a stock price prediction using machine learning they have given what the features they have used like index volatility like uh, mean etc it's selling price of the sorry uh, three three days price three days previous price and then nine days pre selling previous price so you can do that kind of features and integrate over there to make it the more powerful model with a complex model okay but do not make it too complex you can see we had we had worked on lots of data to understand and how we understood that this is good for linear regression the reason that we have understood because our data is not multiple linear what do i mean by multiple linear because many of the interviewer asked that how you will perform form when your data is multiple linear with linear regression algorithm your answer will be no we cannot perform when uh, linear regression when your data is multiple linear it's only because uh, it's only because your because the variables linear regression does not work well when your variables are highly intercorrelated correlated okay when you're let's say all it will be all same means correlated very highly inter intercorrelated correlated so if they ask you what's the way to remove this so you can say okay we can use principal component analysis which we will study in the next section so you can say hey we can use principal component analysis to remove the uh, multicollinearity from our data and then it's boom you are done with your interview it means kind of uh, just one question as an asked in the interview as i was asked in one of my interview okay so that's the basic uh, thing that we need to understand and i really hope that you enjoy this section the next section we will head over to the pca and we had done a two projects now it's good to see that all of you are doing projects and it's i think i hope that you are very enjoying okay you can leave your uh, questions in the comment box i will definitely pick up that question okay thank you for seeing this section i'll be catching up in the next section okay so now we will talk about principal component analysis 
which is a dimensionality reduction algorithm, okay? So, uh, you will get to know what is dimensionality reduction, etc. But before that, we, we should have a toolkit of some, some other concept of linear algebra, like linear combinations, or linear transformations, and eigenvectors and eigenvalues, okay? So, we will review uh, linear transformation and eigenvectors and eigenvalues so that we can be on the same pace. Okay, so if you want to get in more detail, there is a YouTube channel named 3 Blue 1 Brown like this. You can head over to that. They ha it, he has a very good playlist on linear algebra. They have a series of section videos. You can watch that if you want to get dig dive into that. But for this, you don't need that. Okay, but uh, uh, what is linear transformation? If you linear transformation is just like a, is a function. As we have seen, f of x, which is a function, so it just transforms your function, transform this x to maybe the square of x. So this is just the, is a function. The transform or the transform from one vector space to another is that respects to underlying linear structure of each vector space. Okay, so if you if you have seen the three blue one brown videos, he has clearly mentioned that is a function, lean linear transformation is a function that transforms your one vector space to another with linear structure, okay, or be parallel to each other, it's a linear structure of each vector space. If a little bit of non-linear gains, you will be not able to do the transformation of your vector, okay? So that's called a linear transformation. So linear transformation can be written as T uh, colon, we are transforming our vector R, to down. Okay? Okay, so here is here's an example of 1D linear uh, transformation. So here's a function t of x and a b the sum is scalar and uh, there are one dimensional linear transformation t of x which is a function that maps your uh, that, that maps your from from interval of 0 to 1 to the interval of z 3 to 0. So we have a vector the 0 to 1 and it's, it scales okay by the factor of 3 by the factor of 3 to the end to looks like this okay so that's the linear transformation you can head over to the 3 blue 1 brown channel for more details so uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues I'm not going to take that in the math of eigenvectors and eigenvalues but it's just like what it does let's say you have the new transform vector it's just a scale version of the original vector so you have some vector, let's say uh, v, you have a vector, we have a vector, let's say this, and it's the new transform, it's just scale, means the, uh, the new vector is just scale from this vector like this, uh, if I choose new pen, yeah, so it's uh, like this, then the original vector, then the original vector is the eigenvector of the original matrix, okay? So you just, if your new transform, you just scale from the original, then your original vector is known as to be a uh, eigenvector, and the factor by which it is stretched, like this green color, is known as eigenvalues, okay? And vectors that have these characteristics are known as eigenvectors, okay? And eigenvalues means the factor by which it is scaled or stretched are uh, known as the eigenvalues, which is denoted by this symbol, which is lambda. Okay, so that's the simple idea behind eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Again, let's uh, revise what we have studied uh, till now. Till now, we have studied about linear transformation, and a linear transformation is a function that transforms you from one vector space to another with respect to lying under a uh, linear structure of each vector space. Okay, we can write out here, we can, we can write our value linear transformation as a T of X, uh, for example, for 1D one one day linear, equals to uh, AX, and A be the sum a uh, linear, uh, sorry, scalar, okay? So, what we are doing over in this example, here we have a vector of from, from the interval of 0 to 1, we are transforming it to 0 to 3 by scaling it by, by a factor of 3, okay? That's the linear transformation. Okay, and here in eigenvector and eigenvalue, we have a new transform vector, which is the linear transformation which is happening. Okay, it's a linear transformation which is a new transform vector. It's a scale from the original vector, 
means from the original vector, like this it has been shown you over here, then it is, it is the original vector is known as the eigenvector of the original matrix, otherwise it's, it's just a vector, and the factor by which it is scaled here is 3, the factor by which it is scaled here is 3, then the 3 is your eigenvalue, okay? It's, it, this is what the simple eigenvector and eigenvalues are, okay? Pretty much is what I'm trying to say you here. Okay, if you want to get in more detail, there is a video of by Gilbert Strang, Gilbert, I think I'm pronouncing correct, Gilbert Strang linear algebra videos are a book by Introduction to Linear Algebra, Introduction to Linear Algebra. You can have a look by Gilbert Strang, or you can have a look for a quick look at three blue, one brown video, three blue, one brown video on linear algebra on YouTube, okay? So that's the uh, kind of a resources to learn more. But for now, if you know this, then you're good to learn about principal covariant analysis. Okay. So you may think, yeah, you I don't want to do so much of math, etc. So you have a library known as NumPy, which you can have a look, which I have given the notebook in the description down right below about NumPy, Pandas, so you can have a look. So we can just implement, we can just implement by this LA, LA is allies, LA is allies as a linear algebra. We are taking out the I's, E, I, Z of the input and input here is our vector, okay? And this is your, the eigenvector and eigenvalue, eigenvector of the, or this matrix, sorry, yeah. yeah, this is a matrix, okay? So, and this, this matrix is just a 2, comma, minus 1, 4, comma, 3, okay? So that's the matrix of 2 by 2 matrix. Okay, so we have studied about um, um, linear um, algebra that is required for us for a principal common analysis. Now it's time for understanding why we are studying this all and why, why we need dimensionality reduction. So let's say you're working on uh, kind of a large amount of data set. So this is 3,000 dimensions. And what do I mean by dimensions? It's like the size of the house is one dimension, then floor of a house is second dimension, then number of fans is a third dimension, then etc. So like, like that, we have 3,000 features. Okay, so we have 3,000 features. So for that, it, you, first of all, it will cause storage. Second, it will cause time. It will even take months to train your model. So it will even take months. So you don't have too much of compute resources. Okay, so that's why, but in real world, we have millions of dimensions data available. So what we do, we simply use dimensionality reduction method or technique, which is a PCA, to reduce your model feature, your data features or variables. Okay, and we typically see this in text data or image data. So let's say you have some image. Let me draw one image of mine. So here is my image. So it will the eye has one dimension, and it may be a millions of dimension data set. Only one image, millions of dimensions. One image I have worked on. Uh, I have worked on to that, which is which has seven eighty five dimensions 785 dimensions so we have we have to work on this typically will be seen on your text data where you will working on natural language processing like word embeddings or image data where we're working on uh, images okay so you need the principal common analysis okay so what is principal common analysis principal common analysis is a method for dimensionality reduction that is used to reduce the variables or the dimensions of the data by transforming large set of features, large set of features into smaller ones that contains most of the information. So let's say you have x1, then you have x2, then you have x3, and all the around the let's say x40, let's say 50. Okay. So what it will principal common analysis does? It asks you a component. Let's say you have given a two component. So it will try to put. It will try to put most of the information into the first component x1 and it will try to put let's say p1 and and, and in the second component most of, the, most of the information in these two components because you have say to reduce from 40 dimension to two dimensions okay so so it will simply um, compress that like that or put all the information into the first data variation first and second if you say it is one 
So it will try to put every, most of the information in the first and it will remove this all. So obviously you will lose some of the information from the data, but it's good to have uh, not more than dimensions. Okay, I will give you a tip when you, when you have to work on principal component analysis. Okay, so what is the basic intuition? Basic intuition behind principal component analysis is that we have a principal components which is a new variable, which are the new variable, like let's say I have, I have given you know, P1 and P2, they are the new principal components, which are new variables, okay, that are constructed as a linear combinations of the initial variables, okay. So what, what, what we do, uh, let's say we have X1, X2, all the way to the X40, so we just try to put in all the first and second, so um, means we is a hyperparameter. Two is a num number of a component is a hyperparameter. So let's say we have taken two. Okay. So it will try to put most of the information into P1 and P2, and these are the new vectors or the unit vectors or the variables like this all, and it's just a linear combinations of these variables. Okay, of the initial variables. Okay, you will get to know the through visualization what I'm saying and these combinations are done in such a way that the principal components are uncorrelated, they are uncorrelated and most of the information from these variables, I mean size, price, etc. will be compressed into the first components and so on. Okay, and we are projecting each data point onto only, onto only the first few components to obtain a lower dimensions of data, pres preserving as much of, of the uh, data variation as possible. So what is this we are projecting, etc. If you have seen orthogonality concept into an, uh, linear algebra, orthogonality, so what it tells, so here is a uh, visualization of that. So here we have a data, and what we do, we take out the two components, let's say we have two components, like this uh, first dimension, and then we have a second dimension like this, okay? So we have a second dimension like this, okay? And these, these are the principal components which are constructed, which, is, which are constructed as the linear combinations of the initial variables. So what is what we do? We project our data point onto this. We project our each and every data point onto these diamond, uh, principal components like this. And uh, now our data point will be on this. So here's the visualization which is showing more about this. So we are projecting each data point onto the two components. Here we have first component and here we have second component, okay? This is the basic intuition behind principal components. So basically, we have, a, let's say this, and let's say this one, and you have a data point like this, okay? So you just project the data point onto here, you project data point onto here to reduce the dimension of the data, preserving as much as the information as you can in the first component, okay? So we will see the algorithm. So let's start seeing the algorithm to understand a little bit more detail what, what we are doing, okay? But before that, let's review some of the concepts from previous uh, slides. Okay, so principal components are the unit vectors. Uh, means they are the unit vectors like the new variables that come out as a P1 and P2, whatever the P all the P and PC is the number of components as constructed because from the uh, linear combinations of the initial variables and these combination, uh, combinations are done in such a way that the principal components are uncorrelated, okay? You will see the algorithm by this uncorrelated, etc. And most of the information within the initial variables are just in a compressed in the first and then second, like this number of a components you are given, okay? Pretty much is what I'm trying to say you here. Okay, and uh, we have seen the basic intuition. Now it's time for getting into the algorithm. So the first step and the first and foremost step of this principal common analysis is data pre-processing. What do I mean by data pre-processing? Means we have to standardize our data. So in this step, you standardize your data. It simply means that your data should be falling in the same range, okay? So let's say you are working on uh, some system, like let's say the age. Uh, like the one, 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 where you have a one variable, which is the age. So you have an age and let's say the first person age is 20, second person age is 40, like, like this. So let's say a new person age is 200. 
is far away or far different from these means it is it's called an outlier it's called an outlier which is which which is which is not in the range of age okay and it's, which is not in the range of the common ones okay so let's say your data is like 20 40 it's a two three so let's say it's a far four four thousand so you this is uh, this is kind of a outlier and principal common analysis is sensitive to outliers okay so what it will do so so uh, so that's why we do the standardization of the data some sometimes we do normalization also so we do the standardization of the data so our data falls in the same range and the reason why it's critical to perform because it's quite sensitive regarding the variances of the initial variables okay if you have seen the variance and mean if you and the formula for this is x scaled equals to x minus the mean of x xi by the standard deviations okay standard deviation and then you will get this scale formula of your um, day data and don't worry how to implement this you can also implement this just by coding in python so let's we have made a function this is standardized it takes a value of x then you should make a new variable like scale then you subtract x minus the mean is np dot mean of x divided by the np dot the standard deviation of x okay you can do this but if more formula the vectorized code is in scikit-learn you can use scikit-learn to implement it just three lines of code Okay, don't worry if you are, if you are um, not able to implement from scratch. After first step, after you standardize your data, now it's time for getting into the computing your covariance matrix of your data. So what do you mean by covariance matrix? In the VS covariance matrix, a P by P symmetric matrix where the diagonal are the variances of whatever the um, data. But if, you will tell you can have have a look on the internet what about what is covariance matrix but here after taking out the covariance matrix it will tell you that um, that that tell us how to feature how the features of the input data set is varying from the mean with respect to each other okay so here it tells a core correlation like that that's not a really correlation but here we have an input data set like x and it's out of how much the input data set are varying from the mean with respect to each other it means the x1 how it's varying from x2 and etc it is sometimes important because there are some variables highly uh, are highly correlated and they contain unnecessary information to work on okay so you should review you have to re you can remove that okay so that's how we compute the covariance matrix Credibility is one of that trying to say here. Okay, so you just denote covariance matrix with C. And for implementing covariance matrix, you can use the again numpy for the scientific numpy dot np dot cough, and you just give the data as your features, let's say x, and you get your output as a covariance matrix. Okay, credibility is what I'm trying to say you here. So let's um, see what, I, what, what I've seen so far. We've seen first we have to pre-process your data, like state standardization or normalization. Then we have to compute the covariance matrix of your data, which tells you how the input variables are varying from the mean with respect to each other variables. Okay? Because it's sometimes important because some variables are highly correlated and they contain unnecessary information. Okay? The next step is computing the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. So let's review what we have seen in eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So in eigenvectors we have seen that if our new transform vector is just a scale from the original vector and the factor is called the eigenvectors and the factor by which it's stretched is known as eigenvalues. Okay? So that's the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. The reason why I made this PPT is I if if I write in blackboard that will be not beneficial for you because I would be saying so I had made it in notes so you can have a look on in the future also to see how it's working and it's better to have a text onto the screen to uh, while you are listening. Okay. Okay. So what we do? You compute the eigenvector and eigenvalue of the covariance matrix. Means you come uh, for eigenvectors are the transform vector from the original vector, and the factor by which the uh, is 
stretched is called the eigenvalues. Okay, you can easily compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues in uh, Python. And then what you do, you sort the columns of eigenvectors matrix V and eigenvalue matrix D in order of decreasing value. What do you mean by step four? Let's say you compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and those who has um, high means high information or high numbers. So you just sort the means the larger one in the first, then larger one in the first, then larger second, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, like this. Okay, and then after that, what you do? You simply um, you say, oops, let me do that. You simply uh, compute the cumulative energy content, how much the content each, each eigenvector is having, okay? And then you select a subset of eigenvectors as a basis vector. Means let's say you are in cyclone, there is a, sorry, in any other, you should choose how, how many number of components to use, okay? That's the main thing. So what you do, you simply uh, sort in decreasing decreasing order and you come the content of each item vector and then you select who has the high uh, energy or content from the top and if it is if you choose the principal common in two then only two highest two highest will be choose those who have highest number of information okay and then you take this uh, and then you take this two and to project onto the final you project data onto the new basis okay so you you have a large amount of again and and then what you do you remove this or you project this um principal common uh this eigenvector onto the new vectors okay and this is the formal and this is randomized and this is the feature vector to transpose okay so we have seen so far and here's uh, uh steps what were the algorithm of steps and i have not written last step which is uh Projecting the data, you can have a look, but uh, because my uh, kind of uh, was not fitting. Okay, so first you pre-process your data, then you compute the covariance matrix, then you compute the eigenvector and eigenvalues of the covariance matrix, then you rearrange the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, then you compute the cumulative energy content of each eigenvectors. Although it is not necessary because we, when you sort the decreasing order, you the top will be having the highest information. And then you select a subset of the eigenvectors as basis vectors. Okay, so I think that we have seen so far, and I really, really hope that you have enjoyed this tutorial in, the, in this section. Uh, pre previously, I think you may find it's quite uh, intimidating. Now I think that you are able to grasp that con uh, concept of linear regression, logistic regression, support vector machine, principal common analysis, and then you have coded projects, and then you have coded Boston house price prediction, stock price prediction, and classification project. You have coded logistic and linear from scratch. Now in the next section, we will uh, we will code principal component analysis from scratch. We will do by uh, with ourselves to get the more feel of the principal component analysis. Okay. So I uh, really hope that you have enjoyed. I'll be catching up your next section. Uh, so let's start with the next section to learn something new. Okay, so now we'll start with learning theory. Again, one of the most important concepts to learn in machine learning. And uh, I think gaining uh, uh, some something or less, uh, we, we will see the topics which we'll study in this course. Uh, in this uh, section is, we will see why it is very important. Means uh, maybe it might look a little bit more not sense over here, but maybe if you are going to do advanced version of machine learning like deep learning or NLP or computer vision, it would surely make sense that that learning theory actually works. And in learning theory, in this section, we'll learn about these three topics. Our main uh, main communicate main talk onto this like bias and variance trade-off and then we will move on to approximation estimation error then we will move on empirical versus minimization and this this will be our new concept this this will this this will be this is these are two just a definition just aren't just just a just a problem framed okay just a definition which which is which is needed because in many of the research papers they have listed uh, empirical risk minimization of, of or approximation estimation error the reason why they have maybe some uh, in history they may, they might be have different something out of different choices okay so we will study and we will just see the definition of this and and it will surely make sense but if it is not 
please be sure to uh, ignore it for now continue with this course and you are free feel you feel free to come again okay you are feel free to come again and then watch this two concept because it will surely make sense okay so let's start with bias and variance okay so in bias and variance here we will study about bias and variance trade off and here is your warning warning is is warning is 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 one of the easiest concept to learn as instructed by even uh, when i heard that is easiest concept to learn and it seems the easiest but it's very hard to master very hard to master and i hope that you heard andrew nang saying this and i think this this actually makes sense if you're a beginner then it might not because you will understand everything but uh, when you when you are actually developing the product it's a very very important to keep track of bias and variance trade off and etc okay so let's start with bi bias and variance but before that we are going to recall our two problems which is my favorite overfitting oops not my favorite it's a overfitting and underfitting okay so here is my favorite diagram uh, from the google so here uh, let's assume that we have a time in x axis and values in y axis okay so may may be some kind of problem okay so here you have these data points here you have this data points and what do you do you just fit a straight line means a simple linear regression simple simple linear regression okay you just fit it a simple linear regression which is just theta 0 times uh, x0 plus theta 1 times x1 okay so, uh, plus theta 2 times x2 okay so here you just assume that we have a fitted straight line using a linear regression okay but you can see over here that the train it is not performing well on the training set also means this is my training set so it is not performing well uh, the, the the residual error or the cost function will be very very high will be very very high okay the cost function which is j of theta which will be very very high in this case so we call it as a underfit okay so the major problem major 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 problem that make this problem occur is that we have a low amount of features low amount of features or you have low amount of data or you have low amount or you have a low amount of data okay so these two causes the problem so you low amount of features low amount of data okay and that can be that that can be sense using just by adding more data or adding more feature or if you don't have feature you can do feature engineering to generate more features okay so uh, just to do not focus on feature engineering for now because it's not a data data science course but obviously you just need a simple feature engineering means it's just generating more features based on our feature so let's for an example that you are building a spam detection system so let's assume that that you are building a spam detection system where you have a one column which is of text another column which is the label whether the in whether that text is a spam or ham so it is a label okay so you can generate more feature like length of the text what is the now how many number or what is the number of a text in that what is the number of a words in that text what is the number of a character so you can you take you using this 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 text feature you generate more three features and that's called a feature engineering okay so i will be if you if you if you say i'll be very happy to make a video on a feature engineering okay it will it will be a full class day data science course okay so here after this we have our simple linear regression which is just like this now this is called underfitted and major root problem that i've seen so far in my experience is a low amount of feature stack that we have okay so in general the underfitted me the under underfitting means is just that your model is not performing well on the training set and it's obvious that it will not perform well on the testing set so that's why we call this underfitting okay the next picture of here is good fit slash robust robust means it will it will be very robust it is a very good fit you can see it is a very good fit the cost the residual error is low the residual error is low and it says we have a very good polynomial kind of thing um a uh, non linear uh, or 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 i can say i can say non linear 
or a polynomial regression over here. We have applied polynomial regression, and here's what we get the, as, a, uh, as, a, as a hypothesis. Okay, so here you can see that is a very good fit, and this is this is the robust model. Okay, so we can say that this model is performing well on the training set, as well as on the testing set, because whatever example will come here, the residual error will be low. Okay, so like like that is is performing well on the training and testing set. Another picture which tells you about overfitting. What do you mean by overfitting? Overfitting simply means that your model performs very, very well, or I can say that your model learns very, very well on the training set where your cost function, your cost function of J of theta is equals to zero, okay? Where you, you don't have any residual error or approximately equals to zero, okay? So your cost function is very, very low, so you can assume that your model learned a lot. So just touching each and every example, so your model learned a lot, so that's why your cost function is very, very low. And cost function is just denoted by the summation over i equals to 1 all the way down to the m, h of xi, h of xi minus yi squared. Okay? And it's just taking out the difference between the predicted and the actual value. And here, the, the predicted and actual value are on the same line. So here, you, you, you model on a very nonlinear uh, hypothesis. It, all, it happens it, that if, if, if you have a lot of features, lot of features, and here you have a low features, and here if you have a lot of features, that happens, okay? And maybe you have used too much degree in polynomial regression, so that's why it happens, or maybe something kind of a, I don't know, a very kind of complex architecture, or, or, you have, or you have made a very complex function f of x, with the highest degree uh, x4, etc., like that, like that. Okay, so this is this is the this is the problem for overfitting. And whatever new example come over here, your model will be very very high. Whatever come here, the residual layer will be very very high. Okay, so your model will fail to generalize well onto the new training examples. Okay, so the, in general, overfitting means over overfitting means that your model perform bad, or or again say your model perform very very well under training set in which your cost function is low is 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 equals to zero which is actually good but but uh, you you may think it is good but just just wait that your testing set error is very very high okay so that indicates the problem of overfitting so uh, we can prevent overfitting by selecting some of the important features selecting important features or a regularization. So regularization is just an advanced version of selection of features. So let's see what it does. Okay. So I have already told you about regularization now in our regularized linear models and I hope that you understood that. Okay, so now we will uh, see the bias and variance trade-off by taking a look at some scenario of your model. Okay, so let's assume that uh, you are building some model. Okay, so you are building some model and your model gives 1% error, 1% error on a training set. So you have one training, training set like this and you divided this training set into uh, training and evaluation set. So you have this whole data, you have this whole data, and you divided this in training and evaluation set. Okay, so what you've done, you've taken a 1% error on a training set, 1% error on a training set, which is, uh, if, if you see over here, you 1% error, 1% error on a training set, and 15% error on the evaluation set. So you can assume that your model is, you can see that your model is overfitting because your error is very, very low in training set, but your error in validation set is actually 15%, which is very high, okay, according to this, okay? So it is performing a very, very well on a training set, but it fails to generalize well on the testing set, so it is overfitting. And in this case, we say that the model is uh, having high variance. And we use bagging, we use bagging to reduce high variance, which you will see in ensemble learning methods or sections. So don't don't worry, you can come back again to this section to watch this. Okay? So this is this is how you add, identify if you, if your model is having high variance. Next, next is that let's assume that your model is giving a 15% error on the training set, on the training set, okay. 15% error on training set and 16% error on, e error, uh, on evaluation set. So it is not performing well on the training set. Obviously, it will not perform well on the evaluation set. So it seems to be underfitting. So here it has 
high bias and we use boosting we use boosting to reduce bias okay so this is this this is what i'm i'm saying and uh, let's take let's take for the for the sake of an example again, again example that your model is having both high bias and high variance where you have a 15% error which is obviously high variance and 30% error on evaluation which is obviously high bias okay so it is both overfitting and overfitting and obviously it has a high bias and high variance okay the next our favorite last example of this bias and variance trade off is your model gives 0.5% model gives 0.5% on training set and 1% on the testing set so it seems to be a perfect model or a robust model there is not learn too much on training set and it is a very robust and good model okay here it seems to be a good so we can say it is it has a low bias where it has a very small uh, error and it has a low variance where it has on training set is a very good okay so this is this is what we consider for low bias and low variance and all of these all of these we take assumption do you know what assumption oops you don't know but because you are watching but uh, we take an assumption that base error or human level performance or human or human level performance human level performance is approximately equals to 0% is approximately equals to 0% so what do i mean with this assumption i what do, what do, what do i mean with this assumption that we take our base error to be base error base error to be approximately 0% in all of these examples in all of this example this example this example this example okay so let's see what's that human level of base error is so here you can see that this, you're 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 going to build a sum uh, classification model or maybe the face detection model okay so you have built your you have built a face detection or face recognition or real-time face recognition so your algorithm even you will fail to identify this person even I will fail to identify this person the reason why because it's very blur very 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 with blur okay so even a human even a human human error okay HLP you, even a human error will be very very high very very high because he will be not able to he will be not able to uh, identify who this person is okay so 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 and and you, and you can cannot expect that your model should be very great over here you can expect that your model is very your your model is also giving the same error as you are giving because you are also not able to identify as well as your model also not not able to identify and actually this is not this is here the HLP HLP is very very high or I can say the base error is very very high so we can say that here um, you, you can you, you cannot expect your algorithm to work best but let's assume that that you have a fresh image and where the HLP is equals to zero means human level performance is equals to zero and you now you can expect your algorithm performance to be good because it is the human level performance is equals to zero so that's called the base error I, and, and I hope that you understood the next uh, we, we have talked about bias and variance straight off you can again rewind this video to understand again but what is approximation estimation error this is just a definition so the approximation uh, estimation error uh, approximation error in some data is the difference between exact value and the approximation of it and this approximation indicates your f of x means the outputted model uh, the output from the model so we hear your f of x given some approximation and this is the ground truth which is y hat okay so difference between these both is called as approximation error okay so here i've taken one example from wikipedia again it's a scale example but that's 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 generally mean i i already told you know in cost function you take out the difference between that's approximation estimation error okay so it's just like this if the exact value is 50 and the approximation is 449.9 then the error will be 0.1 and that's actually what you do when taking out the error for one training example you just sub subtract this and the regression problem what you do you just subtract y hat minus y and then and, and you get your answer okay and then you add some mission for every i for every i etc okay so this is what you do and this is just a definition because you will see a lot in your research papers okay next one is empirical risk minimization again we have seen so an algorithm receives as an input on a training set s so i'm going to just i make you familiar with this what i'm saying that an algorithm receives as an input a training set s 
means he, uh, we, 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 get an, we get our training set which is a sample from the large distribution D okay so we get our sample from the distribution D means large we just take out some example and labeled by some target function Y okay so here we have our training set as well as we'll be having the labels for it because this is a this is framed on supervised learning okay so here we will be having label as well as the samples for each training example okay and should make a predictor we should make a f the predictor that maps our input variable x means these features to the output variable y okay and the goal of this algorithm is to minimize the error output with respect to the unknown d means now we will feed a new example that a model has not have, have, have even seen and your model should be very minimal or your or your or your model should be or your model error should be very minimal okay so this is what the full definition is saying and it simply means that we want to come up with the predictor l subscript s h we want to come up with the l of h with sub, subscript s where s emphasizes the fact that the output predictor depends on s okay so whatever the output will be it depends on s because we have taken we have learned we have learned the weights we have learned the w we have learned the theta 1 theta 2 all around theta n from these s so that emphasizes that minimizes the risk or the error which is called the ERM which is called the empirical risk minimization okay so I hope that you understood this concept very much clearly and I really hope that you had enjoyed seeing this uh, section and we I have uh, talked a lot on empirical risk minimization uh, learning theory and etc so I hope that you will utilize this uh, way and we have already talked about uh, and now you can continue further if you if you haven't understood anything you can feel free to ask in the comment box below I'll be very happy to take your doubts and be sure to have a look at the course website which is already available in the description box below so meet you in the next section okay a very warm welcome in this section and in this section we will be talking about decision tree one of my favorite topic to talk on as I will go in depth of decision tree to make you understand everything in decision tree with intuitive examples with solved examples of decision tree as I have seen on YouTube that they are uh, the, some instructors are doing great job but they are not doing depth into decision tree uh, means for free so I just want to make you familiar with decision tree whoever is watching this tutorial into depth and I really hope that you will enjoy this section but before that what we are going to cover in this section are as follows first we will start with the uh, introduction of geometric intuition uh, basic intuition about decision tree what the actual the decision trees are and then we will go further into how we are building that decision tree so for building we will uh, learn some sub task sub concept which is like entropy information gain a guinea impurity okay then after that we will build our own decision trees and then I will show you the implementation of decision tree okay but before that let's uh, understand the basic intuition of decision tree as there will be more topics which we will cover uh, as I will discuss later on okay okay so let's start so uh, first of all what is decision tree decision tree is a supervised learning algorithm okay so it is a supervised learning algorithm and what do I mean by supervised learning is that we are having our uh, x uh, x1 with our label y1 all the way around to the x2 then we have y2 all the way around to the xn and we have y n okay so we are having labels so it is a supervised learning algorithm and it is used for both like support vector machine is used for both regression and classification so it is used for both so classification and regression okay so uh, you will see how we do how we construct the decision tree like that okay so let's start with um, the basic intuition of decision trees so the definition of decision trees that they are nested if and else uh, statements okay if you're a programmer then you will be relating this concept which is if and else and the Python is a prerequisite or any programming language is a prerequisite so 
what decision tree? It is just a nested if and else statement. So it is a nested, it is a nested if and else statement. So I don't know why it is so bold. So it is a nested if and else statement. Uh, so is what is just is just ask a question and it splits the data okay so let me write the formal definition to make you more uh, intuition intuition behind so they are nested nested if and else statements okay so it's just ask questions it's just ask questions it just asks questions and splits the data okay so it just asks question and splits the data so uh, let me take one uh, example of iris data set let me take one example of iris data set okay so what we do when iris data set so but let what let let me make you familiar with what is that this data set to make you more clear understanding of this topic okay so iris data set is simply like this you have a data set which has four features like sepal length sepal width petal length petal width okay and you have the label which is the species of that flower okay so this is a task of flower species detection on the basis of four features okay so this is a classification data set a binary classif classification data set so you are having and like this so let me change my color i don't know why it is so bold okay so you have like this uh, first you have sepal length sepal length and then I, 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 I hope that you understand what is sepal and what is petal. So sepal width, then you have petal length, and then you have a petal width, okay? And then you have a one more column, which is the label, which indicates what is species. So let's take an example, 2.2, 4.30, let's say 3.2, uh, 4.6, and the label is um, Satosa setosa okay so you have three classes in this data set as a label which is setosa which we label as one sorry zero versicolor versicolor which we label as one and virginica virginica which is labeled as two, okay? So the output will be either zero means Satosa, then either it will be one means Versicolor, or Virginica as in code as two, okay? So that's the Iris data set that I had just make you familiar with, okay? So let's, what what we will do, we will not make use of any library, we will not make use of any, anything. We will simply, what, what we will do, we will um, simply make a decision tree by yourself by making just if and else condition okay so we'll make a simple classifier obviously it is not so formal but we'll make a simple classifier that will simply classifies your flowers okay so that's what we are going to do so let me remove this and I really hope that you understand what this data set is and more uh, understand uh, uh, if you want to more in detail about what the data set is you can search online this is a famous data set like iris state data set which is just for flower species detection system okay so let's start so first uh, uh, here we have an um, variable axis here we have our axis which is sepal length sepal width petal length and petal width okay so we are having these features and we have a yi which indicates either one or two or two or zero or two okay so that's the basic intuition uh, means of the data set part we are given this data set now what we will do we will make a classifier like this first if we write if let me choose another pen okay uh, I, I hope that I should choose a better pen like this blue okay okay so if the petal length is smaller than some a and may a may be some number a may be some number let's say let's say 2.3 a may, may be some number if petal length is smaller than a then consider y to be uh, versicolor okay so let's consider y to be one okay if not if it is petal length is greater than a then what do what what to do oops i hope that it is getting not clear what what happened 
I have to buy my new computer. Why do I don't know what why it is so much lagging? Okay, so you if it is smaller than a the petal length, then consider your flower is means a, a verse cycle or and we have we have made one one and if if it is petal length if your petal length is not is, is greater than a then what you will do you will write else if sepal length you take again one feature you take again one feature and says if it is smaller than b if sepal length is smaller than b then you will you consider your y to be a uh, virginic means two okay if it is not if it is not if both is both condition fails then say if both condition fails then say that your output is setosa okay so here is our simple decision tree we're using two features we have made the decision trees using two features so let me make it more intuitive I, I, I hope so that you are able to understand okay so, so that's why I'm speaking very slow so here let, let me tell you what I'm a petal length here we had we have taken two features which is petal length and sepal length okay we had not taken this uh, this two features okay but you can make that but this is not a formal decision tree this is just for an example this is obviously not correct okay so uh, you had to make made one if condition that if the parallel length is smaller than some a and a can be anything 2.3 uh, 4.3 that that is usually I'm taking anything but it is usually taken uh, which we'll see uh, in one of our uh, data set we will see how it is chosen and you will obviously see how it is selected okay so if it is smaller than a parallel length then consider that y to be equals to one if it is not let me check the recording is on yeah okay recording is on okay so we if the petal length smaller than a then we consider our y to be this uh, virginica okay if the petal length is greater than a or is this 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 condition fails this condition fails it then goes to else condition and in else condition it uh, this is again a nested loop a nested sorry not loop if an assist control flow so check if your sepal length is smaller than b if it is then you say that y equals to virginica okay and otherwise if this condition also fails then it says else your y means y should be setosa and you have this hole into the this uh, nested loop in this and you have this whole classifier and this is your whole classifier so that this is the decision tree yeah so let me make this diagrammatically in the terms of decision tree so in terms of decision tree, we can write this uh, this uh, this if and else statement. First, uh, we have our root node. Uh, this uh, we have first we make our root node like this. Let me make one root node. Here we have our root node with this condition: if a petal length petal length is smaller than a, okay, then if it is if it is yes, then you say your y to be one okay if it is no if your parallel length is no okay you consider you again make one more condition which is sepal length is smaller than b if it is yes then you what you do you classify this y equals to two if it is not if it is not then you take it as a zero and your whole three variable uh, target variables are covered and this is the decision tree and this is whole this is the decision tree i have made in yellow this is the decision tree is just ask a question on the data set if the petal length is smaller than a if it is then consider y equals to one if it is not then again we have made another decision another decision and then we uh, if it is yes or if it is no like this okay so that's the this is the decision tree it's it's damn easy like this okay so here again i'm saying this is what you do just believe me yeah we had this is the decision tree and how it is constructed we will see okay so we have made this if, if and else statement nested if, if and else statement like this and this is what the decision tree is so here are certain terminology that we will we will have to see over here so here are the the details that we should know okay so the 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 first node or head node is no is known as a root node is known as a root node or parent node okay this is this is a root node obviously this is also a parent node and these are the child node these are the child node 
okay child node and this is the parents node and this is also the uh, parent node and this is the terminal node this is the terminal or leaf node because you are not splitting this node into further nodes so this is called the terminal and this is also a terminal node this is also a terminal node okay this is also terminal or a leaf node this is some sometimes called a leaf node when you are not spitting further okay so this is a leaf node or you consider as a leaf node this is the whole thing is called branch this whole thing is called branch uh, use the, uh, this whole thing is called branch okay and that's the basic terminology of this okay and this is the splitting of your data okay this is the this is what you are doing doing which is splitting okay if you are removing some node let's take an example this then you are pruning it okay then you are pruning this node but we are we, we don't know we, we don't want right now okay so that's the that's what that's the decision tree and i hope i hope that you under understood this uh, example clearly and i really really hope that you will uh, that you got a very good intuition of decision tree in much smaller span of time in much easy way okay so i hope that you remember this uh, terminology either i will make you familiar with terminology by the time also if it is not required for remembering all those things okay but this is it's it's best to rem uh, take a paper and a pen and write notes with me whatever i'm writing okay and just listen me carefully after listening me you can make notes okay so now let's see what's the decision boundaries will look like okay what's the decision boundaries will look like or the hyperplanes will look like but what do i mean with hyperplanes i mean with hyperplane decision boundary is let's take an example of linear regression in linear regression we are making a straight line this is called the hypothesis decision boundary then we have a hyperplane it's called a hyperplane in support victim machine we are also making hyperplane in logistic regression we are also making hyperplane means a decision boundary so in the decision decision tree we also have the decision boundaries okay or hyperplanes so let's see how it is constructed so i don't know i will be able to make that image or not but i will fully try that okay so here uh, let let me make one x and y plane x and y oops i'm uh, please anyone help me to make this okay let me do that oops i'm just freaking out let me do it again yeah okay great so i have made one and this is my x-axis this is this is my x-axis and this is my y-axis and we have a two features which is sepal length and uh, petal uh, length i think so yeah so we have petal length in the x-axis and we have sepal length in the y-axis okay so we i i, I have just made it you can remove this y-axis maybe it will confuse you in in our axis we have petal length and y-axis we have sepal length because we have taken only two features in this example we have we are not taken more features like petal width and sepal width okay so what what we consider what we have done we have consider we have consider this full reason we have consider this full reason this full reason to be y equals to one okay this hyperplane this hyperplane list let's name it as a first hyperplane so this full reason is our y equals to one means whatever data point will come is consider y equals to one and this is just this is just the if statement that we have seen if pedal length if pedal length is smaller than a okay then y equals to one so that's this is the full reason okay means we have not for this bit so it is just a full reason where y equals to one if that condition uh, passes the, okay then another hyperplane we can construct let me choose another pen another hyperplane we construct that this reason this reason would consider y equals to 2 okay y equals to 2 if the sepal length is smaller than b if the points come in this uh, reason then it is it will consider y equals to 2 another we have hyperplane let me take another pen let, let me take another pen let's take an example of blue okay another come we can consider that as a y equals to 3 okay if that uh, if that falls in this reason so here we are constructing hyperplanes and if some if something come here then it's going to control y goes to one it's y goes to two or y goes to 
3 with these two features. Obviously, it will be more dimensionally high when you plot the four features. Okay, so you can see that we have a hyperplanes where we are able to make predictions. Okay, and we have made a simple classifier. Okay, but something to note over here that all your hyperplanes are axis parallel. Okay, are axis parallel means this is parallel and this is parallel so you can see over here that all the hyperplanes are axis parallel okay so that's the i i hope that you understood decision trees in that and uh, um, this is the basic uh, intuition that i want to give it to you in more uh, sophisticated way or not sophisticated it's just a good way okay okay so as i've tried it to keep it as simple as i can and i kept it okay so let's um, let's let's start building or let's start with mathematical region that how we construct these kind of decision trees these kind of decision trees how we construct okay so but before that we have uh, what 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 we do we uh, how we choose the variable or how we choose the feature to be the root node or the brand or this this how we split so we have attribute selection measure and you if, if you select ran randomly like i have chosen petal land if you choose ran randomly then you will be ended a very bad model so we have different attribute selection measure we like entropy information gain gain impurity which will see in detail to understand the how we select the attribute to be as a root node or like this okay so let's take a let's take an example of this data set if you want to split this data set what feature you will use you what are you going to use outlook as your feature a root node or temperature as a root node or humidity as a root node or wind as a root node okay and play tennis is our uh, label so which you will use if you choose ran randomly maybe you will be end up ending up with a bad model okay so you have to do that kind of thing no so we will we uh, scientists or researchers have done a very great job even you all have to do all this kind of thing research and Please keep contributing to the AI community that uh, maybe I'm, I'm also doing research in machine learning and definitely will come up with something extra. Okay, so um, different measures, uh, different measures are uh, different attribute selection measure are entropy. We have entropy. Then we have the second number. We have information gain, information gain, information gain which we usually write as IG, IG. Then we have Guinea impurity, then we have Guinea impurity, and simply uh, IG, okay? So we denote like this, okay? So uh, we, will, we will talk about all of these three, and I, and I hope that you will uh, understand each of them, okay? So let's start with entropy, okay? So, uh, entropy let me write it more formally yeah so what first of all what is entropy entropy is an attribute selection measure it's the measure of a randomness okay how pure or how pure that attribute is to be used as some nodes or a root node okay so it's the measure of randomness so let me write the definition because definition is also important and if you want this kind of all my notes you can simply write me write with me along either you can comment or um, join the newer community discord community and ask me there i will be able to give okay so ask me there i will be able to give all this entropy etc is the measure is the measure of randomness it's the measure of randomness okay the higher the entropy is the high, the uh, the higher the entropy is the harder to draw any information from them okay so it's if the higher the entropy is it's very hard to break your uh, node okay or to choose the node so um, our entropy should be low to to be considered as a um, leaf node but still don't don't worry I, I will dig dive into the cases to make you more understand what do i mean with these terms okay but first of all uh, let's take an, uh, I, I will show you one equation and then i will show you um, how some uh, first of all one example and then i will show you properties of entropy okay so first of all uh, let's take an example where you are given 
you have y to be maybe uh, y1 y2 all the way down to the yk and in this case you are not this is not examples this is a this this, uh, this is like maybe setosa means what is the number of classes you have okay so um, maybe you have binary classifier or you have a multi-class classifier okay so he, what is the number of a classifier so maybe you have in the in the iris setosa we have here's uh versus setosa versionic and versicolor so we, we here we have y equals y equals to y1 to be setosa then we have versionica then we have versicolor means three y's okay so that's what i mean with this okay so let's uh, first of all let me give you um, let let me give you the equation okay so the equation is defined as like this uh, h we define our entropy by h equals to let me choose white color because i will i like white much okay minus many uh, this is this minus is very important minus the summation i equals to 1 all the way around to the k and k here is the number of your uh, what is the class what is the number of a class okay p of y uh, probability being y i log of base and b is usually taken as 2 or e okay to uh, 2.713 okay so b is usually taken as 2 or 3 but we usually take b as a 2 so if you are taking p as a 2 then you can consider it as l g if you're taking b as a e then then you take as l and natural logarithm and you have a log 2 base a log 2 uh, with a log with the base 2 okay this means lg okay so you take log of p of y i okay and that's the full equation of your entropy it means it's just measures the randomness okay so let's let's take one example because it is i i i i know that is making no sense to you and i know that is making no sense to you but i will make sure that it will make sense okay so first is you we want to measure our randomness for playing golf okay you want to measure your randomness for playing golf okay so let me write play golf oops uh, let me write the data set first what's the data set we'll be using so we have this play golf data set play golf data set where if it is what is the num number of a uh, yes which is nine and what is the number of a uh, no which is five okay so this is our data set like this and let me make this also okay so this is a data day data set and you want to take out the entropy of playing golf okay playing golf okay and here we want to take out entropy of being no being no and being yes okay so what you do first you take out the entropy entropy of 0 0.36 log 2 0 0.36 minus means this is your first this is your first um, y i this is your first y means yes sorry no this is for no and minus let me make it up okay minus 0 0.64 log base 2 0 0.64 okay this is what we have and the answer is 0 0.94 okay so here what we what what we are doing over here that first we are writing this this equation p of y i times a log of for no and then we are writing for a yes okay and there is subtracting and we have a uh, entropy as 0 0.94 and it, it can be further split it okay okay so this 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 was the basic uh, calculation of entropy but let's see some cases of entropy to make you more sense of this uh, entropy uh, in for attribute selection measure okay so uh, we will see some properties so let's uh, consider let's consider that, that we have y to be two class means we have a binary classifier we have where we have two class one is yes one is yes and other one is no okay any kind of 
yes or no whether it is playing tennis or etc it's yes or no okay so let's take an example of uh, let's let's take one scenario let's take one scenario number one okay so here is our scenario which tells here is data here is your data and number of a yes is in 99% number of a yes is 99% in your data means these are the your y labels so we have two unique values in your y labels so here you have yes and no so in that case your yes is around 99% and your no is about 1% is about 1% okay this is your case one so let's take out the entropy for this h of y minus you're taking minus 0 0.99 means 99 log means lg i'm writing log not two maybe i'm writing a log of 0 0.99 minus this this is for my yes means this is for my yes because we have added a summation for each for each uh, y variable so we are uh, for we are doing for each for each y variable okay minus 0 0.01 the log of 0 0.01 and your output is 0 0.0801 okay so that's the your entropy okay so let's take one more scenario let's take one more scenario scenario number two and here let's take an example of your data having the yes to be around 50 percent and your no is around 50 percent okay so um if you, if you take out entropy of this if you take out entropy of this minus 0 0.5 log of 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 log of 0 0.5 which is equals to one which is equals to one and the maximum maximum entropy is one and it is and it is very very hard to add uh, to split this to split this it's very very hard okay so it's maximum entropy is one let's take another scenario and if you have a binary classifier i'm taking an example your maximum entropy is one if you have a binary classifier if you have a multi-class then the equation changes okay which you can see on the internet but most of most of the cases if you understand binary you will be able to understand multi-class okay let's take another scenario scenario number three okay scenario number three tells you scenario number two tells you that your d which has yes to be around zero percent and you have no to be around hundred percent so your entropy over here would be zero okay your entropy will be zero and the minimum entropy is zero over here okay so you can see some cases that is if you have id3 follows if you have um, if you have a some algorithm means a decision tree follows that if you have entropy equals to zero then you consider that as a leaf node and what is leaf node as a your prediction if your entropy is zero then you consider that as a leaf node if your entropy is one then it needs further splitting or if your entropy is big means uh, your entropy is, um, for binary is generally uh, greater as like this your entropy is generally like this entropy is in between or equals to okay so your entropy will be in in this range so um, uh, some uh, means uh, algorithm follow id3 there is one one algorithm called id3 it's in sub subset of uh, decision tree algorithm so id3 follows if your entropy is zero then you consider or is small then you consider as a root a leaf node if it is one or large entropy then then you then it needs further splitting okay so that's the entropy and i really hope that you understood entropy in detail so let me make you familiar with what what we have seen so far so we have talked about decision tree which you can reverse back to see more but i'm going to uh, re recapitulate the entropy so what do i mean by entropy entropy is the measure of a randomness that measures if your attribute needs for the splitting or it's considered as a root node or it could uh, consider as a leaf node or like that okay so we have taken one example of playing golf and then uh, and then we have taken a, some three scenario where we have seen that it is very hard 
to split it is very hard to split if you have it is it's 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 very hard to um, get you get information if your entropy is high so it needs for the splitting okay so if you if you, if you have yes to be 50 percent no to be 50 percent then entropy two will be one if you have the, another scenario then then it will be like this i um, just see the cal calculation you can see the calculation if you want to be uh, to understand it much better okay so that's what uh, uh, these sudden entropy is but let's see the diagram of entropy visually it's a bit interesting okay it's a bit in interesting so let me draw one diagram of entropy okay so here we have our let me draw one let me draw a good one so here we have zero here we have one okay so i i hope so that i'm i'm not able to draw it but let me try at least okay and the highest entropy is one the highest entropy is one okay is one and this is the diagram of entropy this is the diagram of entropy okay so the highest entropy can be one if you're taking with this equation i have already showed you or proved you so this is an example of entropy okay great so we have seen the entropy which is the measure of a randomness so now let's talk about the another attribute selection measure which is information gain okay we'll talk about information gain uh, let me write it down information gain and i will take an example of I, I will explain you information gain with the help of one data set which is all i have already showed you i thought i will give you a surprise with that but i've already showed you let me show you again so here we have that data set let me show you yeah here is our data set okay let me draw back to like this okay so here is our data set which is play tennis okay um, this is a play tennis data set and what we will do we will i will make you familiar uh, just see this data set and look at this data set i will be looking uh, i have already looked at okay so here you have a play tennis as target variable and you have these features so we will see which feature to use or which feature to not okay so here um, you, you can just see what i'm uh, you have around one two three four five as a no and one two three four five six seven eight nine nine as a yes okay so we will um, you just uh, see see this and now let's come back to information gain to understand first i will give you an overview of what information gain is and then we will dive deep oops where is my inf i don't know why the, my computer is lagging just give me a comment why it is very lagging okay so here is my information gain okay great i hope that everyone is able to see yeah okay great so let's consider you have the data set b okay so you have the data set d like this let me consider this as a data set let me consider d oops wow it's we have a data set which is d and what you do you further divide this data set into your uh, div, uh, for the data sets for the smaller sub sub subsets of this data set and how you will divide the subset of this data set it means that you divide this data set into versions and what versions may be let's take an example of iris data set okay so what you what you do what you do you divide this uh, setosa versicolor and virginica into three data set which concerns setosa versicolor and virginica okay so whatever examples of setosa will come will go in this data set whatever examples of virginica will come will go in this data set whatever will, uh, whatever examples will go versicolor will go in this data set so that's who you what you do you divide your data basis on the number of uh, labels and i'm talking about binary classification classifier for classifier or uh, classification task over here okay so what you do you divide your data set uh, first to divide for dv1 then you divide for dv2 then you divide it for dv3 okay 
the V3 okay and what you do you take out the entropy you take out the entropy of this the V1 you take out the entropy of the V2 then you take out the entropy of the V3 okay and maybe there's this kind of cetosa vercicolor virginica you take out the entropy and then you take out the entropy of your whole data distribution okay before splitting so you take out the entropy before splitting and then you take out the entropy after splitting okay so take out entropy before splitting like this okay after that you you minus it you subtract you subtract your uh, h of d h uh, the function the entropy means previous entropy means previous entropy this entropy h of d which is the entropy before the splitting minus minus let me write it down minus the weighted entropy which is this which is whatever the weighted entropy will come so let's see how we with that having help help of an example what the what i'm talking about uh, this how do you calculate one one example to make it more familiar uh, weighted entropy how do you take out the entropy weighted entropy so you just multiply uh, minus it with the weighted entropy okay after splitting entropy after splitting so let's see how it is done in more detail okay so i've just given you give you what uh, what the formula is you just divide your data into subsets of your data like the div divisions and then you take out the uh, entropy before the splitting and then you take out the entropy after splitting okay so let's see so uh, first let's take out the entropy uh, of division number one of division number one here i'm going to take out uh, entropy of division number one with the help of that play tennis data set okay so oops h of dv1 which is there we have three five means first time writing for uh three means first time writing for yes okay first time writing for yes where we have our where we had divided our data data set into a yes or no so there we are having total of five examples where three examples are yes and two examples are no and out of five okay then the entropy will be 0 0.64 okay but you then again what you do you take out entropy of your division number two you it will be zero and it in the same way you take out the division number for division number three 0 0.97 okay what then what you do you do the you take out the average entropy and that's that's equals to 0 0.64 then that's equals to 0 0.64 and the formula for calculating your weighted entropy is like this just wait for a few seconds the formula for calculating your entropy or weighted entropy is like this let let me write it down first what you do you take out this i think this is it's not 64 it's yeah so i will just multiply with the, the first division number one here we uh, at d1 the norm of d1 divided by d times the entropy of d1 then you what you do you plus d2 the norm of d2 times entropy of d2 plus norm of d3 norm of d3 and this is the division number three data set divided by the norm of d okay and this is your full data this is d is a full data so you take out the size of that full data okay then you again d3 y okay and then this is your weighted entropy that you get after all of this after you've taken out the weighted entropy then that that will be equal to some number and then what you do you subtract you subtract your entropy previous entropy you subtract your entropy before the splitting you subtract your entropy before the splitting minus minus you get after splitting so let me write the formal equation for ig what you get okay so ig ig equals to y and any var means variable maybe variable can be outlook a variable can be outlook or temperature temperature of that from that or windy or humidity 
okay so in that we will check if the if the higher the entropy a high higher the information gain is we can select that as a root node okay so what you do you just you just uh, take the entropy of your data full data and then you pre pre means of your data and then you minus it minus i equals to one all the all the way down to the k the norm of di means the division of your data and this is simply uh, the maybe satosa or then versicolor or yes or no like that so divided by the full full d times the entropy of di okay so this is your weighted entropy this is your weighted weighted entropy and this is your this is your entropy okay before you're splitting and then you will get the information gain for that you for that variable okay so we will see uh, one more example later on when when we will be building our own uh, uh, decision tree by yourself mathematically so again let's recapitulate what we have seen so far we have simply seen we have simply seen so let's uh, go back to that data set let's go back to that data set so where is my data set i don't know actually where yeah here is my data set and here what what we do we take this data set and we simply um, divide this data set into multiple divisions into two divisions okay so we divide this data data set into yes and no okay and whatever number of examples will come we take out let's take an example here we have um, nine over total number of data examples and here we have a five over total number of examples okay so what you do you simply nine by 14 log of 9 by 14 minus 5 by 14 uh, log of 5 by 14 okay then you will get some entropy which is your entropy of your data okay entropy of your data before is splitting okay so that's what the entropy is and i and i hope that you understood what i'm trying to say over here and this is your for yes and this is your for no because you have added a submission of your entropy like this i equals to one all the way down to the k then you have a probability of yi minus the log of means with base two probability of yi okay so that's what we are doing you are doing the same over here but this time you have two so that's why you're doing two and this is only for binary you can see equations for multi-class okay so that's what the um, an inf uh, inf information gain is and here what what we do we take our data and we divide our first we take out the entropy of that data and then we divide our data into multiple divisions and here we have three class of um, ca ca categories so we divide into three categories for two categories you divide into two categories and then take out entropy of that categories and then you sub uh, take out the weighted entropy okay without uh, rather taking of the average you take out the weighted entropy of that uh, after splitting these all you take out the weighted entropy then you subtract and how you take out the weighted entropy here is an equation i'm going to give it to you uh, it's just i have already given but more formally this is the equation for weighted entropy okay so what you do you simply it's the norm of d means no divided by what is the number of a full means here we have number of a no number of a number of no divided by total number of uh, examples times the entropy of that di okay so that's why who you how you take out the weighted entropy so after taking out the weighted entropy you subtract the previous entropy minus the weighted entropy okay so that's what uh, we are doing an in information gain i really hope that you understood information gain okay okay so please um, see if on some blocks if you want uh, either you can ask me in discord server i'll be very happy to help you in the new era you can find the discord server in any new era new video on new era you can find that it and you can join and uh, there is a lot more that you can and also if you want to support please kindly go to new era youtube channel new era youtube channel and please subscribe that youtube channel okay and if you, if you can watch the whole tutorial on new era okay because you are going to get the uh, whole ad free over there okay so uh, now we have seen entropy then we have seen information gain now it's time for uh, talking about uh, guinea impurity guinea impurity okay so this is also the most famous it's a most similar and most famous 
that is used today which is gini impurity gini impurity and it's just equals to it's very very similar to entropy it's a very very similar to entropy let me this is i use things very very similar sign okay <laughs> don't comment it like this just i have just said it like this it's not i using it's just i have it's very very similar to entropy so let me give you one equation uh, the e equation for calculating the guinea impurity so i g and it is not information gain this is a sign for a guinea impurity of y equals to the 1 minus i equals to 1 all the way around to the k and again it is the your y variable not anything it's the y variable again i have already seen y equals to have yes or no mean 2 or it also versus color so unique values in your i times the probability of y i squared okay so that's the that's the thing and again it's if, if, if we take a same scenarios if we how i'm saying it's if, if we take the same scenario as we have taken entropy some scenarios let's take an example of scenario number one scenario number two scenario number one we are your yes we have let's take a let, let's take you have y to be two class category where you have unique values a yes or no okay so uh, what is the probability means what is the number of a yes is 0.5 and with the number of a no 50 percent okay 0 0.5 okay so what will be the gain impurity gain impurity will be 1 minus 0 0.25 is um, 0 0.25 because if you square this because here we are squaring so if you square this and you, again you subtract it again you subtract it minus 20 uh, 0 0.25 0. 25 then you are going to get a 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 is maximum in gain impurity 0 0.5 is maximum in entropy we have one as a maximum if it is this 0 0.5 gain impurity is 0 0.5 then it's needs for this pitting if it is zero then it's not needed if we can consider that as a leaf node okay so that's the scenario that we have already seen and and if it is in in the case of gain impurity our gain impurity in this case where you have 50 percent yes then it that that will be one so we have if you but you may ask here you what is the advantage of gain impurity use uh, rather than using the entropy so it is an alternative to entropy just to increase the computer uh, just to just to make it fast because in gain impurity if you have seen we are just taking uh, h, h of y equals to the minus the summation i equals to one all the way around to the k p of y i minus the log of p of y i so here you can see we are taking a log and taking log takes time okay so as an alternative uh, researchers comes with a very easy and uh, um, under understandable way the one minus and this these are this can be derived these are derived in information theory okay but i'm not going to go in information theory but you can see uh, this is the for uh, gain impurity and this is most used as an alternative to gain impure uh, that entropy gain impurity is most used as an alternative to entropy okay so that's the thing and i hope that you understood gain impurity also so let's uh, let me make you familiar with the diagram so here is the diagram let me make first for um, entropy first here is for entropy so here we have zero here we have one so here this is for entropy we are your maximum is one and this is for obviously some something will differ so but uh, the maximum is 0 0.5 yeah, in gain impurity so yellow one is gain impurity and the white one is entropy okay white one is entropy so i hope that you understood the uh, why why i'm saying but why we use gain impurity because because just and because it is more faster because in we are taking log and that takes time so this more faster than um, entropy okay so that's the whole definition of all decision tree and, I, and then it's, uh, i'm recording till 51 minutes and i hope that you understood all of this i hope that i've written a lot okay so uh, we have learned a lot and i really hope that you understood also okay
So now we will uh, make one uh, decision tree classifier and I will show you uh, the decision tree numerically. Okay, how we do uh, regression task and decision trees. Okay, so first uh, let's let's do in a fast way. I, 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 I do have not a lot of time over here, but I will uh, show you this data set. So here is my data set which I'm going to use. Okay, so first of all what we do we take out the entropy. Okay, we take out the entropy. We take out the entropy of this whole data set. We take out the entropy of this data set H of D. Oops, where is my pen? H of D and simply what what we are doing here we have two y's so here we are taking the entropy of our data distribution d okay so that that will simply equals to 0 0.94 as, as i've told that you have to take out entropy before splitting okay for information gain so we take out the entropy this of this data set as you have around five no five no and nine yes okay okay so in that way you can take it out uh, if, if if I want to make I can simply make like, like this 5 by 14 5 by 14 log of 5 by 14 minus 9 by 14 log of uh, 9 by 14 okay so after you cal calculate you will get this okay so but feel free to correct correct me if, if I do anything wrong in cal calculation okay feel free to cor correct me in the uh, comment box okay in mathematics we do and just doing it fast we just we have to remember the concepts okay so after you calculate the edge of um, uh, entropy of your distribution now what you do you calculate the information gain you calculate you calculate the information gain you calculate the information you calculate the information gain okay how first you calculate the information gain for you calculate the information gain for with for y with respect to outlook variable means we have to check how much information that outlook variable contains okay so in output in outlook here we have outlook variable you can see over here that here we have outlook variable so let me uh, let let me take out so in outlook if you see the y variable we have in sunny in sunny we have two yes and three no's we have two yes and three no's then we have in outcast we have four yes and zero no's okay then in rainy we have two yes and three no's okay so this is their outlook variable and here you have a two yes and three no's four yes zero no's two yes three no's and this is for sunny this is for overcast and this is for rainy and you can see over here okay sunny overcast and rainy okay so this is this you can see that if you take out the entropy of this entropy of this h of d2 d2 h of d2 then you will see that this is equals to zero and you can you can take this as a leaf node and it does not need further splitting okay so you can take this as a leaf node you can take this as a leaf node because this does not need further splitting okay now what you do you take out the entropy of this h of d1 of y okay then you take out this h of d2 d3 y okay so the you have taken this data set large data set okay taken this data set and you split you're taking this feature and split it okay so we have this before spreading and then you what you will do you take out the weighted entropy you take out the weighted entropy weighted entropy weighted entropy which is equal to 0 0.69 okay so what you would for information gain you simply um, subtract 0 0.94 means the previous entropy minus the weighted entropy 0 0.69 okay and weighted entropy i have already shown you pre previously okay and you do the same for uh, temperature you do the same for temperature where, where in temperature you have y in temperature where you have around in you have three classes high mean i think mild let me see high mild and hot high ma, hot mo, mild and cold okay so in hot we have two yes and two no's and here we have in mild we have four yes and two no's and then in coal we have three yes and one no's okay then then you take out the then you take out like this and then you do for humidity then then you, then you do for humidity humidity 
and then you do for a uh, windy okay then you do and it's found that the that the information gain in over outlook is very high okay so what you do you take that in uh, you take that only that uh, outlook as your root node as your root node okay then you, then you take that outlook as a root node then you sub, um, divide this then you divide this so here let me go to one of the one of my favorite uh, decision tree uh, PDF where I, I will just explain you what this is okay so you think take this outlook as a root node then what you do you um, divide this you divide this as, a, as we have divided into sunny overcast and ra rainy sunny overcast and rainy and overcast you can see that we have a entropy equals to zero so it does not need further splitting so we can consider that as a yes means we have four yes so we can consider that as a yes because it's very pure and then it needs further splitting and this also needs further splitting and then at some point they are they also become pure where the entropy equals to zero so or the guinea impurity equals to zero then you consider as a leaf node okay so this is how we make the decision trees and this is how we calculate the information gain this is how we made our decision tree okay okay great now i really hope that you understood decision tree and now it's i i i also enjoy very much when i make these kind of tutorials these kind of tutorials and because it's just amazing just um, helping students to make this uh, understandable things okay okay great now uh, one uh, as, as we have only talked about classification so as regression is not too too much hard also so in regression let me show you what you what 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 we do in regression so let me take one uh, let me go to the cycle learn uh, decision tree decision tree cycle learn i hope that stable yeah here it is so it explains very good it explains very in in, in very good way so let me uh, uh, make you what the what do i mean with this so he, let me take an example of this uh, petal length and petal width so in the same way here you what you do your petal length is more than or equals to 0 for 2 0 2.45 then gain impurity is high then you split it okay here the gain impurity equals to 0 then it does not need for the splitting but it needs for the splitting so it splits that okay so here it seems to be overfitting because if you if you leave the decision tree to be go as to ask as much question then it will overfit then it will overfit so what do you do you either stopped at certain depth you either stop your decision tree at a certain depth to make it more robust to make it more robust or you prune your decision tree by removing some some branches from here okay and you can see the same way that we have seen that we have made the this kind of this kind of decision boundary decision uh, hyperplanes okay great let's see some more oops i use brave as a, as my browser but soon we'll get but soon we'll try something some please make sure that you can put your a comment below if you if i can see okay and regression what what the addition we can apply in regression also so you can see over here that here what what we do let me get back to some good pictures decision uh trees regression regression but i will soon go to documentation to show you uh, more uh, sophisticated oh, I mean, in, in a good way okay so here is my decision tree regression and let's take an example of this as you can see from this also yeah so here is here we have a good example so here you have predictor here you have a target variable okay so here you what you have taken you take an outlook and then you divide into sunny overcast and rainy and sunny needs for this fitting but overcast does not okay so most of the time you average it and then you take a 46.3 okay and then you split it again you what you what you do is split it if it, uh, you take out the average again i'm saying you take out the average okay that's what you're doing and again if you if i go further into this it is very well explained it is very well explained you can go to this it's very well explained but yeah it's only for regression but it's so much of um, but what what we do we simply again the whole the things are same for attribute selection measure you simply uh, you can sunny overcast and rainy overcast over, over here is we have four um, this is your leaf this is your concept this is a so pure so that's what's considered as a leaf and then what you do you take out the average like this you take out the average and then you take out the 39.8 
46.3 over here after taking out average then you split your sunny into false or true then if it is false then your outward output will be 47.7 and if it is true then it is 26.5 and the same way you do the regression okay so i hope that you understood and you can go again to understand it more detail so so what you what you do you take out the hours played and our average standard deviation average and hours played and then you count it and then you simply uh, do some cal calculation and that's not too much hard okay great so we have seen so far about a decision uh, trees regression and i really hope that you understood this also okay so you can go to this node uh, this tree uh, this website sadeyasad.com decision tree regress reg you will be able to understand that but it's more important to understand attribute selection measure because people usually confuse us at this and we have taken lots of examples for this okay okay great so now what we will do we will uh, i will show you i will show you some i will show you the documentation the implementation the implementation for decision tree i will show you the implementation of decision tree regressor and decision tree classifier okay so that you can know because it's very important to learn from implementation okay so i will explain you in more intuitive way so let me open my ink to go i hope that i'm not i'm just using it uh, let me see if this works for not for, for me or not okay okay great let me choose this pen yeah so uh, here you can go to this website this table.com and here you will be able to find more uh, you can go to cyclelearn.org and documentation of this classifier okay so here again it should the, what is the criteria to choose the uh, attribute here we have guinea and here we have entropy okay so you guinea is a default you can choose entropy also okay the quality of a split supported criteria is guinea and the entropy is for the info and the for the information gain after splitter a splitter means do you want to choose the best splitter or random splitter okay best means it will choose the best random means any ran randomly okay max step this is very important hyperparameter which you can tune it using grid search cv using grid search cv or a randomized search randomized search okay you can tune it okay so that's what you will do and what you do you just you just um, make your decision to if you do not make then it will overfit or then then your decision tree will overfit okay so the maximum depth of the tree okay if it is default as none okay um, if you do it will learn a lot it will make a lot of decision bound it will learn a lot until and unless its leaves are pure okay so it will learn a lot so that's why it will overfit so this is a very important hyperparameter then again you have a minimum sample split means here the default is two again you have to tune it again you have to tune it the minimum number of uh, samples required to split an internal node okay an internal node is just a um, that know the minimum number of splits that require okay this is two but you need to be uh, very cautious into this okay then we have minimum sample split then we have minimum samples leaf and then the minimum number of samples required to be at a leaf node okay so what is the minimum number of samples required to be at leaf node again it's one but you can also tune it but it's not that but it's very uh, uh, good to tune it using grid search cv then we have a minimum weight fraction leaf then we have a, what is the max features means uh, the number of features to consider when looking for the best way for a larger number of features then you can consider as an uh, the default is none but you can use this but it, it 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 also has some disadvantages okay okay then we have a random state control the randomness of your estimator again it's uh, you can read some more details on ran random state uh, max max leaf node the grow of a tree in a best first fashion uh, it is a default none it's just like a max leaf node or the minimum purity decrease the node will is will be split if the split induces dec induces a decrease for the impurity greater than or equals to this value but i've not used it uh, if i say very much right it's just a limitation that, that you can make to prevent overfitting 
okay i think this is deprecated then you have a class weight what is the a default is none always then you have alpha non-negative value so that, that that's the basic intuition okay so we had talked about this and then you can see some examples and then there is something called as uh, um, let me show you uh, you can also use this as a understanding the return tree structure so i will just show you one example of this okay so here you can use the graphist tool here you can use the graphist tool to plot your decision tree like this here uh, you can he, he has your tree dot plot tree it is plotting the tree like this okay you, it, because decision tree has one more is advantage it, it, it is easy to interpret okay so that's the basic intuition behind decision tree okay so let's go to decision tree regression okay so let me see where is regression okay let me see one more great where is decision tree regressor here it is okay so in decision tree regressor it can be used for this um, uh, this is uh, for regression task also so here uh, you have to choose certain criteria the function to measure here we are not using any entropy here we are using the quality of your split you can use mean square error means how how much it how much it differs okay so a mean square error, error or mean absolute error or poison so you can see a prime friedman msc but most uses msc or mae or rmse okay a splitter again it's best uh, again the same thing max depth obvious to control your depth to prevent overfilling this is an important hyperparameter again i'm saying this is a very very important vvi this is also a very very important to attune okay then you have minimum sample leaf and then you have the same as we have discussed okay and then you can see some examples of decision tree like this how we make and then there are certain methods like plot or etc then you have uh, some 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 examples which you can see from here and this is usually uh, you can use we will talk about ada boost also later on okay so you can see some visualization in the, this library and this entry is used to fit the curve with addition noise or observation and it's just controlled by the depth of that map by the max depth and the blue line considers the two and the max depth to be five if you take then it will perform very very well on training set but bad on testing set if you do not control your max depth okay so we have talked a lot on decision trees and i really hope that you understood decision tree and that okay so in the next section the reason why i've taken this too long to make you understand decision tree because it's very very important concept to understand and uh, and i think it's very very important okay so you can have a look if you want onto this notes okay but uh, you can you can ping me on discord or linkedin i will very happy to give you these notes if you're not able to write either i will recommend you to write these things okay i will i will just you can ask me to make this all wrong okay so that's it for this video uh, for this section so sorry uh, for this section and i my throat is also so much paining but yeah uh, that's it for that's it for this section and in the next section we will start with ensemble learning and again then we will go to unsupervised learning then we'll talk a little bit on neural networks and then we will end up this course and you will be having enough understanding of machine learning to get a start in making projects in machine learning and getting a job or internship but you have to do a lot of practice okay so uh, you can do that okay great so thank you for this seeing this section and again if you have any kind of question you can ask me to the new era be sure to subscribe if you wanted to support this content uh, okay so let's meet at the next section till then bye bye okay so now we'll talk about ensemble learning one of my favorite topic to teach and to use in my professional experience so um, why why i think ensemble learning is one of the best uh, for kaggle competitions for kaggle competitions ensemble learning uh, methods or techniques are most popular 99% of the kaggle winners use some kind of ensemble learning techniques so that's why uh, i think that ensemble learning is a must know technique it does not involve lot of mathematics but it do involves only techniques concepts and a little bit more uh, maths okay but in decision tree we involve some mathematics but here we do not involve a lot of mathematics we require a little bit of mathematics 
but there are a lot of techniques and concepts that we need and approaches that a particular Kaggle governor gives. Okay, so it's very, um, we will deep dive in ensemble learning covering the four tech, three techniques, I think the three techniques of ensemble learning. The first technique will be a bagging, which we'll talk about. Um, not it will will be in a separate section subsections okay so this is our main section and in the separate subsection we will talk about bagging then we will talk about uh, boosting then we will talk about stacking okay so these are the three techniques that we will talk about in ensemble learning and also we will see the implementation of each one of them and it and I will also show you some of the Kaggle competition winners approach or we will make one model uh, seeing the changes what changes they uh, bring into your system how the your model accuracy increases okay okay so great but before that let's a uh, little bit uh, let me just forget about the ensemble learning let me recall you some concept which is high variance uh, concept okay so high variance and high bias concept so it it should make sense to you so let's recall in high variance we have a uh, overfitting model we have our overfitting model if i'm if i'm correct in high variance we have our overfitting model and in high bias we have our underfitting model okay so our models should be low bias and low variance low variance model if you have a high variance if you have a high variance then you have then your model is overfitting if you have a, a high bias then your model is underfitting and uh, that's that's what the recollection that, that that we need for this ensemble learning just to uh, make sure that that we are on the same path okay okay so Let's start with an, a simple example of, um, of a small example, okay? So, if you have played some quiz, okay? If you have played some quiz, let's, let's take an example that we have played some quiz of uh, maybe in Kahoot or any, any kind of quiz or if you are in competition, you have played some quiz. So, it's a maximum, percent, a maximum percentage that the uh, let's take an example that we have some question let's we have some question we have some question here and we have some option which is a b and c okay so let's let's take an example that the particular that the majority let's take an example a is a correct answer so uh, it it is it is very obvious that majority of the students will go with a and if the majority is on a then it's likely to be a be the correct answer and it's actually the correct answer okay so it's like whatever the majority will say we will go with that okay here majority is saying a and in this case a is a correct answer and if you think about the majority is more accurate than one majority is more accurate than one and in some exceptional conditions that can be different but in 99 percent the majority will win okay majority will win uh, if you have seen some quiz okay so if you see that the option has got the highest majority and who are also into that then you can think that is a correct answer so in the same way ensemble learning works Ensemble learning is an ensemble of models, is an ensemble of models, okay? So let's take one more example to get more feel. Let's take an example that uh, some election is happening, some election is happening, some election is happening. And in that election, in that election, uh, let's take an example that why we do not take only one person vote and select any prime minister or president. Why we take the majority, the majority of votes which will go on to that party, that will win, okay? So the majority will make a right decision, okay? Will, will, uh, will make a right decision in most cases, okay? So that's what the ensemble learning also says. Ensemble learning has an ensemble of models. So let's t uh, let me say, let me tell you uh, uh, what, what we do in ensemble learning. We have a model 1, model 2, all the way down to the model K, okay? So let me make you make this, that it is visible, yeah. Okay, so you have these kind of models and you train your model, you train your model, you train your model onto your data, 
okay you train your model onto your data and you can you take predictions from each of the model so let's take an example that you are training you are making a um, a diabetes prediction system diabetes prediction system so your outcome will be either zero means non diabetes or one okay so let's take an example that model number 1 says it's a, it's a zero model number 2 says it's a zero model number 3 says it's a zero model number 4 says it's a one and model number 5 says it's a zero so the the then what what we have a one more model a big model which which what it will do it will check the majority of votes and here the majority is zero and only one has given one and the majority of zero so we will give our prediction as a zero okay so we will see how it is trained later on but here what the actual thing is what is happening we train our model and each model is giving predictions and in each predictions we are taking into classification we are taking in class classification we are taking majority of votes it means majority means m1 is saying is zero m2 is saying zero the frequency of zero is more than the frequency of one okay so that's why our final prediction which is y hat is equals to zero okay and is more it will be it will be high chance that if one model predicts if one model predicts it's a one or zero Uh, and the same sample of a model predicts a zero, then uh, they are more accurate rather than this. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the basic overview of ensemble learning. And you may think here, yeah, use in classification, we choose the majority of votes. But what about regression? What about regression? What about regression problems? In regression problems, what we do, we take out the mean or a median. Uh, um, of var of uh, out output it from each model so let's take an example that your model m1 given some uh, prediction which is regression value 2.4 model 2 given 2.6 model 3 given 2.5 so what you do the final prediction will be the average of these outputs the average or mean or a median of these outputs okay so that's what that's how we do in regression the we do, we do not take the majority we take the mean or a median of the output from the base models and these are called the base models over here okay so these are called the base models in ensemble learning okay so don't be confused what is base model base models are the ensemble of models that are being trained so, uh, and Okay, so that's that's the basic intuition behind our uh, ensemble learning, and I really hope that you understood ensemble learning in depth. Okay, so um, just want to make sure that what how we train, uh, what are the some of the techniques used in this um, used in bagging? What means? What are the techniques used in ensemble learning? So we have a techniques like bagging, then we have a boosting, then we have a stacking. Okay. these are and one one more which is cascading which is which which you can learn which is not yet in the industry yet but yeah one with just cascading which we will uh, see if we want otherwise it's not necessary okay so in bagging we will see one algorithm which is a random forest which is which is something called as a random forest okay which is just a ensemble of uh, decision trees and then in boosting we will more properly focus on uh, we will in boosting we will more properly focus on gradient boosting we will more properly focus on gradient boosting and we will focus on adaptive boosting which is just a advanced uh, of version of gradient boosting we will focus on adaptive boosting then we will see one kaggle winner which is xg boost okay so we will see these algorithms or these uh, techniques same as boosting then in stacking we will see ml extend library how we do this stacking and what's the intuitive understanding and you can see there is no any any kind of math this is only the concepts okay so that's how um, that's what we are going to see and the study motivation for this for ensemble learning why do we study ensemble learning has a great reason behind them the reason being why do we study this is the great question to ask whenever you do any kind of thing why let me use this good color why do we study i think that is not visible in most of the cases let me stick to white okay so why do we study 
and we study disassemble learning. The reason being is most of the Kaggle competitions, most of the Kaggle competition winners, most of the Kaggle competition winners, competition winners uses some kind of ensemble learning. Either they use bagging, either they use boosting, either they use stacking, either they use cascading. They use some kind of ensemble learning techniques if it is a machine learning problem. If it is a machine learning problem, ML problem. Okay? Okay? Just think that machine learning has also a power. Okay? So, but there is a difference in, in, in internet companies like Amazon, Google, they also use these algorithms, XGBoost, Adaboost, Gradient Boosting, that we have a random forest in their own uh, products of input production, okay? So, um, Cora uses random forest to, uh, for uh, quotient matching, okay? So, they, they also use machine learning, these kind of algorithms, and these are very, very powerful algorithms. A uh, very powerful algorithm, which is often used in industry also, which is often used in many kind of Kaggle competitions. And around 99% of the Kaggle competition winners are uses this kind of, uh, um, any kind of ensemble learning. Either if it is a machine learning problem. In deep learning problem, you'll obviously go with it. If it is an image problem, you'll go with CNN. If it is a um, text text you will go with some word embeddings and then you can use any of the techniques and you can use R and N. So it depends. So you can use any, any of the technique if you want but in most of the Kaggle competition in the past we have seen that uh, they are the winners if they use them. Okay. So you can see the case studies if you want in detail. Okay. Great. So we have talked about ensemble learning and in this section and now we will start a subsection which is bagging. Okay, we will start a subsection which is bagging, which we will dip dive into the bagging. Okay, so it's also called the bootstrap aggregation or bootstrap aggregated. Okay, so we will see uh, later, just in a second. Okay, so just to recall, ensemble learning is a base is an ensemble of base models. It can be logistic regression. It can be naive based. It can be supported with the machine. Okay, it's a classification algorithm. Whatever the majority of votes will be, it will take the majority of votes and then gives you a Y hat. Okay, so that's how it, it works. Okay. So um, let's let's and in regression we take out the mean or median of your values. Great. Now we'll start a subsection. Now we'll start a subsection, which is something called as bagging. Subsection, which is called as bagging. Okay. So in bagging, so in bagging, uh, it's again ensemble learning technique. And sometimes it's called bootstrap aggregation. And from bootstrap, we deserve, we derive the word which is backing like this: bootstrap, bootstrap aggregation, aggregation. Okay, I think I'm my spelling is a little bit wrong, but uh, just bear with me. Bagging. Okay, so that's what the um, from the de derived word from bootstrap aggregation, just in short. Okay, okay, great. So. It's a statistics term. If you heard about bootstrap aggregation, means it's a it's a statistics term. If you can relate with your statistics and probability classes, it's a statistics term. So let's see the geometric intuition. Okay, let's see the basic overview or intuition behind bagging. Intuition behind bagging. Intuition behind bagging. So what we do in bagging? So let's take an example that you have a data set, that we have a data set D, okay? You have a training data, which is D. So you have a data, so you have a data like this, and what you have done, you divide your data, 80% for training and 20% for testing, okay? So now what you do, just, just to make sure that you are on the same page on the divisation of your data also, okay? So you take your training data, you take your training data, and your data is just, um, you take your training data like this, and it's tra your training is a supervised learning algorithm. So um, you have xi and yi, so you have your xi with your label yi for all i 
one i equals to one all the way around to the m and m we are is the length of your training examples okay so this is your data this is your training data this is your training data now what you do you sample some points let's take a sample k point or i uh, let's take an example that you sample k points from this data set you sample you sample k points with the replacement with the replacement you sample k points with the replacement from this data and you feed this to this model which is uh, let's uh, now you got d1 which is d1 okay so you have sampled the subset of sub, subset of a data from this large data set okay sample k points you sample k points and now what you do you train your model using this subset of a data you train your model using this subset of a data and now you got your model as an m1 okay this is your m1 model okay but you may think here yeah, you can you repeat it again it's all goes uh, all gone above your head no worries again i'm explaining it's, it's usually gone okay so what you do so i'm highlighting uh, in uh, white so what you do you take your training data which is the which is a supervised learning problem where you have a labels now you take out the samples with a replacement samples with a replacement and what do i mean by sample with a replacement i will talk about just in after i make another sample okay so as of now just uh, just to understand we take out some sample with a replacement around the k points we sample k points or m points and um, sam we sample some points um, or we take out a sample of a data from this let's take an example this this amount of data from this uh, this amount of data means any random data means uh, uh, we have to, this is a hyperparameter we have to choose the number of samples from this data and then we and then we call it as d dash one okay then we feed to the model means we train the model onto this data okay then what we do we again take out the sample we again take out the sample we again take out the sample k points with the replacement sample k points with replacement and what do i mean if your data is here if your data is here means if your data is here then it can be also here then it can be also here it is it is not necessary that your data should be different it can be same it is some data can be same here and here also okay so that's the sampling with replacement okay now you samples uh, again the random data and it's not necessary that your data should be different from the d1 it can some data points can be included okay so you again sample k points and the, and here you have a sample of a data from the large data and then you train your model onto this data m2 okay you train your model onto this m2 now again what you do you take out the sample you take out the sample you take out the sample k points you do it for your number of um, base models means um, the num number of times so if this this is also have a parameter okay how much you want to sample until you have your data points till k okay till k till k dash okay and then you train your model till k m k and then what you do you have your k models now you aggregate this into a large model you aggregate this into a large model okay m large m okay and in case of classification the majority of votes the majority of votes um, will go uh, as a list let's take an example of ensemble learning that we have seen that let's take an example of diabetes and prediction okay so if m1 gives zero m2 gives zero and m3 gives zero and m4 gives uh, let's take an example one so the majority is zero so the majority of votes will lead to the final prediction by half okay in case of classification we take out the majority in case of regression we take out the mean or a median okay so that's the basic intuition behind in uh, bagging and i really hope that you understood okay so let me explain it again those who have not understood please pause this video if you can because many students are still here that are not under that may not understand this i can have to uh, recapitulate or give a summary of this okay great 
So here, what we do, we have a large training data set, which is D. Now what we do, we sample our data, sample K points from that data. We sample K points from the large training data. And let's take any sample, sample, uh, sample of our data. And then we train our model on the sample, which is M1. It can be largest regression, okay? Now we sample again K points with replacement and also it is with replacement. So it is not necessary that your data should be different from the D1. It can be same or it can be some data points can be same and then you again train. So let's take example you train support with the machine. Let's take example you train uh, nine days. Okay. So you train and the majority of votes is like ensemble learning. Okay. So that's what your backing is intuitively and you can see that we are not involving any mathematics. Yeah, yeah, this is just a bunch of concepts. Okay, so um, just I will make sure that you all are on the same page that what it helps. It is a great, great question. It helps you in reducing the variance. Bagging, let, let me write bagging, bagging helps you bagging helps you in reducing the variance it's we will discuss uh, 10 minutes on to this also okay yeah okay so bagging helps in reducing the variance okay but before that there is one term that i want to highlight over here that here we have our all base models. These are our base models M1, M2, and all the way up to MK. These are our base models. These base models are usually high variance model. These are usually high variance with a low bias model. With low bias model. And what do I mean by this? It is usually we do not do lot of fine tuning. We do not do lot of fine tuning, so that's why it is just overfitting. And we had done overfitting, so that's why it is good on training data. So that's why it is not underfitting. Okay, so we have our the base models are high variance and low bias model. So we do not do lots of fine tuning. Just we do a simple uh, let's say in random for it to just initialize with this. And with no no number of depth. Okay, it can go as much as we can. So it is overfitting. Okay, so here we have high variance model and low bias. So what it helps, what it helps, backing helps in reducing your variance. How it helps in reducing your variance from making your model more robust. Okay, this is just a, what it does is combines them. So you have a low bias, low bias, high variance model. Now if you combine them, if you combine the majority of votes, then obviously we'll get a good amount of uh, good uh, good output or a, a correct output okay so you combine the models you combine base models you combine base models and then you get you then then you get low bias and low variance problem low variance okay so this is what you get this is what you get after doing backing and this helps this helps in reducing your variance and this is very good and this is very good okay so there is some uh, there is some i want to highlight over here that here we are doing the row sampling so just understand that this is a point that bagging helps in reducing your variance because usually your base learners or base models have high variance and low bias the bias and variance of that trade of that is high variance and low bias models so what you do you combine them uh, combine the base models with a lot into a large model and then you get a low bias and low variance models low low bias and low variance m which is a large model okay so that's the that's the different uh, now i i think that you understood why we call it as it reduces variance okay so here okay so here um what how we sample our data how we sample our data okay how we sample this is a great uh, topic to talk on how we sample our data okay so here we are doing a row sampling we are doing a row sampling we are not doing column sampling we are doing a row sampling so let me write it down 
while sampling while sampling our data from the large distribution of a data so let's take an example this, this is my large data in screening data now while sampling what we do we have this we do the row sampling we do the row sampling row sampling while sampling our data okay so let's take an example that we have the columns the columns and m are rows okay so we have this we have d columns and we have m rows okay so we sample only rows in bagging we sample only rows in bagging okay so it can be like it can it can be go to d1 okay only rows in bagging okay so that's what we do in uh, like a row sampling okay so we'll see in random forest we also do the column sampling plus column sampling okay and random forest we do this we do this but in bagging we do not do the column sampling we only do the row sampling so i hope that you understood the bagging also okay it's also called the bootstrap aggregation first you bootstrap and then you aggregate your base models okay so that's why the name it as a uh, bootstrap aggregation okay so just to make sure that you all understood so i'm just recapitulating the subsection as you can reverse the video to know about ensemble learning because I don't want to uh, just spend my time on that okay so here um, just to uh, just want to make sure that here you have your training data here you let me see here here you have a training data which is you have a training data and then what you have done you take out the sample endpoints with the replacement okay into your data subset of the data and then you train your model m1 which is your base model it can register linear okay then you again sample k points in d2 then you again train your model onto these subset of the data you do for k you do for k models or k subsets and then you combine the majority of votes my majority of vote will lead to classification and and if you use regression problem we take out a mean or median of a most output from the models base models okay so that's the intuition behind bagging and it helps in reducing your variance it helps in reducing your variance because your more base models are usually high variance and low bias model so it combines the base models to bring up low bias and low variance model that's actually good okay so and and in bagging we do the row sampling we do the row sampling means we we have a d features and we have m column m rows so we do sample of our m not d okay so we take whole column we take all the columns okay but we take subset of a rows for training okay so that's what we do in uh, bagging and i really hope that you understood this bagging technique now it's time for learning what al one algorithm what one good algorithm one powerful one kaggle winning algorithm one pr production level algorithm which is random forest okay why i think random forest is a very very powerful algorithm to work on is a very very powerful algorithm to work on let me write a random random forests okay random forest it's a bagging algorithm it's a bagging technique or you can call bagging algorithm okay so why do i call this uh, very powerful because in also my professional experience i think that i have also used a random forest a lot and it's it seems like it's this very powerful algorithm whether you want to build a kind competitions and which is a machine learning problem or you want to make a production level machine learning okay so random forest usually used by quora then we have google amazon they they all use this random forest but it has some a basic intuition or basic concept that instructors are not teaching and it's very very important okay so first of all what we do in random forest so let's recall our decision trees let's recall our decision trees into this now our now our decision tree will play a role now here we have a decision tree so let's recall our decision tree so what we are doing in decision tree uh, we are doing on it is a simple it makes a decision and splits your node okay so what we are doing it's a simple if and uh, a nested if and else statements nested if and else statements nested if and else statements so we take if the sepal length is smaller than parallel length then you take a y equals to one like this okay this is a nested if and else statement it's just ask a question 
is just ask a question is just ask a question to the node and then splits the node and then it splits the node okay so you can the reverse stuff for the section of decision tree we have some attribute selection measure like entropy then we have uh, information gain information gain then we have a guinea impurity which we have seen in detail in one hour of section of decision tree and i hope that you enjoyed that also okay so that's the decision tree okay so what is random forest random forest random forest is a combination of decision trees dt plus bagging plus bagging plus feature bagging plus feature bagging or we call it as a column sampling column sampling okay so what do i mean with this let's understand this step by step so it's it makes sense to you also okay so what we do in random forest we have our decision trees okay so you know about decision trees so we have um, there's a 500 decision tree okay so random forest is an assembly learning algorithm so we have a lot of base models means decision trees lots of base models so here we have a large distribution of a data okay and here we sample our data d1 and we train a decision tree onto this data okay did this decision tree then we sample d2 with the replacement then we train our data decision tree onto this subset okay so you are not using different algorithm you are using only decision trees okay with the row sampling with bagging here we are doing bagging means the sa sample sampling with the replacement means here we are doing a row sampling okay plus in bagging we are doing row sampling row sampling and aggregating your model means whatever the majority of votes you will aggregate your model okay so you are doing the row sampling plus the column sampling also okay so here in this uh, in a bagging we are only doing the row sampling we are taking whole column whole features but you are not take, but you are only taking the rows okay as a subset but here we are taking we are doing also the column sampling okay so let's un understand what do i mean by column sampling or feature bagging okay so the column sampling means column sampling means that you have this your data you have this your data like this you have this your data okay now you have d features you have your d features d features d columns like a b c d and you have m rows m rows okay we have m rows okay so what you do you for replacement you take any rows you for for sampling you take your rows random rows let's take an example you took this row this row okay this row and, and you took a and b as your column and then you train onto this you are not taken full columns or features you have taken this a and b and then they train and then the next you you took c and d okay you took c and d okay and then you train with one one, one row just an example you train decision tree so they are different they are different and if they are different it's much higher chance that your model will be very very good okay and sample learning if your model is different then this is then it's very very good okay okay great so that's the that's the random forest okay so we have a large number of decision tree in sense base learners as a base learners that are trained using a bagging technique means it's uh, sampling row sa with row sampling plus column sampling okay with row sampling plus column sampling which is column sampling also called the feature bagging okay train different decision trees and then you in majority of votes and and then in cl classification you take the majority or in regression you take the mean or a median of the outputs from the base models okay so that's what you do in this so that's what you do in uh, this uh, a random forest and i hope that you understood okay so um, let's understand it uh, more intuitively uh, that there is something called as oob it is something called as oob out of bag points out of bag and this is called in back points so this, uh, something called as out of back point. So let me not recall this concept just now. So let's let's take an example. Let's take an example. So that what you have done, you have this DN, you have this uh, you have this large uh, large training set set which is D. Okay, which is D. Okay. So what you do? Let's take an example that you've taken this sample of a data as a D one. 
and the rest of the data is called the out of back points is called the out of back points so what you do you subtract means the train data minus the di and i is the sample so these are called the left points after the sampling which is out of bag is uh, points okay out of bag out of bag points okay and this 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 can be used for cross validation for evaluating your model okay so if you set om cycle learn there is a very good library which is cycle learn if you set oob score to oob score to true if you set oob score to true then it will uh, give you the oob score also okay so that's the basic op out of bag um, points and i hope that you understood um, out of oob um, points okay so now let's uh, let's recapitulate our bagging and random forest what we have seen in random forest and bagging okay so in bagging we have seen that we have our data we have our data d we have our data d okay what you do you take out a sample you sample with replacement d1 okay then you train your model onto this subset m1 when you again do d2 then you train your model onto d2 and you, what you are doing you are doing is sampling with row sampling plus column sampling with the replacement okay and d3 d3 then you getting your model d3 getting your model m2 m3 okay so the majority of vote majority will go and a large model means you just aggregate your model aggregate your model and then you get your final prediction which is y hat okay this is the whole pipeline so in in bagging you only do the row sampling and random forest you you do with column sampling as well as you only take decision trees as your base models okay so in in bagging you choose different different kind of models but in decision tree and random forest you take your uh, decision tree as your base models and decision tree are trained on different different data okay so that's the basic um, intuition behind the random forest and i hope that you understood also about what is com column sampling or what you, what is feature bagging okay and obviously this also helps in reducing your uh, variance as this is a bagging technique so obviously it will help you to reduce your variance okay so that's the basic intuition behind random forest so let's see the runtime uh, train train and runtime complexity of this because if you if you, it is very uh, uh, it's it's very required to trade talk about train and runtime complexity of this uh, random forest okay so in decision trees in decision trees uh, the train complexity the uh, the train complexity in decision trees the train complexity let me let me write in dt the train complexity is order of n log n n log n times d okay times d times uh, yeah so it is a uh, in decision tree we have n log n so in random forest we have d number of decision trees times k number of samples okay k number of uh, models so that's the that's your model that's the uh, train and run time for tra train uh, training complexity of your random forest and the decision tree is just a n log n okay so that's the and d here is the number of this case the number of the models okay so uh, it it makes sense also if you take an example of your d as a large data set okay let's take an example that you have a d okay now you take out a sample with a replacement with row sampling plus column sampling with like feature bagging okay you take out a subset and then you train your model like m1 then you again do the d2 then you take out m2 so here the, all the way around the mk here you have a k models and then you have a d uh, d decision trees okay so and also this is a trained uh, a trivially parallelized it's a trivially parallelized what do i mean you can train this model onto parallelly okay you can train the model you cannot you you can train this parallelly okay you can take out a subset you train d1 parallelly d2 parallelly d3 parallelly so this is a trivially parallelized 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 i think i'm pronouncing it correct okay so this is a trivially parallelized i can do tri trivially parallelized also okay so that's the decision. Uh, sorry, I train and run to run run time complexity of random forest. 
and I hope that we have talked a lot in short span of time, and I hope that you're enjoying this video or section also, and and I hope that you are enjoying a lot. Okay. So there is one more concept that I will um, talk on and end this video, which is sorry, this section, which is extremely a uh, randomized trees. Okay. Uh, extremely uh, randomized trees. So what we do in extremely randomized trees is very become pro popular after the cycle and releases its uh, this uh, API, which is something called as extremely, extremely randomized, randomized trees. Okay, trees. So what is this? This is in random forest. We are doing a column sampling plus row sampling with bagging okay with bootstrap aggregation with bootstrap aggregation which is bagging okay so in uh, ran random forest and rf we are doing like this so in extreme trees uh, in extreme trees we try out the possible values of um, fi to determine the threshold means the decision trees and decision trees let's take an example that in decision trees we uh, we have we have some epsilon and its checks is greater than or equals like that for identifying in uh, decision tree we are trying out every value and that is that is time come that is that is taking time that is taking time okay so uh, what we can do instead of trying out every values we sample we sample some subset of column some sub subset of rows we some subset of rows and check with that and. Uh, choose the threshold according to that because in, in random forest we have a lot of decision trees and identifying the threshold is a key over there okay so it's, if you if you take all possible values then in that will be computationally time complex time taking so what you do you try out the sample of values from that whole column okay so then you try and that's called the extremely randomized trees okay so that's what i want to talk about extremely randomized trees just to make sure that we are on the same pace that what what we were doing in random forest we have a lot we have decision trees we have column and row sampling okay okay and that reduces the bio variance okay so here um, in, in random forest we are trying out every in, in random forest we have decision trees and we are trying out every possible values and we are uh, for for that epsilon so for uh, not for, for it's time time taking. So what we do, we take out the sample of values from that column and as a as a sample, and then we check that for that epsilon to for getting that epsilon. Okay. So if you're a little bit getting confused, don't worry. It's not a popular popular algorithm which is extremely randomized classifier or regressor. It is not a popular algorithm. The reason being. If you take out a sample, there is a lot more less chance that your model is good uh, as compared to random forest. So we uh, we rarely use I rarely use this extremely randomized forest. This is popular for them. This as a popular lab, popular algorithm. Okay. So we have talked a lot. I think that we have talked a lot onto this. Now I hope that you understood bagging. Uh, then we have understood ran random forest. Then we have understood some decision tree and then we have understood the ensemble learning. Now we have talked about bagging. Okay. Now in the next section, subsection um, point, uh, point two, we will talk about uh, boosting. Okay. And boosting will talk about gradient, adaptive, XG. Okay. So we will talk about three algorithms. Here we have talked about a random forest and extremely randomized uh, trees. So there we will talk about three, which is gradient, adaptive and XG boost. And a gradient boosting is also called G B D T. G B D T means gradient boosting decision trees because they also use decision tree as their base models. Only decision tree as a base models. But what are the some of the disadvantages of random forest? The some of the disadvantages of random forest that it is very you it is very um, it is very bad choice to use to use a, a random forest or decision trees on large data set. Okay, so you don't because it's very time complex between taking. Okay, so don't use that kind of. But you can obviously try it out at least. Okay, you can see some more assumption on the internet for this. Okay, great. So now we have talked about everything. Now it's time for getting into the implementation part of random forests. Okay, 
we will talk about random forest and decision trees okay either we i think that we have talked about decision trees so we'll talk about a random forest okay on psyche learn a, a, a library okay so let's uh, let's see the implementation okay so i'm on my brave okay so here i will write i started using brave in some uh, just uh, just a days ago just some some days ago so here what i will what i will write i will write a random forest a random forest uh, cycle map okay and we will see one project we will see one project uh, which will be doing all of this implementation with grid search cv fine tuning the hyperparameters okay so we'll, let's uh, let's deep dive into this let's under understand this concept let's see the implementation a very finest explanation of a random forest are here so let me take out my ink to go again because i it's my 12 days left until the uh, license expires okay so here i'm i will take my pen i will take medium i will take a red color yeah so you can go to this api which is sk learn ensemble you can also import by just calling uh, from sk learn from sk learn dot ensemble from sk learn dot ensemble you can go with this and then you can uh, use this api so the first um, you, you now you can use the random forest classifier this is the first parameter is n estimators the first parameter is n estimators n estimators is the number of a decision trees that you want okay like then what is the number of a base models that you want what is the number of a base models that you want so you have this data and you take this sample this data so what is the number of so you so here we usually take 100 decision tree as a default okay but also this is a very important type of parameter so you fine tune it using a grid search cv or randomized search okay we will see its implementation of these two okay so you can use uh, this is the number of decision trees after you have what is the criteria what is the criteria to use in a decision tree what is the attribute selection criteria so the default is gain impurity as the best impurity either you can use entropy but it's computation a little bit expensive means a time time taking okay so again the default is gain impurity is now uh, the what is the number of a depth of your tree the minimum number of a sample required to split and sorry the maximum depth of the tree to stop okay then the nodes will expand means if it is none then it will uh, it, it it has a high chance that will, it will overfill okay now it is also hyperparameter minimum sample is split with number of a samples required to split an internal node means what is the minimum number of a samples to split okay samples means what is the number of uh, data points okay then you have let me delete this again then you have uh oops where is my pen then you have minimum sample of leaf which is which we have already seen max features means what is the you want uh, auto or a square root or log you can read the documentation impurity then a uh, bootstrap bootstrap obviously equals to true it involves bagging with the row sampling with the column sampling ob score which is out of bag data points which is out of the bag after sampling okay which is false and jobs if you take this and jobs equals to minus one if you take this and jobs equals to minus one then it will obviously understand your course and then it will run parallelly okay it will, it will run this will be parallelly it is fast if you take and jobs equals to minus one usually people take okay but both it's i think it's it's for printing out something texts okay now um, you can see the class weight let me see i've also forgotten about class weight let me see class weight is yeah verbosity when filling and predicting class weight is just the uh, weight associated with the class okay so it is obviously in the default is a none but you can see how it is calculated okay it's not max samples it bootstrap equals to what is the number of a max samples if you set it in a none then the default is the x dot shape zero the number of the samples 
so you can set some max samples okay so you have some attributes base estimator the child tend to use to create the collection of fitness sub estimators then you have a number of classes here number of features the number of fit uh, number of outputs when it fit is performed the feature importance it is also you can use feature importance uh, this attribute to uh, understand what is the number of uh, feature means what is the f importance of your each feature in your model in columns ob score if it's obviously it will give you the in the float value okay so that's the decision tree uh, sorry random forest and you can see more about this into uh, here and you can read read about attributes and this is how the this is how the featured importance looks like means you can also plot it like this you can also plot it to so which feature and you, and you can use it for feature selection okay great let's see the second one is a random forest regressor let me see yeah there i am under the same path okay so let's see again it's very similar to classifier it's very similar to classifier here here we have an estimator which is number let me oops i don't know why it is very bad here we have number of estimators criteria to be msc rmsc mae okay max step max step minimum sample width bootstrap equals to true obviously take this take this okay ob score equals to false you can take yes or no okay some are default you can it is quite similar to that and max sample is non and it sticks a default as x dot I don't know. I don't know why why it happened. Max that is x dot shape the shape of your okay of your samples okay. So that's the basic intuition behind this and max the max samples also one hyperparameter. Great. So we have talked about a lot about bagging and we have spent one hour onto this. Now you can see some more attributes. You can see some more attributes over here to understand it much better. So let me show you. Uh, one uh, one uh, diagram that i found very interesting okay so you can see uh, some examples using random forest regressor uh, using stacking so you, we will also see the stacking okay stacking is also a very good uh, technique as a cag kaggle winner winning winning technique to use okay but um, we, we, here you are uh, here you can see that we only have mse we don't have rmse okay so rmse is not default you have to make your own function for rmse just as querying the root your mse okay but you cannot use if you want here your rmse okay you have to make your own you have to make your own i don't know why it is not running well i have to complain this okay i think this okay so for rmse you have to make your own okay but here you cannot use with this library either you can make a pull request or on cycler in api okay just adding your own rmse okay great so now we have seen uh, these algorithms now we have seen yes i'm going to quit so now we have seen extremely random uh, it, there is one more left which is extremely randomized trees i just forgot extremely uh, randomized classifiers a cycle learn it's obviously in cycle learn because it's a new release of cycle learn let's see this out let me open it again into go it's very important now so here again we have an estimators criteria max step is just the same and then we have bootstrap equals to false here bootstrap equals to false it should be true you can make this as a true okay then we have some more uh, auto square etc you can it's just the same as that but there is some difference it is that that i've just told you that uh, we choose a randomly what what we do we choose a randomly uh, sorry a sample and then we take out the sample uh, epsilon okay so that's what we do in a random uh, forest or extremely randomized classifier so let's see for regressor and regressor is just the same i think that i'm not correct over here okay let's see the grasher and here the same thing over at as we have seen and here bootstrap equals to false you add jobs is jobs that you understood to run trivially parallelized to, to create that option okay great so now we have seen about a random forest and i hope that you understood everything here okay so now in the next sub section we will talk about boosting 
now i hope that you will understand that also okay so let's meet at the next section till then bye bye okay so now we will talk about another ensemble technique which is boosting okay so boosting is one of the again one of the most popular as bagging that we have already talked about bagging just have to recapitulate something about bagging that is necessary okay so we have talked about bagging and now we will talk about boosting which is one of the technique of ensemble learning and i really hope that you will enjoy this section and in boosting we will talk about in boosting we'll talk about something called as a gradient boosting and gradient boosting and then i will just give you a geometric intuition or i will just show you the implementation of adaptive boosting which is often called as adapt boost okay then i will talk about extreme boosting xg boost okay so these three algorithms means xg boost works best in some cases xg boost works best okay so uh, gradient boost boosting also works best but i am i uh, it is also works best so we will see these three okay so let's start with this tutorial but before that um, I, i just want to tell you that you can do the problem set which is on github and you can subscribe the youtube channel just by going to the https https slash on uh, youtube.com slash c slash new era because this highly motivates me to make content like this for you all for absolutely free okay so you can go to this new era to subscribe this youtube channel with 500 uh, just just i have a 500 subscribers soon putting a deep learning tutorial there's announcement coming up soon putting a deep learning tutorial soon okay so let's start with this tutorial and uh, okay so first of all what is bagging what is bagging that we have already talked about you can would reverse that the bagging section if you want uh, maybe in a fast way so bagging and bagging we have low bias model we have low bias model and high variance uh, high variance models okay so our base models usually have low bias and high variance low bias and high variance means our base models usually have this low bias and high variance and using bagging we reduce this we reduce high variance we reduce this variance okay so our output will be after applying bagging we have our low bias and low variance model low bias and low variance model okay so what what we were doing in bagging we we are just simply doing the column sampling as well as the row sampling means we are doing the column sampling as well as the row sampling in case of random forest but it is just just take an example of random forest and then we do the aggregation aggregation okay so that's what we are doing and let's see uh, let's see uh, just just uh, just a recap what we do we have this large data set we have this large data set d n and then what we do we simply divide this data set into subset of a data uh, with the replacement so i hope that you remember what is breadth replacement that the data which is here the data points which is here it needs to it needs not to be different here it can be same in the second data set also okay so you sample n points then you again sample n points with the replacement then you sample n points uh, so you take in three uh, subsets of your data and then you train your model train your model onto this data like m1 onto this data maybe logistic regression maybe linear regression or maybe support vector machine so you have three models and then if if it is a classification problem you simply uh, take the majority of uh, votes majority of votes that this particular example is of a particular class or if it is a regression problem then you do the average or me or you take out the mean or a median okay uh in case of regression so that's what we are doing and in random forest we this is these these are called our base models and in random forest we have our base models as a decision trees we have as a decision trees okay so the uh, this usually helps in reducing your bias in reducing your bias okay so that's that's the bagging so let's see what what we have in uh boosting boosting is just opposite in case of bias and variance trade off so just just now i think that you know why we have learned bias and variance a lot 
okay so in boosting we have low variance in the in, in this case we have high variance but we have a low variance high bias model here we our model is underfitting we have high bias model okay so it is not performing well on the training set okay so here we have a high bias model and then what we do we additively combine additively additively combine what do i mean with this this is a very great uh, question this is this is what we do in here in bagging we are doing the randomization we are doing the bagging means uh, column sampling then row sampling then we have aggregating the model okay but in boosting we have additively combined that here it combines the weak with converts the weak learners weak models into a strong model okay so different different weak model uh, tends to be a great model okay just we will see how it tends to be a great model so it is just combined so let's see let's see the core idea so the the basic idea of using boosting is using boosting is to reduce VAM bias if you have a hard bias model then you likely to use boosting to reduce the bias of that model uh, yeah there is uh, some other techniques also that that we have already seen but it's just we, uh, we use boosting to reduce uh, the bias okay so let's see so let's see uh, the the basic intuition about boosting so let's take an example that you have your data you have your training data so i'm just writing my training data uh, where do i write here you have your training data which is your uh, training data i'm just writing train d okay which is usually which is a, this this is a supervised learning and a supervised learning technique so you have xi and yi with the, which is a label and it goes i equals to one or we can write a i equals to one all the way down to the maybe m okay here m is the number of a training examples into that a training data okay and then you make a model and then you make a model then you make a model m1 so let's take an example that we have made a model m1 that simply uh, that's simply a function f of that is simply a function f of x which is our hypothesis okay so now what we will do uh, this is the this is the core idea behind boosting so so we have a training data you have your training data like which is your training data and you train your m1 model onto that now what you have seen now what you have seen you simply take out the error you simply take out the error means the cost function the loss okay loss for ith example loss for ith example so for each example you have yi which is a ground truth which is a ground truth minus your model predicted value wow model predicted value is f of x which is uh, when when you input x then you get your output so model predicted value is f of x okay this will give you the loss okay the loss for uh, if it is uh, if it is zero then it is very good if it is large then it is very bad okay so here we are using just a simple regression loss I means just a loss so if you add a submission over here if you add a submission i equals to one all the way around to the m y i minus f f of x then this is the like msc but you do a square in msc but now because of the gradient descent to if effectively compute the derivative but here uh, you can uh, you can just see just just as a simple conversation what we uh, just just we are taking the loss for each training example so here let's take an example that we have take take taken a loss and then what we do and then what we do we train our model onto this loss means we, we train our model to reduce this uh, residual error to reduce this residual uh, residual uh, error okay we only focus or we, we we more focus onto the data which is misclassified or miss uh, which is which has a very large uh, error okay so we focus on that okay so what you do um, so for so you want to reduce this error so how you want to reduce you want to make a model make a model m that that uh, that is given xi means you fit this residual so let's take an example i'm just i'm just going to take 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 an example to uh, make you this statement clear that what you do so let's take an example that you have a regression uh, prob problem statement so you have a regression problem statement oops i don't know why i'm making a bad yeah why my x-axis is not working great yeah here is my x-axis a bad x-axis and you have an x like this 
x like this and then what you, you have fit in a uh, maybe this line okay a straight line so here if for this train example the loss will be very high so it will uh, more prone start focus on that and it fit on that residual covering this okay so maybe it will uh, it will do like this okay it will also cover this if the residual is very high so it always tries to minimize that residual maybe it can make a null either the example is too much landy but either it can make a non-linear uh, decision uh, sorry hyperplane okay so uh, for so what what we do we fit our error so we make a model m1 that minimizes the error by fitting onto the error so here is the li for i equals to 1 all the way around to the m okay for each ray example we are fitting a model okay so it is more prone focusing on the data which is either misclassified or which has a high uh, the particular MSC or MAE okay if it is a regression problem then we take MSC or it is or which is misclassified so it is more prone focusing on that okay so that's the basic intuition so let's uh, let me uh, let me make you uh, the full equation how it looks like so you have you have f you have f of x f of x with k means and some uh, just just a model a big big model means f of x okay for each train example i equals to zero all the way down to the k okay all the way down to the k you have one alpha you have an alpha times your model ith model so you will not only have one model you have in first model that fits some that second model that covers that that fits that res residual then third model that fits that residual from this model fourth model that fits that residual from this model means error okay so we have a different different model so we have a large model this k and we go through each and every model with some la uh, just as because assume as a lambda so we have this um, uh, just uh, just for, as of now just consider this as us we have computed this somehow so we will see how it is computed okay we will see uh, when we learn about uh, some gradient boosting okay so just assume that we have some uh, cons uh, just a lambda a constant okay here this f of i x that is f that is trained to fit the residual trained to fit the residual from the previous model okay uh, from the previous model means this model this m2 trained to fit the uh, error we get on m1 okay so this this model may have some different thing this this model is able to correctly classify the error from this uh, first model this m3 is able to classify uh, the errors from the m m2 so la like like that okay so that's that's the basic intuition behind boosting okay so i think that you have understood about boosting so now this will end it up this this function this function will be ended up giving you uh, low bias low bias and a low variance model okay but there is a problem there is a problem so you may think hey ayush can you name a problem yeah sure i'm here to name okay but before that you can take a break if you want because i'm i'm just it will just take more one hour to complete i think so it's my approximating time so it will take one more hour you can take a break or you can do just a prop problem set if you want but start with a section and then complete a section then see the prop problem set then see some challenges given to you and my get job and i really understand that you will be able to do that okay so here you have this one first you have a training data then you have a loss for loss for each training example then each model trend each model tend to um, uh, each model tend to uh, fit the residual error given from the previous model okay and in that way they end up being a low bias model it's very good on training set but there is a problem the problem is that if it is too much good on the training set means only 100 100 percent accuracy on training set then what will happen then what will happen it will start overfitting new training example will come then it will able not to classify or uh, detect a good uh, prediction okay so that's why so that's why we have to take care of how, how many number of base models so that we have a lambda with this we will understand this all okay
great so we have understood this and so the core idea behind bagging the core idea behind bagging is not too much hard is just saying is we just use bagging sorry oh oops it's boosting oops it's boosting the core idea behind boosting is to reduce the bias reduce the bias on the shrimp like that okay this this converts the weak learners into the strong learners and here we have a good fine-tuned models which is converted into majority of words and then in bagging like that okay so let's see um, so that's the basic intuition behind boosting so there are some of the techniques that we'll study about like a gradient like gradient gradient boosted gradient boosted gradient boosted decision trees decision trees which is often called as g b d d okay uh this is uh, this is because because in random forest we have our decision tree and here in gradient boosting we have our base learners as a decision tree and gradient boosting has a base learner as a decision tree and then we have adapt adaptive boost which is often called as adapt boost which is a little bit uh, more uh, advanced version of gradient boosting then you have extreme boosting which is xg boost okay which is again a family of a good algorithm and it's always outperform is very very powerful algorithm xg boost as i've seen so far and i will show you the implementation of xg boost also with some i will show you how it is implemented and everything in this section only okay so and that's the basic intuition behind bagging and i really hope that you understood bagging in detail just to recap that bag boost or oops and why i'm saying bag uh, bagging it's a boosting okay so boosting here uh, in boosting we have low variance and high bias model we additively combine is with in which we convert our speak learners into strong learners and the core idea is to reduce the bias it simply means that we want to improve our error on the training set okay so that's the basic and we have four which we'll cover in this section which is gradient boosted decision trees adapt adaptive boost then we have xg boost okay so uh, i think that you understood about boosting okay so now we will talk about uh, gradient boosting which is again a good uh, a very fantastic brilliant uh, uh, algorithm okay so to uh, just, just just use an internet companies or very big pump companies which is used in ml and production okay so which is usually la launched in 20s these uh, algorithms okay so we'll study in detail to make you understand each and every concept of gradient boosting and then we will see the implementation then we will see the adaptive boost then we will see the xg boost and then we are end up with this ensemble models okay then we will go with uh, unsupervised learning techniques okay so uh, just uh, let's let's start with gradient boosting now we have talked about gradient uh, sorry the boosting uh, the basic intuition behind boosting what actually the boosting are so now i will start talking about a gradient boosting okay so gradient boosting is another yet one of the most powerful algorithm that i've seen so far uh, yeah one, one, of, one of the most powerful algorithm which is uh, which is yet to uh, uh, just learn it's very to have a good in your toolkit okay so i'm on a wikipedia page i'm on a wikipedia page which i found a great uh, this great uh, algorithm which is again uh, which to, which which to just tells you a very good uh, intuition behind gradient boosting rather than just i may make use of my blackboard either way i will make use of my blackboard over here okay so uh, so uh, what is, so what is gradient boosting this is a great question so gradient boosting is a boosting algorithm that just converts the weak learners into the strong learners okay so let's start with in the, on this uh, gradient boosting and you can search for gradient boosting wiki and then you will see the gradient boosting wikipedia articles and then you can read the full articles either i, have, I will cover everything in in short uh, in short uh, period, period of time but i've already covered some of them and and of my just i will cover i i have covered more than this wikipedia okay so i will give you some real world examples of gradient boosting also where it is used and everything okay but first of all let's understand the this the this 
algorithm okay so let me see my pen is at least working or not i hope that this is working yeah this is working great i'm just happy that my ink is working just if the ink to go if you're watching please help me to improve this very it is not a that much good okay just to improve this but it's very good tool means some sometimes it lacks but it's a very good tool you check it out it's very good great for free okay so you have this training data which is a input training data you have this train input training data which is your which is the set of let me write the training data which is simply your xi and yi and simply goes from i equals to one all the way around to the n okay or m which is our list let's stick to our formal notation which is m which is the num number of a training examples number of a training or the size of our training examples okay so that's the that's our given data and we have a differentiable cost function then we have a differentiable cost function okay so what do i mean by differentiable cost function differentiable cost function means that your this cost because we take out the derivative of our cost function we take out our derivative of our cost function with respect to some uh, uh, some value okay so let's take uh, we are taking out the derivative of our j of theta partial derivative of our j of theta okay so that's the that's the basic uh, about uh, means uh, that's the differential equation that i know if you know if you're a cal calculus student then then you might interpret that we have a differential but as of if you're not able to get what is this differentiable feel free to leave this uh, differentiable just think that it should be derivable okay for our gradient descent or we will uh, we, we, because we have to take out the derivative of this particular loss function with respect to some uh, uh, weights okay so we with that if we are given training set which is d train we have a given a training set which is a value x so x i and y i which goes from i equals to one all the way down to the m okay where is my eraser i think that this is my eraser yeah i equals to one all the way around to the m and then we have a differentiable equation is given so let's stick to the j of y y f of x and this is simply just the error means just a minus the minus uh, your more and more appropriate value for each and particular examples i equals to one all the way around to the m and then we square it all up okay so that's the that's the our cost function May, maybe it can be mean square error or it can be log loss for classification etc okay then we are given the iterations then we are giving the number of iteration which is m and m here is the model m here is the base learners m here is the number of a base learners number of a base learners number of a base learners okay so, so this is the number of base learners which is m now let's start with the algorithm so what this algorithm tells you so let me choose the different colors so it may make sense so we initialize our model with some constant value lambda with some constant value lambda in that case we have in uh, alpha but now we had changed a little bit that we have our favorite lambda okay so we have to find lambda oh, no, uh, okay let's uh, just think of it as that we have a lambda we have a lambda that we have to find that lambda that minimizes this training error this loss function it should be told here but i told you here just in my excitement so you what do you do you initialize your model with some lambda that minimizes this cost function okay so this first to initialize this uh, that's and we will see how this uh, lambda is computed here but uh, first of all you initialize it and then what you do you iterate through each and every model okay first you go first you do this for first model then you do again for second model means you apply a for loop where you for m equals to one first you two m means you want to go one two three all the way down to the m okay so you do this and then let me first of all let me okay so here then what you will do then uh, i hope that then you initialize your model then you compute the residuals you compute the pseudo residuals you compute the pseudo 
residuals you compute the pseudo residuals and then here it is named as r uh, subscript i and m and m here denotes the number uh, which model and i here for each 20 examples okay so here you compute the i and m and then you take out the partial derivative the partial derivative oops why it is not working partial derivative hey god please help me the partial derivative of your cos function y i of your cos function y i and f of x so this is your loss function with respect to this function okay f of x your model predicted value okay and then you want to fit your model onto your previous uh, residuals so for you go to i equals to one all the way down to the end so here you take out for f of x means f the uh, means here here you are uh, fitting your model means just you are making the model to be f of f, m minus one means the previous model okay so compute those res residuals and then you fit the base learners okay that i've just showed you in my in my previous uh, just in just just in a boosting that we fit the residual so let's take example we have n m1 m2 and m3 we have taken the residuals we have taken the residuals and the, we, here is give some residuals this m1 is trained to fit the residuals from m1 this m2 trained to fit the residuals from m2 okay and here, this is m3 okay so it is trained to fit the residuals of m two okay so then you fit a base learner or a weak learner let's take an example three closed under scaling of h of m x here is your uh, two residuals to pseudo residuals means you fit the learner to fit the, the residuals from the residuals got from the previous base learners that is to train it using the training set this one okay and now here r i i m is in our case which is l i on m model okay so then you fit your model that i've already showed you just similar that we have seen and then you come uh, compute the multiplier which is a constant multiplier lambda m for each model you have lambda m okay which is a one dimensional optimization problem for solving the one dimensional optimization problem so you may ask yeah you why do we are choosing this lambda m so for solving one dimensional optimization problem going into 1d 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 optimization 1d optimization is out of the bound of the course but uh, you can see on the link okay the how you compute you compute lambda for each model that minimizes the loss of y which is the ground truth from the previous model plus plus lambda times our just the model that that we have now okay now what you do you update the model now you update the model to be to be the model to be fitted by the uh, the model that fitted the previous residuals okay so f of m x here m is our model number the means model number then we have fit then we have this f of m minus one previous model plus lambda m lambda m which is some constant for solving the one dimensional optimization okay because we are taking the partial derivative of our loss function y i and f of x i with respect to f of x i and f of x i is our model predicted value okay times h of mx and then you get your output as a f big model m m big model all the way down to the x okay so here you when when you cover all of this you when the loop is done then you get the final model which is f m x that is simply f of m minus one x plus the previous model is this previous model plus the a model that we got after solving this of 1d optimization problem okay so that's the gradient boosting uh, algorithm that i really hope that you understood but uh, let's uh, let's uh, just just as a recapitulation to help you understand it a little bit much better to uh, under understand this problem okay so what we do let's understand what we do over here so we simply first we have a given our training data we have a training data xi and yi going from i equals to one all the way down to the n and n here uh and and here i just hope that it should work now and n here is your 
and here is number of a training your number of size of your more uh, training set then you have a differentiable loss function with the number of a base learners that you want okay then you fin initialize the model with some constant okay then you apply a for loop in that for loop you take out the residuals you take out the residuals for and and then you name it as a r subscript i which is the number of a training exam that the index of the training example and m is your number in the index of your model okay minus the taking of the derivative or partial derivative for of your uh, loss okay uh, okay and then you fit a base learner or a weak learner because there because it just makes your weak learner to the strong learner okay uh, to uh, closing under h of mx which is your uh, got from the weak model means you just fit the base learner to to the residuals so it's simply that you that you are going to fit your model into xi and your li which is simply li is this okay now you compute the multiplier lambda m lambda subscript n for each particular uh, m means the model index for solving the one dimensional problem so it's just you find the lambda m that minimizes the loss that you get y y i comma the output from this model okay this is the whole model now this is a pre previous model that is this is a new model that is fitted to fit this residual okay and then you update your model okay then you have to output a big model which is f of mx that is simply this f m minus one of xi plus your big model now you just after your full iteration you'll be ending up being a big model okay so that's the basic intuition behind gradient boosting i really think that you understood about gradient boosting now uh, now it's time for getting into the uh, for getting into the something called as a regularization and uh, shrinkage okay but before that why do we need even a regularization and shrinkage so why do we need as we have already talked about that we have and that we have in boosting we have high bias we have high bias let me see the recordings are on yeah oops we have our high bias and low variance problem sorry high bias so we so we use boosting to reduce the bias to reduce the bias so high bias is just doing that on training set so if we just after each iteration we are fitting the previous model residual so yeah it is making a null image it is doing very very good on training set so very very good on training set so it may happen that it may start overfitting and our low by variance goes to high where starts goes going to high variance means our low variances start increasing and now it's converts to high variance so that actually can cause overfitting okay so for avoiding we add a regularization and shrinkage which is again shown in the wikipedia page let's see so here um, i think that I, I can teach you better than wikipedia page okay so you have you this big model you have this big model f of m x which is here you have a h h zero x plus you do for i equals to one all the way down to the h all the way down to the h is number of for your model lambda m lambda m or you can say m the number of a model okay h of m x okay so that's the, your model that we and then what do you do then if the number of a base models increase means it will fit more residuals if the it will fit more residuals more residuals then your overfit will then then over then it will start overfitting start overfitting and if it is start overfitting then your variance will start going up okay so that that will cause the problem so what you do you shrink you shrink by a factor of lamb uh, just a there's a greek letter that i even don't know that is something called as a v so let's assume that is a v which is a parameter v okay so we have a parameter we have our parameter v which will help us uh, which is just a parameter for controlling the or it just shrinks your shrinks it just shrinks to do not go that much means it gives a weight it is just a learnable parameter just gives weight and empirically it is found that v equals to 0.1 tends to be a dramatic improvements in your models okay so that's that's why we use uh, this v uh, this v to be 0.1 and again uh, your v should be in between your v should be in between uh, zero and one and it's found that v equals to 0 0.1 
would be dramatic improvements in your models okay so you add a new weightage to that uh, model means to to this model okay when you add weightage to this model that i've just shown to you add weightage to that model and that's called the learning rate for how for how much time for how much rate it should learn okay so that's the so, so that's we add v to that model so let me add that so let me add that so what you do for you just shrink your model with so shrink your model big model by going f of m minus 1 x plus v times lambda m h of m x and v here is in between in between 1 okay and particle is found that b equals 0 0.1 works best okay so that's the that's about a uh, gradient boosting and i really hope that you understood this also okay so now it's time for um we will take a look at implementation okay so now we will take a look at the implementation of gradient boosting classifier and gradient boosting regular eraser okay but before that let's see the train and time complexity of your model so uh, let's let's recall of decision trees and decision trees uh, we have our uh, train and runtime complexity so here we and decision tree dt i'm writing dt we have old and oops when i'm writing this and log d and here d and then random forest you have o order of n log n number of a decision tree means k okay now when gradient boosting decision tree means here we we just take our base learners as a de, as a decision tree rather than different different models so we have o n log d times the number of our models okay so that's the basic uh, tr uh, time complexity of your uh, gradient boosting uh, decision trees okay great now we will see something called as uh, now we will see the, the implementation of this uh, gradient boosting decision trees in cycle learn api okay so let's see so let me open gradient boosting uh, implementation implementation okay and scale learn let's see yeah here we found this wait for a few seconds is just loading okay great so now here you are you are on a page of cycle learn api gradient boosting classifier and then you can see over here that um, now let's see the, some of the parameters that we are over here so here that you have a loss that you have a loss which is the deviance deviance refers to the log loss and exponential um, uh, refers to the uh, which which is just adaptive version which is if you set exponential then your gradient boosting will go will will be as a, uh, will be called as a adaptive boosting or ara boost okay so in adaptive boosting it is more pronely we will see the implementation so in ara boost it is more pronely focusing on unclassified okay more uh, more prone, pronely focusing on unclassified but it's not being used too much okay so we have a loss equals to deviance which is it was a logic regression loss or log loss okay then you have a learning rate means the rate to shrink the contribution of each tree by learning rate okay so this is used to reduce your uh, over uh, variance okay so that's your model does not start overfitting okay so uh, this is your learning rate which is default 0 0.1 and leave it 0 0.1 okay because it's found that most dramatic dramatically that they work best in most of the cases and then you have a number of estimators which is number of decision trees sub sample criterion min sample split min sample leaf min weight fraction max that for each tree min impurity these are particularly for each trees and then you have uh, let's see something more the, uh, that we have a validation eternal change and then total ccp alpha that's not not too cool okay so we have this and these are some of the hyperparameters that i know that you had understood everything okay so you can see more about this in the parameters in detail here but uh, we have already talked about decision trees already okay so let's see the implementation means the implementation of this uh, gradient boosting is just one line of code which is here and you can use predict pro probability it simply gives the probability of that being uh, true okay 
for that class okay so first you import from sklearn.ensemble import gradient boosting classifier here is your data means and then you call your with nestimators learning rate 1.1 okay 1.0 max depth random state and then you fit it and then you get your score okay so that's the basic intuition behind a gradient boosting uh, classifier okay now let's see the gradient boosting regressor gradient boosting regressor uh, regression in SQL learn okay so this is a very good to learn from the documentation okay this is very good to learn from the documentation so let's see okay here here we are on uh, documentation of a cycle learn api now what we will do we will just uh, let's use the pen and then you can see over here that we have a loss function to be optimized means l as the refers to the least squares lad means least absolute deviation is more robust okay so if we have a hover then you have a quantile but the default is ls okay then you have a learning rate how for how much this is a for shrinkage then you have a number of estimators then you have some sample criterion min sample split for each particular decision trees these are for each particular decision trees and then the same thing that we have seen so far okay so now uh, we are uh, this is the basic for uh, decision trees and i hope that you understood okay now let's uh, see the implementation of this i'm a little bit going far because i have to teach also that xg boost and ara boost okay so you just uh, call the a gradient booster pressure then you call the your train test split then you split your data and then you call your gra gradient boosting pressure with the default parameters okay then you fit it okay and then you simply do the gradient boosting pressure then you score it and it uses the some scoring parameter means the log loss or I'm sorry not log loss it maybe it uses r2 or ms you can see okay so that's the basic intuition behind how we implement a grasher and classifier which we will do in project just to showcase you how you can assess from documentation it's very good to learn from the documentation now it's time for learning from for uh, now it's time for to uh, that you'll learn about xg boost you will learn about uh, uh, but before that let's you uh, let's learn about adapt boost okay adapt adapt boost so let's see we oops i, I want implement sklr okay so if you set your uh, loss to be exponential okay to be exponential then it will be equivalent to ada boost classifier ada boost classifier okay so it will set your loss to be like this and it's just the same as that we have already talked about we have two algorithm given by sammy and sammer which is in sammer which is also for logic regression if you have seen as the cycle learned api okay so how you implement from ara boost classifier then you call this and then you fill your model and then you are done okay it's very simple I, I i think that you but just remembering the concepts is very very important because it's not always you have to implement maybe your own something algorithm in your company okay you may think yeah you can't we just study the implementation no no you cannot study okay but cycle learn api is very very slow very very slow but it's great, great but what you can do uh, you have to in in some companies for production uh, because there's a kaggle winning uh, algorithm that we need to understand what is happening how we can tune the hyperparameter okay so here you can see again for regressor okay and here you have a loss equals to linear and then you have a square and then you have exponential okay and here maybe we, we we do have a not loss you can see state the number of a class is how many number of a class if it's a class classifier okay so now we know about this and i really hope that you understood uh, the following now it's time for uh, learning about extreme boosting one of my favorite but i think ada boost is not used in production uh, many um, uh, not uses too much in the production uh, maybe uh, i'm not right over here but i think so okay so now we will learn about xg boost which is one of the most popular algorithm which i've seen so far okay uh, means a t okay it's it's a it's a good algorithm it's a good algorithm but it's one of the best algorithm that wins your kaggle competition okay so now we will see what xg boost does it's just the advanced version of gradient boosting it have it is it, 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 it does have gradient boosting decision trees plus 
it has randomization with row sampling plus column sampling and so in gradient boosting we are not doing this but it's at randomization which is row sampling plus column sampling so that's why we name it as a extreme gradient boosting and it works best okay it works brilliantly um, in some cases in machine learning problems okay but it needs fine tuning a lot okay so you have a gradient boosting decision tree now you have a row it's just how we differ from gradient boosting decision trees you have you do the randomization by doing feature bagging and then you have a row sampling okay and it's just for a simplicity let let me explain you what we tend to learn about this what we do we simply sample the rows as well as the columns for our data okay okay and uh, and specifically for bagging we don't do columns we don't do column sampling but in a ran random forest we do both so in XGBoost we do the gradient boosting decision trees as well as a random forest plus uh, column sampling okay so that's the that's what we do randomization and uh, that's the XGBoost okay so now we will see in detail what actually the XGBoost implementation XGBoost from the official documentation but uh, but it is all it is all it is of course imp impl implemented in the it is of course imp implemented in the cycle or an api but it's uh, but it's very good to use because they are, this is fast actually it is fast actually it's very good to learn from here rather than there okay so i think that we can found get a uh, pr the python package because we have different different package no uh, setting parameters oops where it is xgboost uh, python package okay so here we have some parameters in xgboost i think that my brave is not working i have to again switch to my favorite chrome why i have switched to this it's bad X, uh, brave is actually not good for me and in some cases actually i'm not, I, who, who am i say to say bad but it's good good but it's all of course sometimes it does very bad okay so let's see some of the parameters let's see some of the parameters so we have different different packages that we had that already been implemented this algorithm so here you have booster which is gb tree means gradient boosting tree you can use gb linear or dart the means we usually use gb tree then you have a uh, validate parameters default to false means it's just you want to validate your parameters or not then default to maximum number of threats then you have an evaluation matrix then uh, e term is learning rate okay is 0 0.3 okay gamma which we have seen which is the constant which is zero as default and it's just uh, we just randomly initialize means and then we uh, find a good like gamma and then what is the max depth for each tree and you can read the documentation over here more minimum child weight minimum delta step means what is the step should one uh, maximum delta step we allow each leaf output to be if there if mean there is no constraint okay if if means it's just like that it's just uh, helping you to not too much proning to overfitting it's a more robust model okay so you can see uh, your lambda means l2 regularization like lasso and this is for rig, uh, rig regularization that is alpha regularization okay then we have a tree method which is xgboost construction uh, algorithm using uh, xgboost you can see the reference you can see ob obviously see the reference it also supports uh, hist and etc then it's uh, have a scale post weight updater which is process type grow policy maximum number of leaves but it's default to zero uh, to be added okay so max bin predictor then we have a gpu cpu but this leads a lot of fine tuning it takes a lot of time in cpu okay so we have this much and you can see more about this uh, it's a very long set of parameters but we usually use the main parameters that we have listed okay so you can see a python package first one you want to install it you want to install it you can just pip install xgboost and then we and then you just call uh, xgb dot d matrix first you convert that into a d matrix then you uh, 
um, do that means you can do also for pandas using the Scylla and API but it's okay to use it but you can see over here implementation SKL learn it's also for a regressor that we have seen I think that we had they have removed I think not they have they haven't removed no no worries so you can see from here how it is used and how we train this model and how we save this model uh, it's just like a neural web as you as you know that uh, tensorflow has also added decision trees and like that in sample learning it started adding because one of the most powerful uh, algorithm in sample learning okay so we have seen a lot in um, in uh, in decision trees okay uh, sorry in ensemble learning like bagging and boosting okay so now one last step that is left is a stacking of your uh, stacking okay so after this section we will start with the stacking to help you to better understand what actually stacking is and it will obviously help you okay so we have seen a lot of applications of this and I really hope that you enjoyed it also okay so this this section is just amazing we have learned about boosting and we have learned about gradient boosting they are adaptive boosting then you have learned about xg boost okay and so one of the projects will fine tune will use xg boost adapt boost with fine tuning okay one of our project okay so uh, that's it for this section and the next section will start with a stacking means a one one in 20 minute session on stacking will take and then we just with some uh, summary or revision of ensemble learning okay so uh, let's meet at the next section okay so now we'll talk about our last ensemble learning technique which is uh, called stacking of our models okay so uh, we will see the implementations of the stacking so and we will see how it works and how it changes your accuracy okay so let's recall uh, something called as bias and variance of our bagging and boosting okay so in bagging in bagging we have high variance high variance and a low bias trade off okay and in boosting and in boosting you have low bias high bias high bias and low variance rate off okay so re re remember these two uh, for stacking okay so here i am i am on my ml extend which is a library for implementing the stacking classifier okay so uh, you can we will see the implementation of this uh, stacking classifier but before that we will learn well how actually stacking works you can get to this page by just going ML, ML extend stacking classifier and click on the first link okay so let's start so here is our data set here is our data set so let me take out my favorite uh, ink to go I hope that you remember my favorite ink to go sometimes I roast it also but here it is very good just for, for in annotating uh, the, this, these, these kind of things Okay, so here, uh, let, let me take the pen, let, uh, as of now, let's take uh, red, which I like a lot, let's take uh, medium, okay, great. So, here is your in bagging, what, what we were doing, we have a large training data, we have a large training, training data, and then you are multiply, or you are just taking out a subset of this data, D, N1, D, N2, D, N3, with the replacement of training the decision trees. Or maybe some same based learners. Okay, so in the stacking, we have different different based learners. We we take out the data, uh, okay, and then we train our model different different model under the each data. Like C1 uh, is a model which is trained on different data. Uh, then ag ag again means on the data D1. Then C2 is trained on D2 all the way down to the M. Okay, so here C1, C2. All the around the CM are a different are a different um, models. Okay, so what do I mean by are a different models? Is quite simple. Is let's take an example. Let's let's take an example that you have your favorite logistic regression. <laughs> okay, you have a logistic regression. You have a logistic regression as a C1. Okay, as a C1. Then you have your support vector machine as a C2. 
Then you have your favorite naive Bayes algorithm, naive Bayes algorithm with uh, maybe with extensive fine tuning using grid search. Okay, so here we have C3. Here we have k-nearest neighbors, uh, which is C4. Okay, with extensive with, with uh, maybe k equals to four. Okay, uh, with extensive fine tuning. Okay, so we have four base learners. And we have a different logic regression, support vector machine, naive base, k nearest neighbors, and there are four different models, okay? And a train of different, different things, okay? And the major difference between uh, the bagging and boosting is in bagging that, I, that I've told you to recall, bagging, bagging and stacking, is in bagging, we have high variance, high variance, and low bias, low bias models which is a base learners which is a base learners and in uh, and in bagging we used to be used bagging for reducing the high variance okay so base learners are usually high variance and low bias and trade off between them okay so what is the difference between stacking then? in a stacking in a stacking our base base models or base learners are highly tuned are highly well tuned okay highly well parameter tuned okay highly well parameter tuned and they have a good bias and variance trade off okay so in boosting so in bagging we have high variance where our base base learners are not that much good and also in boosting our base learners are not that much good but in stacking our base learners are quite good, are quite good, are very good with extensive fine, fine tuning. So maybe you have changed the logistic regression fine tuning with a learning rate support vector machine like C, your regularization parameter and your gamma, and then maybe some uh, of the other parameters. Okay, in nine base algorithm, we have also done it's not required, but you have done some extensive fine tuning. You have kin k nearest neighbors, we have chosen what is the number of a k. Okay, so the, you have done an extensive fine tuning of your model. Okay, so that's what I, what I mean. Here I'm taking one a classification example. Okay, so here um, what 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 we are doing uh, here what what we are doing is just we are the models are highly trained means highly fine tuned. Okay, highly very 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 much a train uh, extensive fine tuning are very good models. They do have a very good bias and variance trade off. Okay, and here it gives projection. Let's take an example that y, C1 gives you a projection as a y hat 1, then C2 gives you a projection as a y hat 2, and all the way around to the y hat m. Okay, so each model gives your output. Okay, the projection. Okay, so what you are doing, so what you are doing, so let me do this. So, as, an, as a motivating example, so can I delete this if, if I can? Yeah, let me let me delete that. So what you are doing, so what you are actually doing is simply uh, taking a training data, which is straight taking a training data, you, you are dividing your training data, you are dividing a training data into subsets of into subset of training data, D1, D2, and D3. For, in, for an example, let's take for D3, okay? And you are training your base learners which has a good bias and variance trade-off, which has a good bias and variance trade-off, okay? The base learners are very good bias and very good model. They are not either uh, low bias or high bias because here in bagging, again I'm saying in bagging, you have high variance, high variance and low bias model. And what do I mean by high variance? It means it performs very, very well on your training data, but it fails to generalize well on your testing data. Okay, so that's why and and so that's why it's called high variance. And in boosting, uh, it is underfitting. It means that your model, uh, your model is either uh, overfit, means uh, underfitting because it has a low high bias, which is not performing well on your training data, and low variance like that. Okay, so here we have a intuition about bagging and boosting. Okay, so here we have a highly tuned model with extensive fine tuning. And then what you do, you take out the prediction y hat 1, y hat 2, y hat 3, y hat 3. Okay, after you take out this, now what you do, you train your model, you train your model, 
and you train your uh, model, you train your meta classifier, you train your meta classifier, which is just which is just trained to on the on the predicted class labels from the base learners or their probabilities from their ensemble. Okay, so they are usually trained on these things on these uh, on the predicted class of our favorite classification or base learners. Uh, either they will either take the class labels or the probability of being that class. Okay, so maybe 0.65 on a predicted class, it may be zero or one or two. Okay, so that's what the basic intuition behind the this uh, stacking. But again, I'm I'm very uh, just just I will recapitulate you so that it works. It, it makes sense again. Okay, so what do you do in stacking? So uh, let's uh, just just for an example in the stacking we are just taking a training data okay and then we are training and then then we are dividing our data into subset of a data and then we are training different different classifier onto that data okay here we have a C1 here we have a C2 all the way under CM which is new data okay new in new data we are training and uh, and then what it happens and trains our C1 C2 all the way under the C3 uh, and CM under the that data and takes out predictions and the major difference is the first difference is that the, the bias and variance trade-off bias and variance trade-off trade-off of of the base learners in the stacking base learners in the stacking is good in the stacking is good okay is good whereas in bagging we have high variance and low bias okay and in oops what happened and in boosting we have high bias and low variance high bias and low variance oops what happened uh, high bias and low variance low variance okay so that's the major difference next thing is that uh, uh, after you get the prediction from each of the model by because you have done a lot more fine-tuning of your hyperparameter you get your p1 p2 all the way down to the pm now you train a big or, or a meta classifier which you usually call it s dash onto the prediction of uh, s1 of x means the one classifier second s2 of x second classifier all the way down to the hm of x Either you train onto the probabilities, probabilities given by these models, probabilities, or the predicted class labels from these ensembles. Okay, and in where is in bagging, we are aggregating the majority of votes. We are aggregating, okay, the majority of votes of from that models. Then you are taking that as a final prediction by hat. But we have a different chance of uh, here. We have different approach. Okay, so let's. Let's take a quick, quick, uh, quick look at the at the stacking at the stacking algorithm. But it's I have already explained you uh, just just above. But as an uh, just as a formal uh, definition, here you have your training data, which is usually x i and y i, which is uh, which goes from x i equals to one all the way down to the m, where x i is the member of R, which has an n-dimensional, maybe it, it can have a multiple features, and whereas the yi will be the member of the number of the classes of y. Okay, so that's the thing, and then what you do, and its output will be the ensemble classifier, which is y edge dash or a big edge. Okay, first, what you do, learn first level classifiers means. You learn uh, T, T classifiers, maybe it can be logistic regression, naive base, naive base, it can be K nearest neighbors, and uh, to all, one, one all the way down to the P. And P here is the number of a base models, okay, based on the di distribution data D. Now you construct new data set, now you construct new data set going from I equals to 1 all the way down to the M. And then it that that contains contains x i hat prime y i where x i is simply the prediction the prediction from the each model the from the each base learn, uh, learners model okay from the each models now what you do you train your second level classifier first you train the first level now you train your second level classifier 
And here, it simply trains to get a mega hypothesis of train onto these models. And these meta class, this this meta classifier can be anything. This meta classifier can be logistic regression, can be naive base, can be uh, k, k nearest neighbors, can be support with the machine, any one model. And we are not aggregating, we are not taking mean, we are not taking anything. We are just training a second level classifier that is just trained on outperform the base learners, and base learners have a good bias and variance trade off. Okay, so that's the stacking, and I hope that you understood about the stacking. Now I will just uh, take a look at the 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 formal. Uh, I would say the formal the, the I could say the implementation of a stacking. The implementation of a stacking. Okay, so you can see over here. You can see over here uh, the paper, which is in some of the research papers they usually call as a stacked generalization you can uh, some 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 in some research paper we call that okay uh, okay so let's make a simple stack classification first what you have done over here we have simply loaded the data set from the sklr data set which is the iris data set and iris data set is not too much hard we have sepal oops uh, we have a sepal length we have a sepal length petal length petal width and pedal length okay so we have four features and basis on that you have to predict what is the species of that flower which is either can be setosa versicolor or virginica okay so that's the that's the uh, that's our data set now you can see first we import the model selection which will see what it does then we import the logistic regression from linear model api and then cycle learn then we import KN, KNN, which is, a, which is again from neighbor from neighbor's API and cycle learn. And then you import Gaussian night base from uh, uh, night base. I have not gone into too much of algorithm because learning algorithm can just you can see the Wikipedia. You are now capable of learning any algorithm. Okay. Now uh, you just import the random forest classifier from ensemble learning, uh, ensemble API of cycle learn. Now you import from ML extend library classifier import a stacking classifier. Either we have to in, uh, first you have to install this using pip install if you have a Python ML extend, but uh, then you can uh, do this kind of thing. Okay, so where is my? Let me delete this. Okay, after that, after that, what we have to do? We have to simply import the numpy as np as alias and import warnings. Okay, now you are going to ignore the warnings given by the models. Now, first, your first model is CLF1, which is K neighbors, which with, with the neighbors of one. If it is bagging, if it, if it was bagging, then we have to, if it is ran, random forest, we have taken one the decision tree, but we are taking different, different models, and that's what makes it perfect. Okay, random classifier, Gaussian night base, logistic, logistic regression. Okay, now we, to, now what, what we have done, we instantiated our object, everything. Now we instantiate our stacking classifier, which is the number of a classifier will be CLF1, which is CLF K neighbors, random forest, which is the CLF2, and these three, we, we are these three are CLF2, CLF3 are the base learners, it will give output it will give output like this okay now what what we, what you will do you want a meta classifier which will be the logistic regression which will the logistic regression which will the which will the logistic regression as i've told you can take logistic regression as a meta classifier okay now you perform a three fold cross cross validation now right? now you perform three fold cross validation now you perform three fold cross validation now, uh, in threefold cross validation, you are just looping through CLF as well as the label, it zips, uh, zipping the CLF1, CLF2, CLF3, and SCLF. Okay, now KNN, a random forest, night base, and stacking classifier. Now you select the best model. You Now you select the base model by training each of the model, whether you are taking a scoring equals to accuracy. Now you check the accuracy, and you can see, and you can see, and you can see that this stacking classifier has around 0.4% uh, of increase uh, as is better, I mean it's quite better than this random forest. The stacking classifier works best in this case. Okay, 
and now what what you can do you can pl oops what 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 happened what you can do you can actually plot the kn and how it is plotting means the decision boundaries of the models how they are plotted the decision boundaries or hyperplanes okay using the matplotlib so let me an annotate what is doing first you import the matplotlib then you import the plot decision regions from ml extend then import the grid spec then you import the iter tools then you set the set the area then you set the area again you loop through by jipping and then you take out the product and then you fit it and then you plot it and then you plot the decision boundary then you title the lab and lab here is just kn and a random forest night base and stacking classifier okay after you plot it now you are done with a stacking classifier okay now i as as i've already stated you either for training the meta classifier you can use either this uh, that i could say i could say that uh, maybe let's uh, the pre pre prediction from the base learners so you can either take prediction class or the probabilities as the meta features okay so you can uh, say that use proba use proba equals to true use proba equals to true and average proba equals to false okay and you can see uh, here are a little bit of uh, the documentation over there okay great now we have seen this and again the same thing is not too much hard over here using the thing and now we will see uh, here is an example of a stack the classification using grid search it's your task is to do this but i'm just going to an annotate what the uh, this kind of thing will do grid search so here you are just uh, first of all you are just you, now you will tune you will have a good bias invariance trade off so we are going to check between 1 to 5 you are going to check and then meta classifier and if fit the grid search you find the grid best grid search then you plot the results means you take out the results what is the best parameters and the accuracy so after applying that you will get a set of uh, values which are the best uh, k nearest has these uh, best features and uh, like that okay now you can import the same thing for doing the k nearest neighbors and this and random forest classifier and then we have one k, uh, one 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 more which is the meta classifier okay now using the grid search stacking uh, that operate on different subset of features you can also do that by selecting the column separator by calling the make pipeline that selects the two features okay so that's the that you can do and you can use prefitted uh, classifiers which is already been fitted uh, we previously fitted our classifiers in your models okay fit base estimator equals to false means you don't want to fit your base estimators okay you can also plot roc curve using and you can see the roc curve like this and and this this is first of all these four the four examples are very very important if you do uh, you can see the roc curve uh, in, in, in more detail on the internet okay great so now we have talked a lot about stacking classifier i showed you the implementation of stacking classifier here is it a very interesting and a brilliant diagram on a stacking or algorithm given on stacking this is a good example on stacking that i want to give it to you okay thanks to the author who has given to you full credit goes to them okay this some an uh, just on man annotating okay so now we are done with uh, these uh, with uh, ensemble learning so let's uh, let's recapitulate what what we have seen so far we have seen we have seen we have completed we have completed let me write a good a accomplishment completed ensemble learning so what we have seen we have seen bagging so in bagging the basic intuition is we have a data we take out different different data we train a different different model and then we aggregate the majority of votes from each of the model then you have then in bagging we have learned about one of the algorithm which is a random forest that just uses base learners with row sampling or uh, with feature sampling okay feature bagging and then we take out the boosting then we learned about the boosting where in boosting we learned about the technique okay and then we kind of converting the weak learners to the strong learners then then we talk about the gra gra g gradient boosting decision trees then we have talked about adaptive boosting which is adapt boost which is just through the exponential as a loss and then we talked about xg boost okay 
now we are now we in this section in this subsection we have talked about it's stacking we have talked about the stacking where we have seen a lot of examples a lot of examples using grid search and cetera using that 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 okay so now i hope that you understood everything about machine learning sir ensemble learning okay so if you are watching till now i am saying that you know that you do everything about supervised learning that you need to crack any kind of interview okay so just to pack your back and uh, uh, and be sure to subscribe my youtube channel it's, it just gives you a great motivation as the new deep learning course will is coming soon so you can pre-register there for free you can pre-register -pre there or if you want or if you want you can go to antern.co for detailed uh, cso there is cso one course which is uh, which is on again machine learning but it's it's this it's not that diff different con but it helps you to make a resume based projects it helps you to make the uh, everything means a, la a paper in larix you will get live doubt supports and etc just as i step to so that uh, just as you can go to cso one see the benefits for the course details and etc in the launch video which has already been launched Okay, so I think that it's you can also apply for a scholarship if you're a college student, but it's uh, totally fine for give. Uh, but the course price is like this. Okay, but it's totally based upon you. Uh, if, if you want, you can definitely consider it. Just supports to make free content more. Okay, so um, that is just just to me ask a question: Is is this course uh, the same as CSO one? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, but we in that we have talked about till. Uh, about neural networks then you have talked about gans convolution neural networks you have you will get a, a one to one session you will get jupyter notebooks which are amazing jupyter notebooks you will get early access to my books you will work with the team you will be getting an internship who will work on a real world project in antern and cetera okay so you can consider antern.co for this okay if you want the lab but you are to, if you complete this this course you all be very very comfortable in machine learning okay so that's it for this uh, section for this whole section on ensemble learning from the next section you can consider subscribing obviously from the next section we will be starting with and in between we can do some projects so from the next section we will be starting with unsupervised learning and i really hope that you will enjoy that series also okay so let's meet at the next section Okay, so now we have covered supervised learning, and you're gonna now consider a comfortable in supervised learning yourself. Supervised learning is one of the very vast, vast topic in machine learning that you have covered very smoothly, and I hope that you understood every each and everything about supervised learning. If you have any kind of doubt, you can either ask in your Discord community, or you can ask over to the. Uh, the, you can find the Discord community or you can come comment and then we can answer your questions. Okay, so um, that so let's uh, let's start with unsupervised learning. So what actually in supervised learning we are doing? We have our data set which is x i as well as y i and we have i equals to one all the way around to the end. And actually we have one supervisor which is y i. And we know what our output should look like. Means we know what our output should look like. Either be a continuous value, which is either a regression problem or a classification or a classification. Okay, so that that we know that our, what our output should look like. Okay, so here, so we know what our output should look like. So now, in case of unsupervised learning there is no supervisor so in case of unsupervised learning we have only x i we have only x i okay x1 x2 x3 all the way around to the x i which covers i equals to 1 all the way around to the m okay so here in unsupervised learning we don't have any kind of supervisor that will that that will tell us what will be either output or will help us train our model okay and we, we we don't know what our output should look like either not in continuous and not in class classification so you so you cannot you cannot frame your problem and you cannot even frame because if you if you don't have your labels then then you cannot frame, frame it in a supervised learning problem so what i have to do what what we have to do so but i'm gonna do just one or two is just to specify that the data we, we have a structured data 
as well as unstructured data. Structured data as well as unstructured data and structured data is simply the which is in a tabular for format and unstructured data which is just images which, which cannot be fed on tables or CSV files okay or in Excel okay so here so uh, this is our unsupervised learning because uh, we, we don't have our output okay so what what we have to do this is the main question to ask what we have to do if, if you don't have the labels so let's consider let's consider you have this uh, you have this x and y plane let me draw it very nicely so this diagram this section i'm just going to in this subsection i'm just going to give you an overview understanding and some of the applications of unsupervised learning Okay, so consider that you are working on uh, uh, just just you have your data points. Just you have your data points like this. You have your data points like this into an x and y plane onto the coordinate planes, and you have another data points which is like this. Okay, which is like this. And you may ask, hey, I use why can't we make a simple hyperplane? But you don't know, but you cannot frame it in classification problem. Just as a motivating example, I'm, I'm taking it as an example. Okay, so here just assume that you have this type of data set, okay, which is two-dimensional. Either you can make the three-dimensional also, you can make a three-dimensional also just by converting this. And now let's consider that you have uh, three-dimensional features. So here you have this. Here you have another examples. Okay, so you have this. So now you only have the these types of data points, which is this, this one is x1, x2, x3, these types of okay. So in uh, unsupervised learning, in unsupervised learning, what you do, you make cluster of your data, which is closest to one point. You make cluster of your data, of your data, you make cluster of your data. So as a motivating example, let's take an example. Of uh, let's take an example that you want to uh, segment your customers. Okay, uh, let's take an example that you are data scientist at Amazon. Uh, some 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 companies. So you are just uh, one or two uh, segment your customers. So how you will segment your customers? Uh, so what uh, you you will uh, just segment your customers. We have this data, but you don't have the Y labels. So what you will do? You will make the similar person into the one group similar person into the other group similar person let me do that my bad okay similar person and another group and similar person similar person similar person into the other group similar person and the other group so what you have done you have divided your customers into segments now data scientists or business stakeholders what they can do they can decide that okay we can give these uh, these customers a deal these customers a deal basis on their activity what they are doing or we can make a sub on another machine learning model that will detect what they are dealing what they want okay and and we can rec recommend products we can recommend products basically these these types of customers like milk or like watching the jewelry on on maybe an, on Amazon. So here, uh, on, so on here, uh, you uh, it will show the products of books or maybe some jewelries which are interested. And here maybe they will show you some kitchen, uh, kitchen groceries. Maybe these uh, customers are interested in these. And then these customers will be toys, maybe uh, some uh, TVs. Okay, so they will be recommended some products. And according to them, they earn a huge amount of money from recommending ads, etc. Okay, so so that's why you can see that how we how we frame our problem. And now you now it's quite clear to understand that as a as a motivating example of uh, customer segmentation, customer segmentation in Amazon. And and if you may think, hey, I use if you see that uh, let let me go to Amazon.com. You will see that I'm I'm being I'm being rec rec recommending, and they know what I recently view, what I recently view, and they are recommending the products. They are recommending the products, which you can see over here that they are recommending the products based on my views. Okay, so I'm I'm in some segment, I'm in some segment, and they are simply uh, recommending the basis products. And I hope that you understood. And, and I hope that you are understanding what I'm saying as a unsupervised framing the problem as an unsupervised learning. Okay, so that's what the customer segmentation or 
and the recommendation engine that is happening uh, in Amazon. Okay, so well, just uh, just see that just watch the too much talk videos on YouTube. Now what YouTube will do? YouTube will take yourself and add it in a segment of uh, the one who watches dogs, and now they will show you dog ads, maybe pedigree or etc. Whatever the food of the dog is, or they will recommend you the videos of dogs. Okay, so that's why we have customer segmentation as a motivating example and a recommendation is an as a more motivating example. So now I hope that is start making sense to you uh, to why we call this as unsupervised learning. Okay, now we so this is a, this is a in, in supervised learning in supervised learning we have two two approaches we have two approaches which is the regression which is the regression and next one is specification but in unsupervised learning we have something called as clustering okay so we cluster our outputs we, and if you plot in higher dimensional space then you will imagine that the most similar items are close to each other and most dissimilar items are very much far away okay so you can under understand like this okay so let's take a let's take an motivating example again. Uh, so let's see some of the applications of unsupervised learning. So I will spend a little bit amount of time telling you about the applications of uh, unsupervised learning, and in the in this next subject we will start with the making clusters. How what is intra? What is inter? How do we make the cluster? How do we evaluate our cluster? And etc. Okay, so uh, here I'm not talking about detail of in clustering about clustering, but I will definitely. But I just uh, told you that we divide our customer into segments. Okay, so here, um, here, uh, let's take an example. We have um, now we are taking the now we are taking a look at the applications. Now we are taking a look at the applications of unsupervised learning. So the first application of unsupervised learning is in biology which i have taken from wikipedia which is sequence analysis okay sequence analysis and it's simply uh, it's just put your gene um, just genes into the particular segment and this will help you in uh, various cases for biology student then you will understand then you will understand this uh, concept of sequence and analysis because you don't have you, what you do you segment your genes in a particular sex segments and you can diagnose if this person has any kind any kind of okay problem the next application which is in business which is in business uh, maybe a grouping of similar clusters for business needs so let's take an example that some company takes your data and then uh, then take your data and then simply group Grouping the similar cluster, grouping the similar, similar clusters, basis on the business need, and they can see the clusters, what they are, what their activity is, and they can provide deals, offers, according to their activity. Or the, okay. Another thing is we have a recommendation engine, recommendation engine, recommendation engine that recommends the products recommends the product that we have seen okay so in recommendation you have content filtering collaborative filtering content filtering content filtering collaborative filtering okay so which you can see uh, which which have been which is village advanced but i'm not going to talk about recommendation engine but as a motive example that that you whatever you see in amazon or google they just show you what you have seen so far because they have each and every because if you search anything you have the uh, they have that data okay for making animal models next is that in the uh, social network analysis facebook if you know about facebook uh, they 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 told hey they this this person has to uh, just share a post means that, that we do the social network analysis social network the means these for they they the group customers into the segments the group customers into the segments the group customers into the segments and the pro, and they show the accordingly uh, profiles okay another is we have in com computers uh, computer systems is we have our favorite in computer science we have image segmentation so what do i mean by image seg segmentation so you have an image you have an image and you segment your image you segment if you frame this problem as unsupervised learning so you ha have your image so you have your image like this and some someone is here someone is here someone is here so you segment these images 
seg segment these images okay uh, seg segment these images as a pixel wise you see that they are they have similar pixels but segmented uh, so so that's why you're saying segmenting and they, this can be used for classification or object detection object detection okay also uh, object detection like that okay so uh, just grouping your images into segments by using maybe pixels etc okay because we don't have uh, labels for why another motivating example in natural language processing is, is sentiment analysis means uh, just to pro just seeing whether it be a negative or the positive okay so what uh, let's take an example that you have this uh, that you, that we have this sentence okay this sentence and another sentence okay so it will group the positive sentence and the negative sentence okay so now you will see now now you will see now what what you will do you will go and see one of the sentence you will go and go and see one of the sentence go and see the one of the sentence and see okay if it is positive then you will whole whole cluster which is maybe 10000 10000 uh, sentences as a positive and you take this to hold then the maybe whatever the number of as a uh, negative so may, let's let's take a let's ela, let let me elaborate this nlp task of sentiment analysis let's take an example sentiment analysis sentiment analysis so for an example assume that you have a 1 uh, billion uh, text uh, data points in text which are text textual okay so convert as a word embeddings mean numbers now, if it is very, very hard to label, it will compute, if it, it will take time, it will take cost, it will take, uh, because if you hire some people, you have to give them money. Okay, so you have to label 1 billion. So how you have to do? So what you will do, you convert them into a uh, higher dimensional space and you segment uh, the closest text, which is called the word embeddings, closest word embeddings, means the word embeddings and sentences are here and then then you see one sentence is from this cluster what another sentence from this cluster now assume that this cluster is a positive sentence you label all let's say 50 million as a positive and hold 50 million as the negative okay so uh, the, so you just require it to uh, just you don't require a lot of time for working with nlp tasks okay so that's the uh, that's that's for nlp tasks Another is anomaly detection. Okay, what is anomaly detection? And and an anomaly detection, an anomaly, we have anomaly, anomaly detection, anomaly detection, where we de de determine outliers in your model. So as an example, that you have the exact age like this. Now assume that your data point is here. So this is actually outlier. This is actually outlier. So if you cluster it, if you cluster it here, then this will be ignored, and this 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 can help in in uh, removing. But in uh, but using maybe the TV scan, isolation forest, they but most many of them maybe some k-means uh, just take that out outlier into this cluster. Okay, so let's assume there is a then it is also closest to then take take that into that cluster. Okay, so we have a TV scan which helps us into anomaly detection, which is again a unsupervised learning model okay in, in a dense based reasons great so we have seen a lot of applications of unsupervised learning we have seen a lot and i hope that you understood really and in the next in the next subsection we will start talking about clustering okay we will deep dive into the clustering to help you better understand the topic we'll talk about clustering we will talk about inter cluster intra, intra cluster how we evaluate our cluster Okay, how we evaluate that or that that we have a good clustering. What what are some of the types of clustering like partial, hierarchical? Okay, then we talk about center-based, continuity-based, density-based, and then we'll talk about one formal center-based algorithm, which is k-means clustering algorithm. Okay, and then we are done with supervised unsupervised learning. Okay, and then I will give you a little bit overview of deep learning. Okay, so that you could better understand your deep learning journey. Uh, just a ev ev evaluation and then we will do some projects based on machine learning so that you could get more feel about machine learning and you are more comfortable and be sure to do the problem sets which are uploaded in github to help you under understand the topic or master the topic 
Okay, so that's it for this section, and I hope that you will that you have enjoyed this section. I'll okay, so now we will start talking about clustering. We will get into math, and we will see some more algorithms like k-means clustering. Then we will see hierarchical clustering algorithms, which is agglomerative and divisive. And then we are end with unsupervised learning. So we are entering the last phases of this course, and I really hope that you enjoyed this course a lot. Okay, as I enjoyed making this course with, with very curiosity, with very energetic uh, mood. So I think that you are also very energetic till now, and like me. And you may also thinking, hey, Ayusha, what about the projects? And the projects are in the last section to help you to get feel of everything about machine learning. Means after you learn all of these things, performance matrix, algorithms, now you will be able to build state-of-the-art models. Okay, so I'm very excited to see you all there. And it means in this section, last section, we're we'll building back-to-back -back project. And the course website is also in the description down box below. You can see what what problem set is that and you can download and start working on that problem set okay so you I, I hope that you're uh, watching this video did totally worth it even I was making video or was totally worth it okay so what we are going to start talking about we are going to start talking about we are going to start talking about uh, clustering in the in our previous section subsection will be we have talked about some of the applications of clustering we have talked about let let me choose a pen a good pen we have talked about applications we have talked about applications of clustering we have seen what unsupervised learning is what unsupervised learning is and we have seen the diagram and diagram some lot of applications like in biology and business and etc we have seen the applications of unsupervised learning and then i've showed you the data okay and then i've given you an overview of what we do in clustering okay so let's start with uh, clustering okay so how what 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 we it what the clustering is what the clustering is but don't just bear with me with, with my handwriting because I don't know what happened to my pen. It's very working bad. But no worries. Let's start. So here, uh, let's assume that you have this. Uh, you have this. Mm, you have the great. Oops. Uh, let me. Why it is not being removed? Let's assume that you have a x and y plane where you have a two two features uh, where you have a two features like this if, if I draw a straight line if I draw a straight line okay so here so here you have this and let's assume that you have here as a point here okay you have this as a point and another point and another point is green ones which is here okay so no 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 uh, in unsupr in unsupervised learning in unsupervised learning all data are same why I forgot no worries I usually forgot everything okay so what you have you have these features uh, red features and you have this here so what you usually do in uh, in in case of clustering you segment your clusters you segment your data into different different clusters oh, oh my god why this not happening you uh, you segment your cluster. So you have this data so you segment this cluster you segment this cluster to be going into this this and the second cluster to be going into this okay so this is your first cluster this is your second cluster okay so this is your basic into basic uh, thing about clustering that that we have talked okay so we'll see some of the terminology in uh, this so let's draw a very good uh, representation of this diagram so let me delete all these links and let me choose a black pen it works best in the in case of white okay so you let me draw uh, a straight line with x plane okay so you have x and y plane x and y plane and here you have the data point here you have the data point like this and here you have the data point like this okay so what do you do you segment your um, data points into clusters use you cluster it out so some of the terminology is you cluster this you cluster this let me draw a good cluster you cluster this and then you cluster this okay 
So let's leave that. I, do, I don't want to make it like that. Let's leave that for now. Okay, so you cluster this out and then what happens? So here is a terminology alert. Uh, means the, in terminology, we have something called as intra cluster. We have something called as intra cluster, intra cluster and inter cluster. Just, uh, just listen to what I'm saying. Intra cluster and intra, inter, inter cluster. So what do I mean with these intra and inter? I mean with this inter, in, intra and inter is inter cluster is the distance between the cluster, okay, between, between the clusters across all the clusters. So inter cluster is the difference, is the distance between across the clusters. So here we have one cluster. Here we have second cluster. So inter, inter cluster is the distance between this cluster and this cluster. It's the distance between this cluster and this cluster. So that's why it's known as inter cluster. Okay. The second type of his intra cluster, which is the distance between within the cluster that points within the cluster, within the cluster. So it may be like this. This is called the, this is called the intra cluster. This is called the intra cluster. I hope that you are uh, that it is making sense. You have this x and y plane, and you have this this kind of thing. And what what we have to do? This is this is called the intra cluster, where we have the distance between two clusters, or maybe two or more than clusters across all the clusters. And intra cluster is the dis dif dis distance between the data points inside that cluster. Okay, uh, great. So we can think think something like that is. We want what we want in this case if, if you are taking as a terminology that so we want our intra cluster to be small intra cluster intra cluster to be small to be small and inter cluster inter cluster to be large. What do I mean with this uh, small and large? I mean with this small and large is you have this intra cluster intra cluster is the distance between this and this and the clusters takes whoever is similar or group is a cluster is just as in it's a grouping of the similar objects that they are similar to one another so they, they should be closest the data point should be closest and the intra cluster of these should be closest okay and the inter cluster inter cluster means the similarity dissimilarity between two clusters should be maximum okay so here we have written our optimum optimization objective uh, we have we we want uh, our inter cluster our inter cluster which i did as i n should be large and i and a should be intra cluster should be small okay so that's the that's the basic definition of that's the basic uh, ba basic terminology that, that we have seen and i hope that is making sense okay so we can frame some problem we can frame something over here what we can frame is we can frame an optimization objective we can frame a ev evaluation technique but before that why do we even need so let's assume let's assume that you have this uh, you have this cluster you have this cluster you have this cluster like this you have this cluster one two three four five six seven one two three four five six seven okay so here we have this and who can tell you who can tell you that they, these are the perfect clusters these are the perfect clusters uh, either you will tell here you I'm, I'm able to see I can tell that these are the perfect clusters but assume that we have uh, three dimensional we have four dimensional we have 50 dimensional we have 80 dimensional we have 100 dimensional we have black dimensional so what you will do in that case so we have evaluation techniques okay we have optimum uh, evaluation technique that will help us to identify to ev evaluate our clustering or unsupervised learning a uh, clustering model okay clustering model that will help us uh, ideally to understand to to ev ev evaluate how good our clustering is okay so let's see how uh, some of some of the evaluation uh, techniques okay so the first one we have which is called dun index okay so the first one we have is called d u n n index 
So this is this is a very funny name, but it's a very guy you can still read about in Wikipedia page. So it's uh, so let let me first write the equation. So d equals, which is a done index, equals to the maximum maximum of i and j means the maximum uh, should maximum distance between i and j divided by or by maximum k uh, maximum distance d dash between k okay so here what i'm telling here we have this we have this intra cluster we have this intra cluster here we have maximum intercluster distance maximum intercluster distance intercluster distance okay so ideally it is framing our problem of intra and inter that our inter, inter should be small and our interas should be large okay so here we are not assuming should be small we are assuming what is the largest maximum distance okay so if every everyone is small then the largest may be 0.0 like that okay so maybe something like that will be there so we are just changing this maximum okay we have maximum over here just don't be confused we are telling minim, minimum intra that just ideally means that you want the distance between intercluster to be small so that's why you are taking the largest whoever the largest whoever the have a largest distance okay so that's why uh, so 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 you so you can evaluate your model and this 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 sim this the the denominator simply means that the the distance between your intra cluster okay the distance between your clusters the distance between should be ideally large not too much small okay so that's the that's the and if you if you've seen if you if you sense it's math mathematically you can see that d should be high d should be high to be a good good cluster d should be high okay so this is the evaluation technique for clustering your model and i think that you understood done index so let's recapitulate what we have seen so far is we have let me remove this uh, let me let me remove this so we have seen that we have some of some of the terminology so we have this small x and y plane where we have this one two three four five six one two three four five six uh, again one more okay so here we have this the diff the distance between the the distance between the the distance between two clusters the distance between two clusters is called as intra cluster means across all the clusters maybe some cluster will be here another cluster will be here it's across all the clusters the is is called the intra cluster and the distance between within the cluster within the data points is known as the intercluster is known as the intercluster and core idea is for any evaluation matrix of your clustering model is your intra cluster should be large intra cluster should be large large and intercluster should be small okay so we have the, the we have talked about about a done index we have talked about a done index we have talked about done index and done index is simply uh, uh, e evaluation matrix so the done index is written as d equals to the max of the distance between i and j which are two data points which is obviously intercluster which is obviously the first num numerator is inter cluster okay and the de denominator is simply the intra cluster where you want the maximum distance maximum distance between the uh, values okay so this this is the basic definition and you may think here yeah, you should have told about inter inter cluster should be small but we are checking the maximum so that we can evaluate we are checking the what is the maximum in that cluster that has the distance so we can evaluate so everyone should minimum so our d should be high in that case okay so i think that you un understood done index also so let's see one more uh, one more ev evaluation technique which is for uh, clustering which is uh, just just i'm telling you just uh, some some constraints to be added i i, I just have seen the equations it's just some conditions to be added in i and j where here in i here in i i should be i should be is greater than i should be greater than or equals to 1 
or it should be uh, and it should be smaller than or equals to j and j should be smaller than or equals to n and n here is the number of training examples and for k constraints of k is your k should be smaller than or equals to um, it should should be at least smaller should be uh, smaller than or equals to uh, n okay so that's the that's the basic definition of uh, uh, that's that's the basic constraints but i don't find it's a very uh, kind of thing but here just understand this the numerator the numerator is just a maximum intra in, in inter cluster and here maximum intra cluster okay and the reason why we are we, we want to evaluate so that's why we are taking the uh, maximum so if it is maximum then it is bad okay so our d index should be high if you sense it mathematically okay so another evaluation technique that that i've seen so far let let me go back actually okay so here i am on my another thing and let me remove this okay so another tech technique another technique is here in front of you which is the davis bolden index davis davis bolden bolden index this is also like a done index what you want here we, we denote is a db equals two we we take it as a db equals two one over n i equals to one all the way around to the n and then you take out the maximum take out the maximum where j is not equals to i sigma i plus sigma j divided by the distance between c i and c j okay and this is just like the clusters and for more information about what is this you can refer to an uh, to a wikipedia page okay there is a more derivation etc has been already done over there okay so that's the davies baldwin index but most to most probably this 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 the don index used properly in the country in the whole uh, so for ev evaluation of your of your model so let me highlight it this one okay so we have seen uh, davis baldwin index now it's time for uh, learning a little bit more in that about what the what the upper means what actually the definitions of what was the definition of your favorite clustering okay so one line definition i could tell about clustering is in clustering you have and it's a it's a grouping uh, can i write it yeah it's it's better to write it okay it's better better with me or or you, or you can write with me also so the a clustering is simply grouping grouping of objects grouping of objects or elements objects such that in such a way i could say in such a way such a way such such a way our uh, our our ob object our object in a, should be should be similar similar to each to the to each group where it is in each group and differ from another cluster cluster differ from another cluster okay so that's the basic definition basic definition of clustering and a very good definition and in clustering in clustering uh, we have two cases intra cluster and inter cluster where we want our intra cluster is the measure of distance between a, um, just a distance within the cluster and inter cluster is difference between across all the clusters okay so this is the basic definition of a clustering and i hope that you understood everything okay so now we have seen done index we have seen clustering now it's time for learning about getting into depth of clustering is about types of clustering how many types of clustering we get in our life and then we will just after talking about types of clustering we will end this uh, subsection and in the next section we will be talking about uh, one algorithm which is k-means and the next subsection we'll be talking about a hierarchical clustering which is agglomerative and divisive clustering okay so but before that let's uh, let's see some of the types of clustering okay so the types of clustering which includes the types the types of clustering let me uh, choose it the color so some some of the types of clustering are first one is partitional based clustering partitional i'm just writing in short partitional 
partitional based approach or clustering okay so what is partitional based clustering so assume assume that you have this uh, that, that you have this x and y plane and you have this data point like this and you have this data point like this okay so what you will do you will partition it you will partition it into two clusters and you are done okay so here we have an algorithm which is called km means algorithm that we'll study in our next subsection okay for in a partitional base approach then we have hierarchical clustering hierarchical hierarchical clustering clustering okay so in these types of uh, hierarchical clustering we have like a dendogram if you have seen a den dendogram then you know about uh, uh, hierarchical clustering just 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 as a just if if you know so let's assume that you have this data point like this you have this data point uh, let me do it here that you have this here like this okay so you have this four points you have this four points and again you have p1 p2 p3 p4 and if you plot it the points looks like this so these two this p1 and p2 looks close this p1 and p2 this uh, p2 and p3 just just assume that this is a p2 and p3 this this this, this looks close so you just cluster it out okay so the p2 so what you do you just make a dendrogram just like this uh, that p2 and p3 are now a cluster which is the same though, which which we can consider p2 union p3 okay now th these are the cl two, two clusters now if you see the closest structure is this uh, p4 so what you will do you will again make a nested cluster now you uh, now this this will look like this and now what you will do you will attach p4 over here p p4 as a dendrogram okay and then what you do then here is this this is the p p1 is the closest then you cover it and then this whole and this whole now after that you will be end data being a dendrogram you will be able to see a den dendrogram which you can see over here so here after which is p1 like this okay now you can see now we cannot uh, burn for we, uh, we have a large cluster which we have a large uh, cluster now we are done this 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 is called the traditional dendrogram we can you can see on internet about this so what we have seen so far we have we have agglomerative stru structure we are going up means we are um, just we are going up like this means we have this p1 p2 p3 p4 we are uh, we these are own clusters by themselves in first these are their own clusters we have four clusters over here we have four clusters now we cluster this p2 and p3 then we cluster p3 and p4 because they are close to each other then we construct p1 to p4 okay so now we got our full dendrogram okay so that's that is usually agglomerative agglomerative cluster we have something called as divisive we are in divisive and i'm talking about in hierarchical clustering application uh, which is agglomerative and di divisive and divisive we have given p1 uh, p2 p2 uh, we have something called as p3 let's let's assume that 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 we have a b c d okay so a it's just it, it, it will match if i do that a b c d okay so e let's assume e also so you divide this okay so what 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 you do you simply you divise it okay like this uh, First, you divide A and B, A, B as one cluster, then you divide C, D, E, then you have C, D, E, okay, then you divide A and B into different, different cluster. So, you have this whole den dendrogram like structure like this. Now, you are, uh, now you are, uh, this is just opposite of agglomerative. We are just, here we are making up, here we are making up, here we are making uh, a different, different cluster, okay. Now, we do divide our C, then we have a D, E, now we divide our D. And E. Now this is our divisive. Okay, so we divide our whole cluster into different different groups, which are most closest to each other. Okay, we will study in detail about this uh, in in, a, in our uh, next subsection where we will talking about hierarchical clustering. Okay, after that we have something known as after that we have something known as well, well separated clusters where it is well separated clusters okay just just i'm writing it's well separated means we, we you can easily your model can easily uh, separate well separated well separated then you have the fourth one which is center based which is also k means clustering is this 
center based algorithm okay continuity based we have something called as nearest neighbors k nearest neighbors okay and then then we have density based which is often known as db scan db scan okay which which you have you will get in prop problem set to learn about this uh, db scan okay great so we have seen a lot about clustering and i hope that you really enjoyed this session this sub sub subsection of clustering and from the next section we'll be talking about lowest algorithm or k means clustering but i will definitely try to complete in no time so that you can you could get a more more a prone uh, knowledge of clustering and uh, able to make uh, unsupervised learning models okay so let's see so let's see uh, as uh, just re recapitulate what what we have seen so far uh, we have seen what is clustering clustering is uh, just a grouping of similar objects in such a way that these objects are similar to each other within the cluster or our inter cluster uh, our inter inter cluster should be different should be maximum and our intra cluster should be small and what is the difference between inter and inter inter and intra and in inter we have uh, the distance between uh, across the all the clusters and that's why we need a maximum and we have intra in which our points our points within the cluster should be minimum okay means more similar okay other than the other clusters okay so that's that's the that's the basic intuition about this and uh, uh, the clustering then we have seen how we can evaluate so i have talked about one index which one evaluation index which is done index okay and done index it is used to uh, take out the evaluate you it is used to evaluate your uh, clustering model and what is what what is what it does he it, it takes out the maximum what is the maximum in inter cluster what is the maximum to evaluate the performance uh, between between two points and it takes out the maximum of the uh, this the the, the the denominator is a uh, intra cluster and a um, numerator sorry yeah the de denominator is intra cluster is the numerator is intra cluster and the de denominator is inter cluster okay and then we have something called as davis bounding bounding box and in index this is this is just uh, it it will take a lot of time to teach this but it's out of the boundary course but it's just here and is the number of a clusters where we have a sigma i plus six sigma g and where i is not equal to g we want the maximum and then we are taking out the distance between two clusters and then we are dividing it up okay so that's why that's what the full uh, clustering based models is now i hope that you understood about clustering uh, now it's time now now it's time for learning about now 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 it's time to learn about something new which is in subsection where we will talk about uh, where we have talked about four, four five types of uh, clustering which is partitional based hierarchical clustering and well separated and center based and db scan okay so we will talk about partitional hierarchical and well separated is also and center based where you your prop problem set will be on db scan okay so here we are done with this subsection now in the next section we'll start talking about k-means till then have a good day okay so now we have talked about various things like clustering we have given a part one in subsection i've given you unsupervised learning applications and then we have talked about various applications of unsupervised learning and then i've just given you an overview of clustering in this first subsection in the next subsection i've given you the intuition behind clustering i've given a formal definition of a clustering we have talked about to enter cluster intra cluster we had talked about the evaluation matrix like ton index davies balding in index and i've made you understand each and every equations and i've also helped you to understand what are the types of clustering which are available like partitional based hierarchical clustering then you have a center based world separated density based continuity based okay so we have this kind of uh, uh, clustering which are already available now we will talk about a partitional and center center based clustering which is k means algorithm as this example was taken from andrew nang course of machine learning but he has uh, but it's too much uh, 37 years old but i have i have made it very very updated for 2020 just that, that this this example is from andrew nang okay so 
uh, I've also included k-means plus plus algorithm what the k-means plus plus algorithm does and some of the variations of k-means and then also I have talked about in detail what are the what are the, the limitations of k-means clustering what are, how we initialize the centroids what are the time complexity of k-means clustering okay so then we have talked about the full machine full k-means clustering algorithm how we evaluate our k-means clustering algorithm okay With the Euclidean distance so that's what we are going to start talk about just uh, be sure to just sit sit somewhere and uh, see and take a copy and pen to understand okay but before that what we are going to study is k-means clustering algorithm sometimes so, so the synonym of k-means clustering is Lloyd's algorithm it's something sometimes called Lloyd's it's sometimes called Lloyd's algorithm Lloyd's algorithm okay so it may be some people pronounce it as a Lloyd's algorithm or a k-means clustering algorithm okay but I like to uh, pronounce with k-means okay so uh, just just as, as an example we have this uh, data set we have this data set over here now what what we do in clustering what we do in clustering we initialize centroid uh, which is k okay we initialize centroid which is de denoted by k so here what it is a hyperparameter so what we are going to do we are going to initialize k we are going to initialize k as uh, we are going to initialize k which is two uh, two centroids and centroids is just uh, the the initial you will get to know with, with with visualization so what you do you initialize with two points onto this so here you initialize two points like this the the first point is over here the first point is over here and the second point is over here and these are called the centroids you will get to know why we call it as a centroids but these are called the centroids okay these are called the centroids and here in this example k is equals to 2 because we have taken k equals to 2 because uh, as we have a two centroids and and we randomly initialize these centroids okay so we'll see the in initialization uh, just after some ppts this has uh, some slides okay so you initialize your model now and now this is the first iteration now in the first and first you in initialize then what you do you do the assignment step what do i mean by assignment step first you initialize then what you do you do assignment step like this you assign all the all the particular value means the red to red color and blue to blue color you can see over here that we have that we have done red to all the red color which are closest to this cent cent centroid and this uh, blue we have covered that is uh, all the centroids which are closest to that blue okay now what what we will do we will take out the average of these points we will take out the average of these whole blue points and then we will take out the average of this red points and then what and then what we will do we will average it we will average it like this we will average it now after averaging we will make that percent right to at average and then what we will do again we take out the uh, again we do the assignment step like this we just assign we, we just update our values which are so closest to this sense and right now you can see that the blue becomes like this now then what and then what we will do we will again move the centroid again we will take take out the average and move the centroid like this we will move move the sand centroid and then we will make this uh, red red means who those those are closest to blue uh, blue and these are two red okay then again you do then again you do like this as a taking out the average and making the color as blue and red okay now you can see that you that what you have done you have a very good cluster means you have initialized here and then you take out the average then you move to that centroid and again you update the update the cluster and then again you move that like that okay so we have done like that and i i have just shown you a very good visualizations of this k-means so let's see again in a little bit more fundamental way okay so here is our data and then you can see the data is looks like this so here what we had done we had in we had simply initialized two centroids like this and then what we have done we had take we had just uh, make the make uh, the points which are closer to that blue to blue and red to that red 
okay now you can see over here then what what we have done we had taken out the average and then we moved our centroid to that average okay and how we take out you do you all know how do we take out the average you, you just take out the number of observations and then divide uh, or some the num the sum over the observation divided by the fre frequency over the ob observation you just do that and then you update it and then you again make the whole uh, assignment step and then what you do then you again up uh, make uh, take out the average now you again update the points you can see like this and then you again take the average you again make the points as like this okay and after uh, until and unless your centroids are not changing you keep doing this okay so here is a formal algorithm here is a formal algorithm and, and you can see over here after seventh iteration it is not changing so we converged we our algorithm is converged okay so this is how whole k-means clustering algorithm works in visualization so let's see uh, the algorithm in detail okay so what you do uh, first of all here's an algorithm I'm writing just bear with me but just bear with my handwriting so I'm just writing an algorithm so here is my algorithm with the reds writing with the red color so uh, let let me write here is your algorithm algorithm okay so you do for k centroids k for centroids okay so you you have to choose k okay you have to choose k which is k where is a hyper parameter okay then you repeat these two process then you repeat these two process the first process is cluster assignment cluster assignment you assign all the clusters you assign all the cluster you assign all the cluster and then update take take out the average and then uh, take out that cluster assign you assign the clusters and then you take out the average and then you make that point so you then then you do the updation of a cluster okay then you up, recompute the centroid okay then you recompute the centroid okay then you how you how you recompute the centroid the centroid it simply means you make the uh, you take out the average and then you assign that cluster okay that cluster to 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 the nearest data point okay again you have take out the average until and unless until you do until you do until uh, your uh, your centroid are not changing your centroid your centroids your centroids are not changing are not changing okay where it's it it's means that your algorithm is converged now you don't need okay so you repeat these two process like clusters cluster assignment means assign the cluster with blue or red and then you update your centroid and take up by taking out the average and then again doing doing this taking out the average again doing this like that okay so this is the basic algorithm of k-means clustering algorithm and i hope that you understood about k-means so let's under and let's understand a little bit more way is a little bit more further into just a recapitulation of k-means k-means clustering is an algorithm also called the Lloyd's algorithm then we what what we do so let's go back to our visualizations Okay, so here is our data and what, what we do is in, we randomly, we randomly initialize two centroids, okay, not every case just, just have taken, it is a hyperparameter, we have just taken two for this case, okay, then what you do, then you do the second step, which is, uh, which first you do the cluster assignment, you do assign all the cluster with the closest with the same points in, into the cluster, then what you do, then you do the recompute the centroid by taking out the average and moving the centroid, okay then you do the cluster assignment then you assign the cluster like this then you again move the centroid okay Re recompute the centroid then you assign the like like that and then you take out the average and again you uh, uh, again you do the same you take out the average and then move your centroid okay now now in the next iteration it is not changing now your k-means clustering is converged now you are done okay so here's a good, good algorithm you will be able to see on the internet the same thing like first you do you choose k how many number of k uh, clusters then you assign the clusters recompute and then until and unless your centroids are not are are not are not changing okay so this is whole about k-means clustering algorithm and i really really hope that you understood k-means clustering algorithm so now let's see some uh, evaluation techniques of k-means clustering algorithm them okay evaluation technique how do we evaluate our k-means clustering algorithm so for an example 
so for an example here is my example so for an, for, for an example we are given we are given uh, no not in for an example is just of just just I'm giving you the optimization objective so you are given so you are given X d dimensional space d dimensional space as well as k and the clusters which are this uh, and set i think the dictionary which is not which is in there is c1 c2 all the way around to the ck okay we have k clusters okay then what you do you want your uh, to optimize c you want to minimize this cost function you want to minimize this cost func function now what you do you take out i equals to 1 all the way around to the k where k where like x be the member of ci in mean the cluster now you take out the distance of x and c okay you want to minimize this cluster okay so uh, just it, it 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 will make sense don't worry here we have ci which is equals to the centroid so let's see let's see what do what do i mean with this uh, distance between x and c so what we are told that what what we are told like uh, we are we are told that we have that that we are given x day dimensional space and we have clusters which is c1 c2 so all the way around to the ck where we have k clusters now what we have an, we have this equation i equals to 1 all the way around to the k we are going to add till every clusters where each where each x where each x is the member of cluster means we are this data point is the member of this cluster okay now you take out the distance between you take out the distance between this data point and this uh, cluster this this cluster okay and this should be this should be minimized you, you, your distance should be minimal your distance should be minimal as compared to this your distance should be minimal so that's what it is telling over here okay so i hope that you understood with the help of a visualization okay so ci is the centroid okay uh, cluster centroid okay so how do we take out the distance for taking out the distance we have something called as a euclidean distance euclidean euclidean for taking out the distance we have something called you there are a lot more distances which are already available you can take a look at it online but it's a very used euclidean distance so what is Euclidean distance? In Euclidean distance, we have D, uh, we have two points P and Q, okay? Means we are doing for each and every point, I equals to one, all the way around to the N, means number of training, training example, QI minus PI squared, okay? And it's taking out the square root of, the, the square root of that, okay? So this is, the, this is the Euclidean distance that just measures the distance between two points like this and you can see more about this onto the internet how we derive this equation what is this for who have found it etc 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 okay and sometimes and this this cost function of k means clustering is called is called s s e means sum square error sum square error and you can also see it is just like the done index following the inter and intra cluster here we want to minimize our in uh, our intra cluster over here we want to minimize our intra cluster we want to minimize our intra cluster okay so that's the basic definition uh, that's the whole thing about whole story about a uh, k-means clustering algorithm and i really hope that you understood k-means and then we have talked about evaluation techniques for k-means and that's it for uh, k-means and now we will talk about why it matters means the basic definition of why it matters which the random initialization as we have seen that we initialize our centroids these centroids are randomly you can see that we have initialized randomly so why it matters how it can cause the problem it can cause the problem so here we had just uh, we had just chosen we you can see over here here over here here that we have in iteration number one we have three centroids iteration number two we take another the average compute then we do the we come we we simply what you have done we cluster we assign the cluster with the same centroid and then we recompute by taking out the average in the second iteration then in the third iteration then the fourth iteration and the fifth iteration and the sixth iteration you can see over here that how uh, we you can easily see that we have a good cluster over here but you can see in here that we, you have you just it, it it can cause how it can cause problems problem is in iteration number you have just randomly initialized now you can see whole story changed 
whole story changed you can see over here okay so that's the big problem so that's why we do uh, which is very not recommended to, uh, to to choose it randomly so researchers discussed about it <laughs> researchers had talked about it how we can use it how we can make something good so we uh, re researchers found that uh, k means plus plus something called as k means plus plus algorithm works best works best uh, in, uh, uh, which is which I'm which I'm gonna to tell you okay so K means plus plus algorithm what it does it simply select multiple numbers it simply select multiple numbers as in random we are we are just taking any random but it selects multiple numbers and select the smallest error okay so that's that's what the uh, K means plus plus does it selects selects multiple multiple means is just a it's just a multiple a sample from the numbers multiple numbers and checks and checks which number which number minimizes which number minimizes minimizes the SSE the SSE which is the which minimizes the int int intra cluster distance okay so that's the k means plus plus and it is usually used in everywhere okay rather rather than randomly okay so we have talked about uh, why why we choose importance uh, why we choose um, over uh, ran why, why we choose k means plus plus over uh, ran randomly because maybe it can happen sometimes okay a very good a very core god if the luck is not with us it can cause a big problem in further okay so how, how we have to deal with this kind of situations for dealing with these kind of situations we have something called as uh, k means plus plus which will help us to do which it just selects the multiple multipliers and selects select the one select the numbers which has the smallest error okay okay so uh, let's see uh, you may th you may think you may think hey Ayush hey Ayush how do we select how many number of a centroid that we need okay so that's the that's 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 also the best uh, that's that's also the big problem so we have something called as elbow method we have something called as elbow method and what is does we have elbow method like this we have written the k clusters one two three four five six okay now in, in if, if you if you have taken k equals to one your error is high to uh, if you've taken a k equals to two your error is going down like this like an elbow like an elbow okay so here you can see the elbow turns around at three so you select this elbow you select k equals to three okay so the, this is your loss this is your number of a k and this is your loss which is decreasing SSE, SSE. okay so that's why how we use elbow method either you can use grids or cv or rand randomized to search to tune this parameter i think that will not work because uh, we, we don't have labels but uh, elbow method works best when you plot it you know when you plot it and see well, what number of a k you need okay so that's it that's that's the following and let's re revise so that we are on the same pace so what what we do when k means clustering algorithm we choose number of a k using the elbow method not now just uh, just i choose we ran randomly and then we chip plot it and then then we choose the k and then what i've done then we repeat a like cluster assignment like we assign all the cluster with the same clusters then then we compute the centroid by taking out the average okay then you uh, then you keep repeating this until and unless your centroids are not changing and then uh, the evaluation technique for your k-means or loss function for your k-means is the the you want to minimize your intra cluster by just taking out the distance between two this this distance between the the points between points inside the cluster okay and then that's called sum square error and here and you take out the distance using the Euclidean distance that just uh, that just take out the difference between two points by doing the summation over there okay great so uh, why how 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 we choose the in, in how how we choose the cent centroids okay the initializing those uh, centroids for initializing we have seen, seen over here that randomly initialize can cause a very big problem so that's why we have something called as k means plus plus which will help us to select a uh, centroids using uh, what it does it select it does for multiple runs 
and checks where uh, and checks the numbers who where uh, the SSE is uh, low okay and how we select the number of a K we select the number of a K by using elbow method where uh, it the elbow is where elbow is turning around like in as a hand as a hand if you draw it like this if you draw it like this if I draw a hand over here if it draw it like this okay so here elbow is there so your loss is decreasing with k equals to one is your loss is this 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 okay so you choose the elbow k equals to three and it works best okay so we had talked about these things and now it's time for ending up k-means clustering the chapter of k-means clustering which is uh, just uh, just ending the topic with our favorite what are the some of the limitations of k-means clustering algorithm and what is the first time complexity so the time complexity of k-means clustering algorithm the time complexity the time complexity of k-means clustering algorithm if, if you don't know about from if you don't know dsa leave it okay ignore this uh, the time complexity is order is time complexity order of n times k and n is the input size k k is the number of clusters i num number of iterations d the dimensions okay uh, this this is uh, this is this 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 is what the time complexity of that okay so it's depend because the time complexity depends upon your size if you don't know about time complexity i have one something called as dsa mastery course uh, soon more putting 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 videos onto that so um, first four lectures are based on time complexity you can watch that just go one new where I will just show you where you can go okay uh, some some of some of the limitations of k-means clustering algorithm some of the limitations of k-means clustering algorithm is it's 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 very sensitive to outliers okay so let's assume that you have this that that you have this oops i why uh, powerpoint control z does not work i don't know why so uh, here we draw an x and y plane and here we have x here we have y and let's assume that we have made it and uh, here we have the outlier here we have it is closer so it, it will take that outlier in that cluster so we don't want that so it is very prone to outlier means we have we have to detect the outlier and it can be solved using density based uh, even i just don't know what s with what what's there so it, it can be solved outliers problems can be solved using a db scan which you have a pro problem set to solve okay means you, you have to read the wikipedia page uh, and uh, write a uh, go google docs onto the db scan what you understood okay and then it's 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 like different sizes different distances maybe they're causing the problem okay but the main main problem is outlier okay came says so we have a i have given you the thing that db scan hierarchical clustering works on these types of issues okay so that's it for this k-means clustering algorithm and f where you can uh, record uh, where you can uh, find the time complexity videos and it's very very recommend uh, just it's a it's very very helpful if you subscribe this youtube uh, the new era youtube channel which you can find um, which which you can easily is, is easily find onto the uh, youtube just by uh, writing new era where i have 502 subscribers as of now okay so you can subscribe that and see the dsa mastery course where we have more than 23 videos already uploaded a uh, long lecture so you can learn about time complexity from there also okay so that's it for this sub subsection you will now have a toolkit of various algorithms various techniques various things okay so now let's meet at the next section where we'll be talking about hierarchical hierarchical clustering i will give it a thought so that it should make sense okay so let's meet at the next subsection okay so now we have talked about clustering we have talked about unsupervised learning we have talked about one of the partitional based or center based approach which is k-means clustering with k-means plus plus algorithm for random initialization okay so i hope that you understood everything in unsupervised learning and if we have gone so much further into unsupervised learning now we are capable of learning hierarchical clustering which is one of the most favorite uh, means one of the most favorite uh, and the best clustering techniques that include uh, including partitional based and then we have a hierarchical clustering okay 
so this is the this is this the, this is what we are going to do we are going to start with an introduction to a hierarchical clustering to help you better understand what a hierarchical clustering is then i will go further into different um just just a quick recap onto partitional based okay then i will show you the visual representation of hierarchical clustering and what is the dendrogram okay and then we will move further into understanding the two two types of hierarchical clustering which is called agglomerative and divisive okay so agglomerative clustering and divisive clustering we will dig dive into agglomerative clustering and we will just to take a look at the divisive okay and then we will go further into understanding the agglomerative clustering algorithm and then we will see uh, then we will compute that algorithm manually and then we will see the intercluster similarity between our uh, two points okay but if if, if 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 all the words or tech technical terms are going above your mind leave it means uh, uh, just ignore it the words as of now let's start with hierarchical clustering just introduction to hierarchical clustering okay so what is hierarchical clustering hierarchical clustering is that you have a hierarchy of clusters okay so for an example what I'm going to do what I'm going to do is I'm going to take four points I'm going to take four points p1 uh, let's let's not take it here let's take p1 here p1 then i'm going to take p2 then i'm going to take p3 then i'm going to take p4 okay for an example i've taken these four points and now we want to cluster it out okay now we want to cluster it out so how do we cluster it so for clustering so for clustering we have our favorite means we can simply see okay this distance is small these are more similar we are going to do this we are going to cluster it out like this and we have this uh, p3 and p4 how do we cluster we cluster this p p1 and p2 are, are here so we cluster we we put another cluster okay because this this cluster p1 and p2 is p1 union p2 it is now a one cluster now in nearest the data point nearest point between or the nearest to these these are their own clusters initially these are their own clusters so we are going to merge it okay so here we have a p1 and p2 now the now the this uh, smallest distance is p4 now we attach means we, now we make one more cluster okay now in this big cluster in this cluster where we have three points what is the nearest data point now the nearest data point is p3 okay so we'll make again one cluster again one big cluster like this until and unless we have one cluster at uh, one 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 cluster uh, at a point okay so here we, we we are ended up with one cluster okay so it is not making sense i know but we can um, just just as a diagram i have made this so let's see how how we do it uh, using a dendrogram that that will make more sense okay so here we have a p1 here we have a p2 oh oops let me make a little bit more in uh, good oops what happens okay so here we have a p1 let's assume that we have this is the point p1 this is the point p2 this is the point p2 and this is the point p3 and this is the point p4 okay now th these are the points now what we will do with here you can see just assume that just assume that this is p1 p2 p3 and p4 and you can see this p p1 and p2 are smallest so we can make uh we can attach this we can make a dendro uh, we can make like this we can attach this p2 and p3 okay now these are one cluster p2 and p3 are one cluster which we usually call p2 union p3 okay now initially p1 is one cluster c1 p2 is one cluster c2 p3 c3 and p4 c4 okay so these are initial clusters now what now what we'll do now this is the one cluster which is c2 okay so we've we we we, we found and uh, attached it okay now what now what we will do now the nearest state data point is p4 over here okay so what what we will do we'll again attach p4 into this we'll again attach p4 now we have now we have p3 and p4 as a one cluster over here okay now we are now we can attach p1 now we can attach p1 now now we can attach p1 like this 
now we can attach p1 and now we have our dendrogram which is actually a hierarchy of clusters okay so here we have a traditional den dendrogram which uh which, which which i think that you have all have seen in your journey so this is your hub this is your dendrogram what you have done you have just who are most similar you attached it okay who are most similar you attached it for an example these are two similar you attached it and then these this is now what you attach it like this okay do, do not merge it do not merge it okay so you have to do do like this now here we have until and unless we have left with one cluster okay so that's the basic uh, hierarchical clustering and i hope that you understood hierarchical clustering the basic intuition but if not let's let's try to again understand a little bit more further into a more sophisticated way okay not sophisticated just just a easy way okay so for the example i'm gonna take a yellow color so here you have a c1 here you have a c2 here you have a c3 here you have a c4 okay so these uh, this is your c4 now you can this c2 and c3 are your points c2 and c3 are your points okay so these are two too much similar so you will attach this like this now c4 here is here so will you make you so you will make one one more now p c3 and c4 will be attached like this and c1 will be attached onto the up of c4 now this is a traditional dendrogram this is traditional then dendrogram where you convert this cluster of numbers where you convert cluster of numbers c1 the, the clusters clusters to a hierarchy of clusters okay so for an intuition what 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 i'm trying to see you here so i have one example so for an intuition what i'm trying to see you here that we have a, a c1 c2 c3 c4 now we're just uh, making a attach, attaching as a cluster so c2 union c3 etc okay so this is the basic intuition behind hierarchical clustering so there are two types of hierarchical clustering uh, some of the, the types are we have some something called as agglomerative agglomerative clustering and then we have and then we have divisive clustering and then we have divisive clustering okay so we will deep dive into agglomerative clustering i'll just give you an intuition behind divisive clustering okay so what is agglomerative clustering so the agglomerative clustering aglo agglomerative clustering okay so before that let's understand let's uh, let's see let's uh, let's let's under understand the divisive clustering to help you better understand that so it is down to it is up to down approach sorry it's a down to up approach it's a agglomerative is a down to up approach and divisive is just opposite it's just opposite where divisive divisive is just up to down approach up to down approach so what do i mean by this so for an example for an example let's assume that we have a four points we have a five points in the form of data a b c and d and e okay so here what you what you are going to do we're going to divide this cluster of numbers the cluster of numbers into a different different uh, a b let's assume that you are divided with a b now this is your c d e c d e c d e as a most similar okay you divided this now what you will do you will divide this a and b a and b now you will divide this c c and d d e okay now you will take the d and e okay so this is the basic uh, this what what you are doing you are making the cluster of numbers into separate separate numbers you're making the hierarchy of numbers okay hierarchy of numbers and this is what you are doing okay so you are just uh, making a di um, hierarchy of numbers it's like a b c d is you're going to up to down approach from up to down approach but in the case but in the case of but in the case of agglomerative you are doing something different you are here you are going up to down up to down in agglomerative you will take you will take because in agglomerative you have cluster 1 c2 they are unique clusters means only one cluster so you do merge it okay you do merge it okay so it is agglomerative is up to down approach sorry down to approach down to up 
okay so that's the basic intuition behind agglomerative and divisive clustering okay so we'll see in detail about agglomerative clustering and divisive clustering to help you better understand all of this uh, agglomerative and divisive but the basic intuition behind hierarchical cl of clustering hierarchy of clustering is that you have uh, some points and you what you do you simply you simply you simply merge to cluster because these p1 p2 p3 are before R4 cluster initially, you merge to cluster and then you have some kind of similarity matrix. Okay, so you have some, some kind of similarity matrix that, that we'll see. According to that, you merge it and then you make a den dendogram or hierarchy of clusters. Okay, so that's the that's that's what the agglomerative and agglomerative is just down to approach where you are converting the converting the clusters into by merging different different cluster until unless you have one cluster left at the top like this C1 okay as an example and in divisive you are actually going up to down approach meaning dividing the cluster into a single single group okay like A B C D E okay so that's the basic intuition behind this uh, agglomerative and divisive clustering okay so let's start with agglomerative clustering deep diving into agglomerative clustering to help you better understand what an algorithm ag, algo agglomerative agglomerative clustering does and we will see a lot more about this okay we will not see the implementation as of now we will see in uh, another section where we are now we are uh, now after this i think we are we have we have completed this theory part all those stuffs means we have now have a good knowledge of everything now what what we will do we will make a lots of projects okay so here's an algorithm so first if you so first uh, let 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 me write an algorithm first i will write an algorithm and then i then i will make you understand with the help of good examples that i've already listed over here okay okay so here first what what we will do first you we compute the proximity matrix we compute the proximity matrix proximity matrix that just tells you the similarity between two points second we will we will see we will see we will see just as now how it looks like and then you repeat these two process then then you repeat this two process then you repeat these two process merge merge two clusters merge two clusters and update the cluster update the matrix update the proximity matrix proximity matrix okay so that's the basic that's the that you repeat in a for loop and then you until and unless until you have one cluster you have one large cluster left means until you have left you have covered all the cluster okay until you have covered all the cluster okay covered all the cluster or we can say no clusters are left as a single cluster okay but this is this is a more form, formal definition until you have a, a good cluster like as as an example that i've showed to you okay so this is a basic algorithm to understand in agglomerative clustering now let's understand this in more detail okay so initially what i've taught what, what i've note here and what i'm going to note here like i'm not going to write note which is each each cluster or p1 p2 p3 each are, are its own cluster now we'll build a build a hierarchy of clusters okay so let's uh, let's build uh, let's build on proximity matrix how it looks like so the proximity matrix looks like this let's uh, let's assume that you have p1 p2 p3 p4 okay i just assume as an example now what you do you you do this p1 p2 P3, P4. Okay. Now you do this. Means this. This is a proximity matrix. This is a proximity matrix like this. Okay. Okay. And these diagonals are zero. These diagonals are zero. This diagonal, the diagonals are zero because the distance between the distance between the P1 and P2 will be obviously zero. The distance between P1 and P2 may be some 2.4. 2 that is P3, P4 like that. So we have we have written like that. P, the, the distance between P1, P2 and P1 is maybe something like that. And diagonal this, the distance between P2 and P2 is obviously zero. Okay. So this this is what the basic uh, this is what the basic proximity matrix looks like. So let's see let's see. And that how we how, how we make a dendrogram okay so here uh, we have p1 p2 
P2, P3, P4. Now assume, now we will just assume that, uh, let's take an example that this, uh, this is 4.6 to 4.2, 6.9. 7.2, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay, it's a zero. Okay, so the distance between P, P4 is P4 is obviously zero. Okay, so the P2, we, we will find the smallest one. We will find the smallest um, similarity. Here you can see that this, this is the smallest similarity. P2 and I think, uh, oops, it's a, it's a P2. And also, I think that I've not drawn a good mirror. I, I, I will tell you. So here, let's let's assume that you have this proximity matrix. That you have this proximity matrix. Just just, just don't take a take a look at this proximity matrix. Now, what you will do? You will find the smallest similarity. So the smallest similarity. So the smallest similarity over here is this three. Here we have three and six. Okay. So here we have three and six that we have done first. The smallest similarity. Okay, so that's the that's that's what we are going to do. So yeah, assume that this is P1 and P2 has the same smallest. Now we have now what what now the next is the next you can find over here is four means six and four maybe let's see six and four which is here. Okay, so we can go over here also three and four. We can see this three and four also. Okay, so we can take this three and four like this. It's okay. So just assume the next smallest is P3 and the next smallest is P4. Okay, so now we have constructed. Now let's assume C2, P1, P, P2, P1. Then we have a again maybe some P3 and P4. Now first you do this, then you do this, then you make this like this. Okay, so now we have now now you have the hierarchy of clusters. Okay, so just, that's the basic definition. That's the basic uh, algorithm for proximity matrix. Okay, um, and this, this is what you do, and you update the proximity matrix. So how you update? Now you merge the, the merged the cluster. Now what you will do? P1 union P2. Okay, P1 union P2. This one will be. Let's assume P1 and P2 are attached. Then P1 union P2. This this will be the cluster. Okay. Now let's assume that the 2.7 and these are this, this are similar means this 2.2.7 and uh, maybe some uh, maybe the, like that so we can combine the cluster like that. I think this is not an actual example, this is a bad example. Okay, but here uh, you can you will you will be seeing one one more one more comprehensive example. Okay, so how do we uh, measure the similarity? How do we measure the similarity of the intercluster similarity? We can measure the distance between two, two points or clusters, these P1 and P2, using maybe Euclidean distance, Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance. We have different different distance similar dis distance uh, distance measures. So how do we measure the, the similarity between two clusters or intercluster? An intercluster is nothing much. The, the similar the this, this is your one cluster and this is another cluster. So the, what's the distance? What the similarity between to merge it? Okay. So that's the that's the intercluster that we have already talked about in terminology sessions. So let's see. So we have. So we have let's uh, let's let's assume that you have this. Let's assume that you have this cluster where we have x this 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 this. Let's do another cluster. This this. So how do we measure the similarity? How do we measure the similarity? So for measuring the similarity, we have I'm I'm, I'm going to talk about three methods. I'm going to talk about three methods. Min. Um, the next method a max. The next method is group average. The next method is group average. So let's start with min. So what do I do in, in min? So let's assume that you have this. Uh, so so you have this data point like this. We have this cluster. We have this cluster. Now the second cluster is like this. Uh, second cluster is like this. Okay. So what do you do in minimum? What do you do in minimum? You take out the minimum first to first to um, just, just write from left. Let me write it mathematically to make it more sense. Oops, what I've done. Okay, so what you what you have to do? What you have to do? So let's let let me write it mathematically for minimum. So minimum is is just the similarity between C1 and C2, which is nothing but equals to nothing but equals to minimum minimum of pi 
is mem will member of C1 PI to be the member of C1. Let's assume this is C1, so PI may, may be this point, and PJ, the another cluster, should be the mem member of C2. Now, what you will do, you will take out the similarity, the similarity of PI and PJ. Okay, these two. Okay, the, these two distance. Okay, now you take out the distance that you do. You, you take out the distance. I'm writing here distance, and you you take out the minimum point. Minimum points who have means here. You this the distance between these two points is is minimum as compared to this point, this point, this point. Okay, so we will we will uh, just. Uh, so what what we will do we will simply uh, merge it okay so this, this is what the basic minimum uh, minimum approach does it just takes out the similarity between c1 and c2 by the taking out a minimum of all the uh, i and j's by taking out the distance between all the minimum taking out the minimum distance of all i and j's with a member of c1 and c2 okay so that's the that's the minimum so let's see the basic uh, basic uh, thing over here to under understand it little bit for the way and this this is this this example is taken from cs6 530 by, by cluster analysis class lecture notes this 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 example okay so here here is your proximity matrix here is your proximity matrix where you have one as a p1 two as a p2 like that okay now you have the here you have a proximity matrix here you have a proximity matrix now here the distance between 1 and 1 is 0 the distance between 1 and 2 is 0.24 the distance between 1 and 3 is 0.222 the distance between 1 and 4 is 0.37 the distance between 1 and 5 is like this and this in the same way diagonal are 0 okay so you can see here the smallest similarity between or smallest distance between two points i and j here we have let's assume this is i and this is j the so smallest distance is 0 0.11 0 0.11 and we have 3 and 6 okay so we merge 3 and 6 as a first cluster okay now the next now the next smallest similarity or the smallest distance is is uh, and this one uh, let let me choose yeah this this one 0.14 okay so 5 and 2 okay so this is your next smallest so now what you will do you will merge it at the second cluster now what you will do you will find that this two cluster this two cluster you and this this p5 five, 5 union 2 and uh, and 3 union 6 finds to be a uh, fine um, as well as has the smallest distance so you merge the cluster three next is you have one you have one and four now what you what you do you this first you take out the just you just you can see first you take a first here we have four in which the this union union and this four and this four has the smallest distance so you merge it and then you make a big cluster again and then you are done okay so it might make sense it might not make sense further but i will i will walk you through go through this example make the dendrogram by yourself or nested clusters by yourself okay that will make more sense the next type of this is max what do i mean with, with max max is simply max is taking out the similarity between c1 and c2 which says the maximum which we which we want the maximum distance maximum distance between pi and pj and pi be the member of c1 and pj pj be the member of c2 so that's the that's the basic definition uh, that's the basic of uh, this um, instead of we are taking the max so what do i mean with max so here we have an uh, intuitive or comprehensive example so here you can see that we have again the same proximity matrix now you can see and that the smallest distance is 3 6 okay you merge it now how you will merge this 4 how will merge why why don't don't we merge with 5 okay so the distance between the distance between this 5 and 2 is a maximum is very large so obviously this this one obviously will be minimum so you merge it that that's that's makes sense that's makes sense obviously okay so this, this is what why you are you you take minimum distance but for merging you take out the maximum you take out the maximum to merge and here you have taken the maximum and that's how and that's how 
and that's how all it works and here we have a maximum here we have a minimum so you take out a maximum and then you uh, compare and then you take out a minimum and this is ob obviously will be minimum and then you and you can see this is the maximum here and this is the minimum from here so you merge it okay so this is the basic and you can see the dendrogram over here how we made okay the next type of um, intercluster similarity measure the next type of intercluster similarity measure is group average what do i mean by group average group average so i'm just going to give you the intuitive uh, just um, uh, as a, a, a simple equation which is pi with a member of c1 and pj with a member of c2 pi with a member of c1 and pj with a member of c2 you take out the distance between pi and pj divided divided by the norm because it's the freak frequency divided by the norm of c1 with whatever the number of points times then uh, i think times the norm of c2 okay so this is what you have to do i think it's, yeah, it, it may be plus yeah it, it may be plus yeah i guess so you take out the norm of what is the number of points freak frequency okay so that's what you are going to do so you can see over here that we have this dendrogram we have this following and then what you do you take a you group you group it for for an example you can see the same thing has been done but i'm going to take another example to help you understand this much better to help you understand this much better so you have this first and then you have this second cluster okay now you have some points you have some points in here you have some points in here and some points in here okay you take each pair you take each pair each pair like this you take each pair okay okay now you average it out okay and then you take out the distance you average it and then here you go okay so for an example here you take out the minimum distance is three and six and then you have this four uh, then again you merge it using the in, in max what what we what we were doing but here we are merging one also the reason being the average between will it will will be making sense if you sense it mathematically okay and five and two are closest okay so this is what you are doing in group min and let's see some of the uh, some just this minimum dis, uh, dis disadvantage the minimum disadvantage is it it simply it, it it is it is sensitive to outliers it is sensitive to outliers and rather rather than max is uh, will will be less prone to outliers okay so that's the basic uh, a dis disadvantage that I've told to you and you can see more onto the CS6 for 530 cluster analysis lecture notes to understand it much better okay so this is what we are doing and if, if you have not understood it is a little bit advanced but it uh, it should make sense a little bit what what we do what we do in this we have make hierarchy of clusters like this okay so now we have talked a lot about hierarchical clustering and i hope that you really understood everything you need to know about hierarchical clustering now what i will do i will just name some uh, now now what i will do i will name a time complexity i will and space complexity now i'll name one time complexity and space complexity for agglomerative clustering just to make just to make sure everyone is on the same pace so the space complexity the space complexity is order of n square okay because you have approximate matrix too and time complexity will be order or maybe sometimes it's order of n q okay but some sometimes it goes to order of n square log of n okay so this this is your this is your space and time complexity to understand it much better and you can see the limitations pros cons of these onto the wikipedia pages they are really uh, well explained there okay so we have we are done with the hierarchical clustering and i really really hope that you understood everything now we are done with unsupervised learning now uh, we will we will do a lot of projects and then we will end up this course and i highly, highly recommend you to do lots of uh, pro, um, projects also okay and then after learning this machine learning you can get uh, go to new era again i'm going to uh, just uh, now navigate here the url https uh, you can slash youtube.com slash new era okay so you can find and uh, uh, just just take 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 a look at a newly launched deep learning series okay from there you can learn uh, advanced machine learning or uh, or deep learning okay so that's it for this session i'll be uh, so that's it for all this subsection i'll be catching up your next section okay so now we will build or start our 
last section of this course which is uh, project section and in this section we will build two projects maybe some more project but uh, initially I plan for two projects maybe I can add more but you can surely go to uh, my YouTube channel for more projects but, but these projects will tell you an overview of how a machine learning project would look like and the motivation for starting your a new project because it's better to make your pro project by yourself just taking the inspiration from other people okay so in this project we will build a heart failure prediction um, uh, model that will predict whether the person whether the person will die based on some of the features or not okay so these, this is the problem statement and we have certain features like age gender blood pressure smoke whether a person is smoked or not whether a person have diabetes or not what is injection fraction what is the and such so this is long name which I can't print pronounce but the, this is the this is a problem statement and you can take a look at the data uh, we can take a look at the data which is available at this link and I hope that you will uh, understand this project I have, I have made I have run step by step to help you understand everything and as I am made just I have not worked on this project so I just want to pick up this heart failure detection system just to make sure that I will be making my own project also and I will be uh, and narrating over through this project okay so here uh, what I'm going to do is what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a heart failure detection based on these features and the target variable of our which is the death event whether the particular person died or not so that will be the target variable we will see more about the data but what is the business objective over here every machine learning problem has some kind of business objective it simply means that it's some healthcare problem means we will be able to build a healthcare we will be able to build a healthcare in healthcare something AI in healthcare which is simply able to make a machine learning model that will help you in early detection of the person based on particular uh, features and help the person can be saved so that's why we are going to build that model to help you better understand the AI in healthcare, we'll be building one more project which is spam detection system that is uh, whether the email or messages are spam or not. Okay, so let's start with this uh, notebook and uh, first of all I've divided first of all I'm going to load the data and sorry load the sorry import the libraries so I'm going to import pandas, numpy, seaborn, matplotlib and this okay so I will run it out I will run it out and then I will load my data. So I don't know why this is taking time. So now I will load the data, and my data is located in a folder of heart failure data set. If you click on data set, click on archive, and here is my data set. Okay, so there I'm going to do. I'm going to just print out head. And one, one more thing that I want to clarify about here the reason why I'm not um, writing or coding by it here because I, th I, I thought like uh, it will be better if I narrate the code. If I if 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 I'm writing the code, maybe I, I forget something, or maybe maybe the code is not annotated too much. So that's the for a few further references. I just took to just write it down over here, and then I'm only gonna to just narrate over there. Okay, most of them because because maybe while writing the code, I may forget to narrate some of the code. But yeah, let let me know what you like, whether I should write a code or not. Okay, so I'm going to print it down the shape of the data. I'm going to do the shape of the data is 29913, which is 13 columns. And here we have uh, age, anemia, creatinine, phosphokinase, diabetes, injection fraction, HP, then battle it, serum, then uh, what is the gender, smoking, time, and death event. Okay, and death event is our target variable that we need to detect. Okay, so that's our basic intuition. That's our basic uh, data exploration. Now, what I'm going to do is we will see how much the data we have. Means we will see uh, what's the shape of the data we have. So here we are. Uh, we are given the shape of the data, which is two nine nine rows and thirteen columns. Okay. Now, using uh, data data dot shape, you can do. Now, I'm going to take a look at the information about the data. You can calculate or you can take out the information about the data 
from the data.info method and you can if you see over here that it will tell you whether the particular column has no values what is the data type and what is the memory usage and it will also tell you what's the shape of the data by just taking you can also take a look at this and you can see that it start with zero indexing so we have 13 columns you can also take a look at the description it will simply tell you whoever is the numerical column uh, it, it, it will tell you the describing means what is the count, what is the mean of the particular column, what is the standard deviation, what is the minimum, what is the 25% of that column and 50% of that column and 75% of that column and max in that column. It will surely help in photo means when a, if you're a data scientist, it will surely help uh, maybe something kind of uh, you are exploring what's the maximum you can take a look at this you can take a look at what is the standard deviation what is the mean maybe you're formulating some problem based on machine learning so it will be very helpful this this uh, data frame you can you can have a day spend five minutes understanding what uh, was this and this very easy it will tell you the count minimum standard deviation etc Okay, so what we have seen so far, we have loaded, we have imported the libraries, we have to loaded the data from my local directory. I'm going to take a look at the shape of the data. Now I'm going to take a, now I'm going to take a look at information about the data. Okay, so here I'm going to data.info and that will give me the information about the data. Okay, then I'm going to take a look at the description. It's what is the uh, well, the, the, it will describe our numerical data and then I'm going to take a look at the, what is the number of a null values. So here, uh, this will tell you, this, this will tell you in all the columns how many number of a null values are and here we have 0, 0, 0 null values in each and every column. Okay, but if you let's say, let's say, let's say, let's take an example that you want, no, I, I don't want this, I just want to want that how many how many numbers so you can add a sum and then you can run it out to see how it works so you can see that we have a total of zero uh, no values okay so this is the basic exploration uh, as I can do about the data let's let little bit exploration about the data okay now the main part will come in exploratory data analysis when when we do the so much of EDA and a lot more so we will see over here how we do the exploratory data analysis and here what do I mean by exploratory data analysis in EDA it, it does not mean that it is a very very hard but it does not also mean that it is very very easy it's a very very crucial step in machine learning you should know your data how it is working what's the what's the distribution of the data is your data is balanced you have certain question to ask which we'll see over here Okay, so you have certain questions to ask to your data that should your that using maybe some plots, maybe some numbers. We'll see that, and you have to find answers of, of your coach of of your company because if you're a data scientist or data analyst of, at some company, you should work mostly on to understanding and finding your business solutions. As I'm a data scientist at artifact, I used to see I used to work a lot more with the data. Uh, I used to work a lot more with the data because I think that I should be able to what actually my data is and what the business objectives are and what's the, what's the answer they want from my data okay so that's what I do a lot of data exploratory data analysis there so that's why I picked up this problem I found it very interesting and not picked so much apart because it should be conserved like advanced house price predictor diabetes prediction system which I already made which is available in my, in my github but I want you to try out make your unique project and showcase on your resume okay so then what what we will do then we will simply see the distribution of our classes what do I mean by classes over here for this example we have a, we have a binary classification problem and this binary classification problem, we are given one and zero. Okay, so whether it if if, if it is one, then the person died. If it is zero, then the person did uh, not die. I think I have to see. Okay, so it's sometimes yeah. So the the person is living is zero, and the person is dead is one. So we have two classes, which is the binary classification problem. Okay, so I'm going to take a look first. What I will do, I will take a look at the distribution of my data. And you can see I'm highlighting the code from where I'm taking a look at the distribution of my data. And here it simply means that I'm just going to take just, just, just going to data, then 
bracket, I'm going to take a look at the event. I'm going to count the number of event where the event is equal equals to zero. And I'm going to count the same where the event is equal equals to one by taking out the length of each array or series. Okay, then and also the pi pi takes an array, so I'm going to put it in an array like this. I'm going to put it in an array. So let let me choose that red color and this uh, medium that works good. So I'm going to put in an array, and then I'm going to do, just label it just just to make sure everything is right. So I'm going to label it with living and dot. I'm going to uh, print it out. What is the total number of living case cases, and what is the total number of died cases? Okay. And then I'm going to plot it out by just plt.py. I'm going to plot it a pie chart by giving our ARR. ARR will contain the length of life and length of death, like this. Okay? And then labels will be the same live, living, and died. Exploit, this is how much to explode our and shadow. What do you do? You want your shadow? Yeah, show. Sure, I want the shadow. So I'm going to run it now. So I just hope that I've run the previous. So I'm going to run it now. And you can see over here that, you, that your data is imbalanced. Uh, we are actually working out. We are, our data is imbalanced data. So I will tell you why, uh, why this, this, this data is imbalanced. But first of all, what is, first of all, you can see over here that we have total of 203 living cases and 96 which is type cases and it makes sense also because in real world living cases is more than the death cases I don't know actually I'm not but I think so okay so now let's let let me show it to you in particular to help you get a feel that uh, what is imbalanced data okay oops why is not working what is imbalanced data so Imbalanced data means, let's take an example that you have two classes. For an example, here we have two classes, living and death. Okay, so you have more examples of living, which is here, 203, 203 examples, but you have a far lesser, two times lesser, the, lesser than the examples of 96. Okay, so here you are actually working on imbalanced data. What, what can be the issue of this? Issue of this uh, can be that your model, in most of the model, is most trained onto this living. So your uh, you can assume that your that the output of your, the the most of the output of your model will be zero rather than one. In some cases, I have to print one, but it will in most of the cases it will be zero. Okay, so here uh, we have some examples, so maybe it can, but your model is more truly trained on a 203 and your model may maybe get biased towards some problem, means uh, your model can be like this, print zero. Your model is this, this model, and it's only printing zero at every time. So this happens when you have, for one case, you have 200, let's take an example that you have a 400 examples. So for one case, you have 399 examples and only one example for uh, for death. Okay, so that is causing, that will cause the problem. Okay, a big problem. This is a big problem which comes as a something called as visual study and deep learning, which is working with imbalanced data. Okay, so this this is what I'm going to highlight that just I just want to take a take a take 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 my answer. Is my data is imbalanced? How much examples for each case do I have? So I answered my question that we are actually working, we are actually working on imbalanced data, which is actually working here on imbalanced data, where we have a living cases equals to 203 and died cases equals to 96. So imbalance simply means that your classes, that your classes are not equally distributed, are not equally distributed. So can I write it out? Um, yeah, so let's write the definition. So. Uh, the, I was just going to comment it out. Just to imbalance means imbalance means that your data is your data is not equally uh, distributed between classes. Distributed between classes between classes. Okay, so uh, it may happen that uh, if in balanced data our data is equally distributed. So for an example, for a particular example, so for an example, let's say you have a training length maybe 400. So if you have a training length to be the 400, so assume so assume 200 is for death examples, 200 is for live examples. So we have we have equal number of uh, examples in both living and death cases, death cases, 
Okay, so this is this is an example of balanced data, and our model works best here. Okay, it is more robust. It is not biased towards anything. Okay, so this is the basic. Uh, this is the this 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 is our first exploratory data analysis take taken out the reference. So what what we have done so far? We have simply taken. We have simply uh, drawn some EDA from here by taking out the length and taking out the length of each event for a zero and one, and then I then I put in an array. And then I'm gonna, then I have labels which is living and dark and printed something and then I'm gonna plot the pie chart with that this 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 uh, this explode comes with explode and shadow we want the shadow so you might be seeing the shadow over here okay and you can see that what the inference so I answered my question am I working on a balanced data yes how much here okay two times just an approximate so our die case is two times lesser than the living cases or we can put in a percentage by just dividing it out by just dividing it down to the total length of our data okay so you can you can take you can, you can try it out more mathematically but this is what i'm going to show you to you about this inference okay let's move on to the next inference in the next sense we end inference i'm going to take a look at the distribution of our age uh, this 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 will tell you whether your data is in what range. Most of your uh, most of the the central tendency I think I think that is that is here the mean the most of the cases most of the edges like from forty to ninety five. Okay, most of the cases forty to ninety five examples examples are starting from forty to ninety five ninety five and then you can see most of the cases are in around sixty. Okay, and around 60 with some standard deviation. Okay, so this is the distribution of your data. You can try out for different, different, you can try out for definitely for different, different uh, numbers, which I've already shown to you. There are a lot more numbers. You can definitely try it out. Okay, make a pie chart for class, uh, for binary columns like high blood pressure, it was or not, or maybe gender. Make that column and see if it works. So I will show you how to filter out the columns from there. Okay, so now we have seen the distribution of our data. So now what I want, I just want to check. So maybe my business objective is, maybe my, 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 my lead told to me, hey, uh, if your data, your data dashboard like this should be answering lots of questions, should be answering lots of your questions about the data. Okay, so here the answer that you're working on this data means the total number of type, type cases is less than the living cases. Okay, which is two times less than the living, living cases. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that's how you do. And here you can see, you can say to your stakeholder or whatever the lead that most of the A, most of the age rise from 40 to 95. Okay, so you can see from this and see, and you can tell most of the cases lie around from 50 to 70 like that. Okay, so this is a distribution of a data. So now say that you wanted to check, you wanted to check, select, you want to select the columns that are above age 50 and seeing they're died or not. Again, a very great secret, it, it can be solved, it, 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 it can be put it as a SQL query forum, but maybe you just, just, just think about what you want to do in Pandas or you want to do in like that. Okay, so it is possible in SQL, but it's not, I, I, just as an example, yeah, I've made it in a Python. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, my business objective is select the columns, select the columns, sorry, number of examples, I think that I've right, wrong. You know, select rows that are above age 50 and seeing that are they are died or not so here what I'm gonna do I, I want the death event I want the death event because I don't want any, any column I want the death event whose age is above or equals to 50 and they are living okay and then again the same thing and then again I'm gonna take out the length of the same as above and then I'm going to put in an array labels and then I'm going to plot it. Okay, so if you can, if, 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 if I run this, you can again see, you can see here that here we have living cases. Here, here we have the living cases a lot. And you have a, a small, but you can see the died cases, died cases. So if, if, if I write it out, I'm just going to write it out like this. So, oops, I'm going to write a total number of, total of, total number of, 
And say died cases, died cases, I'm going to take out the length, length of died, length of that, I'm going to do for total number of, total number of not died cases, not died cases. Just, I'm not able to write because I have two tabs in front of me. It's very difficult for me to dabble right over here. Okay, so here, length not died. Okay, so here, if you can see that you can, you are able to see that we have total number of died cases 85 and total number of not died 167. So just see over here that in total, in total, we have 203, which is two times lesser than, and here, this is fairly one times lesser than. Okay, so here you can see that most of the cases again died, but most of the cases above 50 died, okay, as comparatively to our, our plot. M maybe not, not making sense, but again, again I'm sorry, going to say that assume that just let's listen to me what I'm saying. I'm saying, like, you can see that in our plot, we have total number of our died cases, in two times our died cases, our died cases, it two times lesser, it's two times lesser than our living cases. And here, our died cases is one times lesser than not died cases. So here you can, we can see, obviously it is low, but here you can see most of the people that are above age 50 died, okay, from this uh, inference, comparatively from the up, 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 upper plot, okay. So here, that's how we answer the questions from the data. And I hope that you understood everything and I think that you will be taking out more inference. Okay, great. So let's see one, one more, one more uh, column, which is very fairly good column, which I think, oops, get out. Uh, I'm just going to, yeah, here it is, oops. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so now, now just assume that you want the columns that are above age 50 and you will see whether they are died or not. I think that I have already, already done. Okay, so you want that that are above age 50. Oops, I think this is uh, this is for diabetes. So yeah, so what you have to see, you have to see, you have to answer the question that the person is having diabetes, that the person is having diabetes, how many numbers, how many numbers of patient were died are having diabetes and how many numbers of patient does not die uh, dead, dead, non dies having diabetes. Okay, so diabetes is uh, where the person is not having diabetes and having diabetes. Okay, so maybe I've done a little bit wrong over here. The diabetes should be there. The diabetes should be there, and we have to see whether the person had died or not. Okay, so you can see died with diabetes uh, is this and not died with di diabetes is this so there are a lot more but you can uh, uh, again compare with the other plot over here then it will start making more sense okay so we have done extensive data exploratory data, data analysis a lot more can be done to answer a particular business problem like this you can see over here you can answer some more questions from the data but as to give you a taste of this how i do how i like to do the answer the problem using my favorite visualizations okay so you can answer this uh, it's it's very good to answer this all uh, by just uh, visualizing it out and saying to the lead okay so now now we have seen a lot more things we have seen the more of the visualization just don't worry about this, this the, uh, the, these are again in the course website mlo one.netlify.app it's a very very uh, easy easy to get all the six notebooks okay so now you will check the correlation of our variable so what do i mean by take checking the correlation of our variables it simply means that you want to um, that how your how your features how your features are correlated so here you have a very good uh, reference i've taken from a side of the they have explained it very much extensively there will be some online so here what is telling it shows the correlation between variables on each axis and uh, it's Means it just shows the I, I, I will give you the uh, plot over here. But what is what it does? It simply shows you the correlation ranges from minus one to plus one. Okay, minus one to plus one. 
it simply means that if your variable is closer to minus 1 then is a very very similar okay if your is is very very similar so you can see value closer to 0 means there is a no linear trend means lean linear thing is not there so you can you can't use linear regression over there between two variables means we we can each this correlation tell us whether your data is a linear or not and the close to one the correlation is more positively correlated okay more positive means correlation with inter correlation between these things and you can read about Pearson correlation coefficient over here because this uses something kind of that okay that is one increase so that the other and close to uh, close to one to the strongest this relationship is means the the, the one is closer to one, the stronger the relationship is. The diagonals are all one that simply indicates that the v squares are correlating with each variable to itself. So it's a perfect correlation. So if you have all the data, all the all the all the diagonals are one, so it's a perfect sign of perfect correlation. And the plot is also symmetrical, and I know that you know about symmetrical. So you can see over here, but I'm gonna to just uh, put it in a form of this I just hope that I'm going to put it like this okay so I'm going to run it out and here you can see that our data is perfect correlation more the dark is minus 5.3 like that is the, is the more correlated okay so, so you can read that it's very I have explained and also you can do the same as your like if you want to do with with the panas so here you are going to do and your diagonals are again one etc okay so we have done, talked about various things, you have under, understood our data and etc, etc, everything, okay? So now I hope that you got an idea about how we process. So now what I will do, I will start with data set development. As I've talked about that you should divide your data into training or testing set because for testing you have to check some, you, have to, you, you, you don't have real world examples. So for validating your model works best, so what you will do, you will divide your data into validation set, means training and validation set where you are dividing 70 30 okay so 70 percent for training and 30 percent for testing okay so you can run this out here we are using the escalon api uh from in, while importing the train test split okay so now we have done this and i hope that you understood this also so now we will do now we will i will not do feature engineering over here but uh, I will just showcase to you what's the, what's, wow, what, what we do, just a, one example of feature engineering. Okay, so in feature engineering, we add more features, we encode our variable, we encode our categorical variables, we apply some transformations on our data just to insert our feature. Okay, so here is an example of adding the feature. Okay, so here, what, what, here what, what, what we are doing, we are adding the interaction term. Okay, so what is interaction term? Interaction terms means, interaction terms means, let's for and for and sake of example, assume that you have this data set, this data set, which is gender and age. Okay, for an example, so it will add again one new column by taking out the product of G, Z and uh, not, let's take it a BP. Okay, anything means in numerical, so it will take the product and add okay so it is just doing the product of two features and making that column okay so maybe that that will not make sense but this is what the interaction term means means we are just adding the product of two features okay so here is our function for that so first of all we are taking the column names then then we are taking the length because we have to see we have to iterate through and and, and then i'm going to copy it out so that we, we can't change anything to x and i'm going to um, just iterate through all the columns and i column represent the uh, rep represent the first column and this feature i name that this uh, where it is this this column i'm going to uh, access using the x and then i'm going to range through j because i want to multiply these two so here again the same thing and again i'm going to take out the data and then i'm going to do is just to make it this to just show the name of the column like this that that we multiplied and actually you're multiplying this out and then we are returning the x int okay so this is what and then we are calling on x train and x test and we are done okay so here if you run it out now you can see if 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 i show you the code if i show you the x train mod x train mod 
do I run it? Yep. So let me run it again. You can see that we have 78 columns. We have 78 columns from we are 30 col 13 columns to 78 columns. You can try the result, how it is working, and let me know in the comment box below on our on in our Discord community. Okay, so th this is what, what we are doing, and uh, by adding the interaction term, uh, we are feel free to explore more. Okay, now what we'll do, we will now we'll start building our model. So how do we build? Just just we will start building our model. So first, I'm going to make a model for evaluating our model. So first, I will take a look at the accuracy, precision, recall, and confusion matrix. So again, if I run it over here now, now it will give, and we are giving the ground truth as well as our predictor. Okay, first of all, I will start with logistic regression with max iteration to be 1000. The reason why I have given over here because if you it, it is not converging, it is not converging with any solver. So, for converging, if you run it out, you can see that LBGS failed to converge. What you can do, you can increase the number of iterations, or or what you, what you can do, you can simply you can simply uh, scale your data. Maybe my data is not scaled. So increased the iterations to 1000 and it worked, okay? But it is also telling our process to standardize your data or to scale your data. So here for standardizing as well as the building the model, so we have something called this make pipeline. So what, what it will do for any coming example is to standardize and then it will, uh, and, then, uh, we, and then it will apply logistic regression over there, okay? So we are, we are just doing in a small number of, and you can compare the result of the standardization and that max iteration. So the accuracy is, is actually better, actually better. Precision is also better. Recall is also better. And this is also better. Okay, uh, confusion uh, matrix. Okay, so I hope that you watch my session on precision and recall. But let's, uh, let me show you what those precision and recall confusion matrix means. So maybe I have the color uh, this stochastic gradient is it yeah so we just 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 want to make sure that you are on the same base okay so here i'm going to highlight one algorithm which is uh, which is optimization algorithm which is same as our favorite gradient descent but here in gradient descent what we were doing it is takes it is taking a lot of time why it is taking a lot of time so here assume this this example assume this example i'm going to narrow it over here that uh, let's assume that you have a 10,000 data points, 10,000 data points, 10, 10,000 data points, and you have a 10 features. Okay, so here you have 10 features, and the residuals consist of as many terms as their data points. So you have 10,000 residuals because we are taking the difference between your predicted and the out model, predicted model output value. So you have around 10,000 terms in our case, residuals. So we need to compute the derivative of the 10,000 term. You need to compute the derivative of the 10, 10,000 term with respect to our features, which is 10,000 times 10, which is 1 lakh computation per iteration. That is so, so much high. Okay, so that's why we have some, something called as stochastic gradient descent. So what what we do? So what what we do in stochastic gradient descent? We, we choose simply as the same thing happens. We repeat until unless our approximation is minimized, and then we randomly shuffle, and then we do at each step. It means we act at only a step. So we don't update. We do updation as well as the deviation at each step, and we are doing for each training examples for each training examples okay so it uh, you it is a little bit out of the course it is it's usual thoughts and uh, maybe in uh, deep learning but i would highly recommend to learn this is just equal equals to the batch batch gradient descent okay so you will be able to see what's the difference okay so now as i as, as i've talked to you that we have something called as precision recall accuracy so we have not talked about that so let's talk about uh, just to spend a little bit of um, amount of time onto that. So here, TP means true positive. Means uh, true positive means that your outcome, that your outcome kind of, uh, is uh, after, uh, that your that your moral outcome correctly predicts the positive class. Okay. So you have in in any any model you have two positive and negative classes. Positive, negative classes. 
positive like 0 is a positive and 1 is a negative it will be positive so your model predicts the same output as your ground truth okay in a positive in a, for a positive class true negative is where the where your model predicted 1 and your output is also 1 and true positive means 0 and 0 these are positive positive class and these are negative class okay here you have false positive which is your model incorrectly your model predicted your model predicted your 0 and actually the output is 1 so it is false positive means positive and false because then they are not matching false negative is just the it's your model your your model predicted your uh, model predicted wrongly okay so your model predicted 1 and your output is actually 0 means negative and positive class okay so that's the that's that's the true positive and negative and confusion matrix is simply like this first we have a true positive false negative false positive and true negative that we have just seen it will tell you how many number of uh, are correctly classified as a in a positive class in a negative class in a in a but in the model model failed in a positive class where the model failed and this is a true negative where the model actually worked okay so you can see the we will we have seen Okay, so precision recall. As we have talked about precision and recall, the number of a true positive divided by the number of a true positive divided by the number of a true positive plus the number of a false positive. So true positives TP plus by TP divided by the number of a true positive plus the number of a false positive. Okay, so this is your output. This is your output of the precision. It simply answer the question what proportion of positive indications was actually correct okay so it uh, answered what proportion so here we have 0 0.73 which is actually a good proportion but we it, it can be improved B call answered the question what proportion of actual positive was identified correctly okay yeah. okay so it will tell you that what is the proportion of actual positives was identified correctly okay so this is the re recall of our model okay so now we will see now we will see uh, just just we will see the that that the precision recall confusion matrix etc okay so now we will see now we have built our logic regression with some standardization now we'll build a support vector classifier with a grid search cv with extensive fine tuning we have c which is lambda which 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 controls the width of that margin so we'll try different differences 0 0.1 1 10 100 1000 Gamma 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0, 0, 0, 0 0.1, and kernel to be RBF kernel. And then I will call the grid source instantiate with the SVC classifier, param grid, ref equals to verbal equals to 3. It will, I'm going to fit it, 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 it will try for each and every and checks the like, score. And this is what your, and this is what the thing is they have done, we have, they have checked. And you can find out the best parameter that the model found, where C equals to 10 and gamma equals to 0 0.001. You can see it's far performs a little, little bit less with uh, compared to logic regression, but it worked. Okay, so we have done with uh, we have we have done with the support vector vector classifier as well as logistic regression classifier. Now what we will do? We will do a this. We will we will uh, make a decision tree classifier. Okay, so what do I mean by decision tree classifier? Is I'm going to import the tree, as we have already talked in detail. I'm going to import a randomized search. We have talked about grid search. Randomized search is same. So I'm going to do, define a function that takes the parameters, takes up how many runs to CLF, what the classifier to use. Okay. Uh, then we will uh, we, then we will call a randomized on CLF. First we will give the CLF, which is plus classification number of iterations, etc. Then we fit it. Then then we'll find the best parameter. Then we'll find the best score, and then we'll say this. And this this is just a custom it model but you can surely remove that and just use that randomized search and then put all these so i have i have already done in some of my projects so i've just taken out from there and it's, and it's working great okay so i'm gonna it will tell which is the best which criterion is the best whether you can drop your guinea or split the or main weight is i have done a lot of uh, fine tuning okay i will run it it will take a little bit of amount of time trying all, all the values and checking the score and you can see the training score is to, to 0 0.84 and the test score is at 0.75 okay now we will run this classifier with the same uh, with these uh, features okay so it, it, it will give me the output like this 
now I will oops now I will run it out maybe you can you can see okay so you can see how how, it, how well it is performing maybe I have not let's see the best score a randomized search best score okay uh, maybe uh, yeah so that's that's the basic and you can also try it out maybe I'm a little bit uh, you can see uh, let's see if it is it is not good or not oops I have to also show okay so it is showing the best classifier so I have to put it over here I don't know why I put it over here but what I have put it now in in what mine but I will let me put it okay let's run it it's actually 0 0.75 so I've let I have obviously done some fine tuning and here what I got with, with a good parameter okay so it not always oh, this works best in some of the cases it worked okay so now with the with little bit of fine tuning i'm going to call a random forest classifier then i'm going to run it with this with a with a parameter set that we got with a random forest okay it will evaluate my model and then 0 0.86 0 point and actually good okay now what we'll do we will use uh, xg boost okay xg boost is another we have talked about we're learning with 0.1 max step what is the number of parameters then I'm going to put evaluation set into one uh, array. Okay, so just uh, just uh, just see the log loss at the same time, and then I'm going to run it. So it will tell at the log loss of the zero iteration and 0 0.32 is the log loss validation loss. Okay, now we will evaluate, and here again 0 0.85 is more robust model. Okay, it is a robust model. If you if you can see the importance. And it will show what features are more important. So time is very important. Injection is very important. So in this way, you can select, you can discriminate. So maybe smoking, anemia, sex, creatine, and then um, means these these three you can remove as a feature selection. Okay. The last thing that we are gonna to uh, use is a gradient boosting classifier. Gradient boosting is mostly used in a cases of uh, images, but let's see how well it works. With these hyperparameters, you can also fine tune it to get better results than me, and it actually worked. Okay, now what I will do, I will uh, I will save my XG Boost model because XG Boost is more robust. So I will save my model by just calling for joblib, joblib dump. I'm gonna to load my joblib. If you can see, if I run it, now you can see that 001. And you can see if I go over here, if I go over my hot failure and model.pkl file, and you can load this model.pkl file to make a good model. Okay, so that's the that's our that's a basic thing that we need to understand about um, that that we need to understand about uh, this hot failure detection system and I hope that you have understood a lot from this okay so thank you for uh, seeing uh, this section and I really hope that you enjoyed this and we have covered this project in 42 minutes in the next project we will be talking about a small project spam detection system which is again a very cool project which is an understanding problem statement and building a good model okay so let's meet at the next project then have a good day. So now we'll talk about or we will make one project which is spam and ham detector system. So if you have seen your Gmail or, or Google Gmail or Microsoft Outlook, there you are seeing that there may be, you have a tab which is spam tab where all your spam emails are there. So in the same way, we are going to build a spam and ham detector system. So a spam means means that a, that a particular uh, message may be corrupt and ham means not a spam, just oppose it to spam, okay? So just uh, ham means not a spam. I don't know why it does not work for the first time, not a spam, okay? And here you can see that uh, that, that we have a label means uh, we are give, given a message, we are given a message and we are given the target label which is our why okay so this this is our this is our message maybe go until journey point crazy and then you and there is a, a label which is given over there okay and this data set is downloaded this data set is down downloaded from a UCI repository and here is our data data set so it is in table so I'm not going to use CSV I'm going to use table to read that I'm going to separate by a tab Header should be none and the names of the columns should be labeled and messages. 
Okay, so let's take a look at, uh, we will take a look at the first few uh, uh, TED data points. So let me run this out first of all this and then this. And then I'm going to show you one of the messages there. So it should start making sense to you. So here, data, oops, what happened? Data, I mean, this is the messages. It will take a little bit of time. Uh, then zero position. So you can see that go one till journey point crazy available one, etc. etc. And here it says that it is a ham, it means not a spam. So for, for example, let's assume this second number because in second number we have it labeled as a spam. So free entry, it's looking like a spam, like it's free entry or when or like that. Okay. So that is the that's that's the basic uh, that's the basic exploration of our data, and this is downloaded from UCI repository. Okay, so I think that you that you understood. We are given a corpus of a test. So here we are not given any numbers. Here we are we are given here we are not given any number. We are given oops what happened what is happening? We are given a messages which is X as a messages which is in text format. So your neural network, or I'm sorry, machine learning model does not work with text. So you have to convert the text into numbers. So we will see some of our favorite text, uh, text uh, a vectorizer to convert this corpus of a test into a matrix or a vector or a number of a vector. We will see that. We will see that. Okay. So here you can see that uh, what here we are given a data which is text and this one and then we have a label okay so now we will see now we'll start exploring our data set so now we have got our problem statement that we are given a corpus cor uh, text we are given a text and we need to uh, we need to pass it a pipeline and give it to your output whether it is a ham or a spam or ham and zero and a spam means one Okay, so that's that's that that's the our favorite uh, given. Now we will move forward. Now now we'll move forward into exploring our data. So I've already explored it. So let me rerun it again. So here I hope that you all are able to see this. So maybe you and if if you're not, don't don't worry. I will just we're going to just take a look at the shape of the data, which is 5,772, 5,572 with two columns. And then we have a null values to be zero because we don't have any null values. We have two infos and here, which is a count, unique values, uh, what is the frequency, etc. And obviously in the text, we do, you don't have numerical things. So that's why it's, it's, it's empty. Okay. Great. So we explored the data very much. Now it's time to again start with explore exploratory data analysis. Okay. So in exploratory data, data analysis, we, in the in our previous project, we have seen that we have seen that we have to see the distribution. We have to see uh, the distribution. We have to see the distribution of the classes. Okay. So here we are seeing the distribution of the classes by just taking out the length and converting that into a length. Now, now here you can see the labels, which is hammer spam, and it will tell what is the number of the total labels with the plotting the pie chart. And you can see over here that the number of ham examples is 4,825 and spam examples is 747. So we, we are actually working on imbalanced, we are actually working on imbalanced data, so your model will learn uh, more about ham rather than spam. Okay, so be sure to keep that in mind. Next, we will uh, now. It's it's very very important. Like uh, for an example, so let's uh, let's under understand the processing of our text. How 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 we clean our text and why it is why it is there a lot more need. So why do I mean by clean? What do I mean by cleaning? Is for an example, let's assume that you have a go. Okay, so you have go. Oops, go. Okay, it's, it's small g. I don't know why it is not working again. I like okay, so here you have go. Here you have go. Okay, it says small o. Oh, okay, so 
these two will be considered different these two will be considered different but this is the same these two will can will be considered different but this is uh, this is the same or maybe this hashtag does not need any sense over here so why do we need hashtag over here maybe we don't need like this we don't need uh, emojis but here but in some cases like in sentiment analysis emoji space an important role but here here go and go are the similar thing maybe here we have a here we have a these this the if we if we give to a model these two will be considered differently so that's that's not a good thing so what we will do we will convert all our text into lower text okay now here we are doing some text preprocessing that that you need to know okay just uh, just uh, using re okay rejects okay so i'm going to replace here and I'll, I'll be given one simple message i'll be given one simple message first of all okay i'm going to first lower it down by converting that into a string then i'm going to replace this this zero if there is any zeros in the text will be replaced by m okay and this this three will be replaced by k and k is 1000k or 100k or what whatever this uh, this uh, comma will be replaced by this sorry uh, the above i am not recalling what's the name and is sorry uh, it's uh, it's uh, i'm i'm not recalling but yeah you can see okay so then you have won't will be the, here it will be considered different so will not okay cannot should be can not can't should be cannot okay he uh, we are we are we are just doing n not equals not what's what is is it's it is then you have his he is she is she is s own percentage then etc and then here l will okay so this is the this is the basic text preprocessing that i've done over here but one thing that i can also do over here one thing that i can also do over here like oh, stemming stemming okay stemming limitization 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 so i would like you to explore this i would like to you to explore both of them and implement over here okay and uh why what first of all let 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 me tell you what is stemming okay so stemming it simply means and it's, it's in stemming it simply means that for an example for an example so if i go to some website let's take an example that i write play that i write play i write p l a y e d then i write player okay so it will it will the, the stemming will be play uh, means these three words can be will will be converted to this single word because they make a similar sense okay so that's the stemming and limitization is just a bigger version of that it it makes a meaningful some sometimes a stemming does not make a meaningful word so for making a meaning, meaningful word we have limitization but again limitization what is just so for example place plays plates played and players so it, so it will convert in play and the the stemming will convert in pla okay so it is not making sense but this limitization is making sense after we limitize our word word or we convert our corpus of a word into a single word okay so that's the stemming and limitization but i want you to explore stemming the word stemming limitization using nltk library you can refer to some of my github i have already done that but i want you to do this okay so otherwise you no no task will be left for you in this task okay so here what then what then what we will do then you apply to each messages by making a new column you apply to each messages these text preprocessing by doing this all by calling the lambda and and calling the lambda it will go through each step will it it will it will go to each step and apply the function onto each messages and put that into a processed text so let's take an example of that so it, it it's it, it will start making more sense if you take a little bit of example okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to print out i'm going to print out not first which will be our favorite uh, not processed text so i'm going to print out first which is not processed text 
So this is our data and then I'm not going to I'm gonna to post over here. Now I want the zero element and now I'm gonna to make a simple line. I'm gonna make a simple line. Oops, what happened? I'm going to make a simple line so it just makes like this. Oh, and I'm not and then I'm gonna to just paste it over like this. Okay? So it will show you what is the pre-process text. So this pre-process text is converted like this okay so apply stemming okay by using the porter stemmer you can go to nltk nltk stemming nltk stemming oops stemming okay there is something called islamization so you can see some of the tutorials which are available in geeks for geeks and etc so uh, read it out means you can go to any of them whatever you like it just converts the words into uh, yeah, here is a good example. So playing play play so it will come common root from play Okay, so this will be converted like this like stemming is the process of reducing your inflection to words Okay, so you can read this read this sound this is a very good documentation provided by data camp and You will get to know much better about this But uh, I will be bringing up one full course on to na natural language processing just this is a sample how to work with the text but on new era on new era when full course on deep learning where we'll be talking on deep learning we'll cover text working with the textual data okay now we'll go further into now i'll go further into feature engineering what is feature engineering here we are not going to add any features we're just going to encode our ham to zero and expand to one by calling our map method and it's done now we'll divide up the data into twin split now if i run it here we have total number for this and then and then we and then what and then what what we will do now just assume now just see now just see over here that in training set in training set we have our text but neural machine learning will not accept the string or whatever the textual data so what we have to do there is modern means word embeddings then we convert our word and then we convert our word into maybe this word into some numbers into some numbers into some numbers there are a lot more techniques count vectorizer tfidf vectorizer bag of words which i'm not going to again talk about again it's time for you to explore as of now you can just think of it as you can see there you, you, you can see the what's the mathematical equation for that just a single mathematical equation but is what it does is simply you can go to sklearn learn feature extraction just extract the features from the text which converts your text into the numbers okay by just we instantiate over here now now it, now what it, it it will do it will fit the training data means and it return the matrix and then it's, we we don't want to fit the text test testing so that's why we, we are just transforming our uh, text test to the numerical into the matrix okay that's it okay so this is what we use to convert our uh, text into a vector of numbers okay so if I show you the training data how is the training data is a sparse matrix okay it's a sparse matrix which is with 5,000 55,209 stored elements into that okay now we will use Nine base. I hope that you understood. And I hope that you had a look on nine base uh, on this as you have told to do the assignment. So I hope that you had a look at nine base. You can read more about nine base. It's just a very simple as we talked about some other learning algorithm. It's very very simple. Okay. So you may run this and then you just uh, call a predict and here you have accuracy so now let's uh, let's give a corpus of a text so let's take an let's take an take, take an example here, here you have a text here you have a text and i'm going to write a y u s h is a good boy i think let's see it is if it is a spam or not spam okay so i'm gonna just going to convert that this it in in pro production what we do we write a function process we write a function it will take a text as an input then what it will do we we instead we call our count vectorizer which which we which we call over here so i'm going to call my count vectorizer like this count vector dot transform i'm going to transform my text giving uh, giving uh, giving this 
Uh, I'm going to do this num, okay, so it will contain the basis of vectors. Now I'm going to do this call my model, which is uh, maybe it will take a model. So I'm going to call my model, which is here, ny base, and then it will simply dot predict. Now it will simply predict my txt, okay? And then I'm going to, oops, it's num num. I'm just going to go that into a num. So it's the prediction, I'm going to use the prediction. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to return the prediction, okay? So here, if you call preprocess, and then preprocess and predict, so it will be to, it, it will take text as an input, and it will return. Maybe it's maybe uh, some problem, and maybe I have to do count vector that fit transform. What happened? Preprocess iteratable over raw documents, string object received. Okay, no worries. So maybe. What's the problem was causing is, is I'm given this messages and instead of this pre-processed, but we need to give the process text instead of messages. So here we are given the messages. Now we are just going to provide in the CDs and then I'm going to do count vector to transform uh, giving this talk and then providing ny based or predict. And this, 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 this will predict whether that it will it is a spam or a non spam okay so that's the basic uh, spam and ham detector system obviously you can try more stacking various various things so we hope just to give you a taste how the natural language processing uh, project uh, how we work with the data just to give you the taste of our data okay so I think we are we are completed with pro, with this project. I'll be I'll, I'll be catching up you in the uh, maybe uh, in the next. Uh, I think that we are done with this uh, this this course. Maybe I will do I will maybe we will talk about simple perceptron and then we'll wrap up this course. Okay. So thank you for seeing this course. I would highly con congratulate you for completing this course.